It's Halloween night. A man collapses, bleeding from the mouth. He's alone in his apartment, watching a horror movie marathon, and now he thinks he might be dead by dawn. But how? All he'd done was eat a microwaved mini pizza and drink a soda he picked up from a nearby candy store. Was it poison? Why do his guts feel like they're twisting themselves into knots? As he falls to his knees, spluttering and retching, clutching his agonized stomach, his organs lurch, and he vomits a red-tinged mess onto the floor. He can't believe what he's seeing. Is his puke full of broken glass? Across town, some trauma surgeons at the local hospital are having an extremely unpleasant evening. As a few patients with severe gastric distress are rolled into the ER in need of urgent medical attention, of course, adding a layer of surreality to the whole event, the patients in question are in costume, as Beetlejuice and Elsa from Frozen, respectively. Only on Halloween, the team thinks, somehow in unison. They start taking emergency x-rays and are astonished at what they see. Worms. But not standard intestinal worms, the kind of nightmarish worms that would seem far more at home at the bottom of the deep ocean the kind with big, sharp pincers full of painful venom, the kind of worms you definitely wouldn't want to be on the business side of, let alone having swimming around in your guts. One of the doctors in attendance exhaustedly remarks that this is even worse than the person they had in earlier that night, whose intestines were inexplicably full of disgusting rotten berries. People seem to do bizarre and crazy things on Halloween, he thinks to himself, as the nurses draw the cut here lines on the stomach of the screaming patients and the doctor readies his scalpel. But our story isn't about any of these people on Halloween night. It's about a humble little ghost. Happy Halloween, please take one. The neighbor's sign had been pretty explicit about that. Hearing the blood-curdling screams filling the room, frozen to the spot in terror, and watching wide-eyed as a person convulses on the ground, the ghost wishes he'd heeded the warning. He's too old for trick-or-treating, but his parents insist he has to. After all, he can't leave his little brother to walk around the neighborhood on his own, even if it'll still be light out. So he begrudgingly throws an old bedsheet over his head, cuts two holes in it, and voila, he's a ghost. And none of his friends have to see him out trick-or-treating like a little kid. Every time they knock at one of the houses on the street, he wishes this would just be over. Texts are flooding in from his friends, telling him to hurry up and meet them so they can head over to the house party like they planned to. The ghost rolls his eyes every time his little brother races off to another house with a jack-o'-lantern out front, eager to fill his bag with more and more candy. After each door closes, he tells his younger sibling this is it, that they won't be visiting any more houses after this. But before he can herd him back towards their parents' place, his brother is already speeding off in the other direction. They arrive at one of the quieter houses on the block. There are hardly any other trick-or-treaters around, barely anyone else in costume. The ghost urges his little brother to come back home, insisting it doesn't look like anyone's here. The house isn't even decorated. All the lights are out, save for a candle flickering inside a carved pumpkin. Immediately, the brother rushes over to knock on the door. There's no answer, just a silence that hangs in the air and stretches out every second. He knocks again, but still nobody answers. No one to answer the door for the boy to ask, trick or treat to. The ghost tries to urge his sibling to leave. The owners, whoever they are, seem to have left a bucket of candy in front of their door, with a sign encouraging people to help themselves. Another text from his friends makes the ghost all the more eager to go. By now, he's missing the party. His brother insists that he can't take the candy unless he gets to ask the owners trick or treat. Eventually, growing frustrated, the ghost has to drag his little brother away. Before he leaves, he looks over his shoulder to see if anyone else is watching, before swiping the full, unattended candy bucket and tipping its contents into the sheet of his ghost costume, deciding he might as well take them as party favors. But before we go on, I want to thank the sponsor of this video, War Thunder. Imagine commanding a vast arsenal of over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships, ranging from the raw power of the 1920s to the cutting-edge technology of modern fighter jets and main battle tanks representing 10 major nations. And forget about something as simple as hit points. In War Thunder, each vehicle component, from engines to ammo racks, can be individually damaged or destroyed by enemy fire for an unmatched level of detail in combat. And the damage doesn't just happen unseen. The game's X-ray view allows you to witness the precise impact of your strategies, showing exactly where and how your actions affect the enemy. 
bringing a new level of depth to your combat tactics. But War Thunder isn't just for the hardcore simulator fan. Whether you're looking for quick, action-packed encounters or the ultimate realism challenge, there's a game mode for you. From the fast-paced arcade mode, the balanced realistic mode, to the fully immersive simulator mode, each offers a unique way to experience the game's breathtaking battles. And the best part? You don't need any fancy hardware to jump into the action. Whether you're piloting a plane or driving a tank, a simple mouse and keyboard or controller is all you need, even in the most realistic simulator mode. Join the ranks of a global community of over 70 million players by clicking on my link in the description to grab your massive bonus pack. This exclusive offer for new and returning players who haven't played for at least six months includes multiple premium vehicles, an exclusive vehicle decorator Eagle of Valor, 100,000 Silver Lions, and seven days of premium account. But remember, it's only available for a limited time. Now back to our trick or treater. Returning his brother home, the ghost races back out just as the evening turns into night. Crossing town as quickly as he can, he arrives at the house party, greeted by his friends dressed as werewolves and vampires. He hadn't realized everyone would still be doing costumes, breathing a sigh of relief under his ghost sheet, only to wish he'd put more effort into the costume. He dumps the stolen candy into a big communal bowl, overflowing with sugary snacks, before heading into the party. It doesn't take the ghost long to realize that the event isn't all it's cracked up to be. Feeling too awkward to go up and talk to anyone, he floats around, boredly sipping a drink from a plastic cup like a literal ghost at the feast. He started feeling guilty about being a jerk to his brother, making him rush trick-or-treating so the ghost could come to a lame party. But just as he's about to leave, somebody screams. One of the party guests is holding a packet of gummy bears in one hand, the same ones that the ghost swiped earlier. The other hand is clutching his stomach in pain as something seems to be moving. The ghost blinks, certain it's a trick of the strobing lights at the party. He moves to get a better look, just in time to see the guest collapse. People nearby start panicking, telling each other to call an ambulance, worried that someone's having a severe allergic reaction. Then something moves again. The limp body of the party guest starts thrashing around, convulsing on the floor. It's like there's something inhuman, some creature inside his stomach, moving around and trying to claw its way out. And then it does, and it roars. The ghost stares in horror as what looks like a small bear tears itself free, flecks of blood staining its bright green fur and dripping from its paws. The screams erupting around it startle the creature, and it lunges for the nearest person, baring its sharp teeth and clamping them down in a vicious bite. The ones who are far away enough start running. The ghost isn't so lucky. The mint green bear leaps off of its latest victim and fixes its confused, murderous eyes onto the ghost. He's frozen in place by pure terror as the little bear lunges for him, flecking the blood of its previous victim onto his formerly white sheet. As the bear's jaws close around his face, his closing thoughts are of his younger sibling. He should have just stayed trick-or-treating tonight. Out on the ocean, the blades of a matte black stealth chopper slice through the air. The crew working aboard a freighter, hauling goods across the water, only notice the helicopter as it swoops in low, descending from overhead. Before the captain even has a chance to hail the aircraft and request that those aboard identify themselves, it's already coming in for a landing. Figures in tactical gear, all brandishing automatic weapons, spill out of the chopper as the captain sounds the alarm. Crew members scatter, running for their lives but with no way to escape the cargo vessel, surrounded by the roaring waves of the supply route they're sailing along. Everyone panics. They've been boarded. But these armed figures aren't pirates. They're far too well equipped. They look almost… military. In fact, they're outfitted in gear that seems closer to special forces. SCP Foundation Mobile Task Force operatives storm the ship, splitting into smaller teams. One rushes after the boat's crew, rounding them up and herding them toward the bridge. The other squad sweeps the deck, weaving in between the rows of towering shipping containers, searching the cargo for… something. Within minutes, the freighter's crew are helplessly kneeling on the floor of the bridge, hands placed on the backs of their heads in compliance with the orders of these soldiers bearing a strange, unfamiliar insignia on their uniforms. The group's commander instructs two of his men to search for a cargo manifest, and in moments they've found the relevant document relaying the serial number of one of the containers to the squad on the ship's deck. The commander begins questioning the captain of the vessel and his crew, 
seemingly interested in the contents of this one container. Not one of them knows what's inside. All they know is it's bound for the port they were heading to. What nobody notices, though, is the accidental adjustment to the ship's course caused by a turn of the main wheel during the commotion. The freighter is passing down a narrow waterway that is part of the trade route, only now, instead of sailing straight, it's traveling at an angle. On the ship's deck, the MTF operators locate the shipping container they've been directed to. It's locked, naturally, but the team has come prepared. As the rest of the squad form up and cover the crate, one of them rushes to the front, buzzsaw in hand. Sparks fly as a spinning blade slices through the various locks, keeping the long metal container shut tight. In seconds, the saw severs each one, and two of the MTF soldiers stow their weapons, wrenching the container's doors open while the others keep their guns trained on what might be inside. The MTF quickly examines the contents of the shipping container, noting the various cardboard boxes inside. One hears a command squawked through their radio from the commander, stating he needs visual confirmation that what they're looking for is, in fact, inside those boxes. The operator unsheathes their combat knife and effortlessly slices through the tape holding the box shut. And sure enough, inside is... The arrival of the SCP Foundation on a cargo freighter might to some indicate that some kind of anomalous creature is being transported across the ocean, or that the ship's crew are perhaps smugglers, stashing anomalies aboard their vessel's cargo hold on behalf of a shady group of interest like the Chaos Insurgency. The only thing that nobody would expect would be for the Foundation to send its operatives to intercept a shipment of… candy. Packets upon packets of gelatin gummies and prepackaged berries are inside most of the boxes, with others full to the brim of cans of soda and cellophane wrapping to keep them secure. The packaging has been purposely designed to mimic popular brands. The operator almost had to squint to notice the logos for a company named Pure Foods. They held the items close to their body cam, highlighting that these weren't products from the likes of Haribo or Coca-Cola, no matter how much they looked to be. Confirming they'd found what they'd been sent for, the commander radios back to the Foundation, telling them to dispatch an extraction unit to retrieve the intercepted shipment. Within minutes, the huge twin rotors of an enormous VTOL craft are whipping the air around the freighter. Down on the ship's deck, MTF operators attach cables and chains to the shipping container, signaling the pilots above once it's secure. The long metal crate is hauled up into the air beneath the tilt rotor, met with words of protest from the captive crew members which are soon silenced, as the Foundation operatives administer each of them with amnestics. The manifest is replaced with a falsified one, with the relevant container's number missing, its existence completely covered up. Suddenly, the ship lurches beneath their feet, the rumble of impact causing a deafening creak as hundreds of tons of metal collide with something. The MTF troops scramble back to their feet, weapons at the ready, expecting to see an anomalous threat has attacked the boat. Instead, from the ship's bridge, the commander sees clearly what has happened. The freighter has been traveling at an angle and is now wedged against the narrow banks of the canal. Barking a panicked order at his troops, the commander and the rest of the MTF make a hasty retreat, the chopper departing just as the crew of the Ever Given awaken, finding themselves very confused and very stuck. The bafflement felt by the ship's crew, now trapped in the Suez Canal, would soon be shared by people across the world, as this single vessel blocks a waterway crucial to the global supply chain. But luckily, despite the disruptions their actions had caused, the Foundation had at least succeeded in securing a shipment of SCP-5110 before it could reach the port. Sure, the raid by their mobile task force might have led to a ship becoming accidentally stuck in the Suez, but it was deemed an acceptable outcome by the O5 Council. If those Pure Foods products had been distributed to retailers, they would have become even harder to track down. SCP-5110 is the designation given to a collection of packaged food products made under the branding of Pure Foods. So far, the Foundation's efforts to track down the owners of Pure Foods or any potential parent company that owns the brand have all been dead leads. Cargo manifests for the various shipments of their products never contain any actionable intelligence about the origin of Pure Foods items, with seemingly great lengths taken to remove any information about where the products are even manufactured or sent from. The items themselves are hardly up to FDA standards for safe human consumption, let alone the SCP Foundations. Upon being ingested, the various forms of SCP-5110 are known to trigger adverse anomalous side effects on any person who happens to ingest them. 
Insidiously, the SCP-5110 products seem to have been intentionally designed to resemble familiar products sold by popular confectionery brands, possibly in a malicious attempt by Pure Foods to trick unwitting consumers into buying their anomalous products. However, while they are similar to existing widely sold candies and soft drinks, SCP-5110 rarely reaches the shelves of larger supermarket chains, instead often shipped to and sold at smaller convenience stores. This, at least, limits the number of civilians that can accidentally consume them, although it does not prevent that possibility entirely. The four SCP-5110 products currently known to the Foundation each cause a different anomalous effect on the consumer. The severity of the side effects of each Pure Foods item can vary, with some being considerably less harmful and others even being fatal. An anomalous effect is guaranteed, though, to afflict someone consuming one of the products. The first of these is designated as SCP-5110-A, a container of assorted berries with Pure Foods branding and the name Pure Berries on the packaging. Once a person eats these, they will experience the rapid manifestation of rotting berries growing within their digestive system. This might be highly unpleasant to experience, but can be treated, and is considered preferable to the effects of other Pure Foods products. Case in point, SCP-5110-B is the designation given to an item called Pure Soda, a seemingly innocuous can containing carbonated mineral water. The Pure Foods branding is once again present, but closely resembles the packaging used by established soft drink companies such as Pepsi and Coca-Cola. However, far from being a refreshing sugar and corn syrup rich drink, SCP-5110-B has the unfortunate side effect of causing multiple glass bottles to form within the digestive system of a person who has drunk pure soda. These glass bottles are each 237 milliliters in capacity, less than the typical 250 milliliters of a glass Coca-Cola bottle. However, the volume of these bottles is usually not a concern of anyone who finds them in their digestive system, especially as the glass often shatters thanks to internal pressure, causing severe injury and the need for emergency surgery in order to remove any fragments. Pure Worms, or SCP-5110-C, are one of the varieties of Haribo-like candies created by Pure Foods. Contained within the packaging are colorful gummy worms containing various different flavorings and sweeteners. Should a person ingest any of these candies, then they will experience arguably the worst side effect of all Pure Foods products. Entering a person's digestive system, SCP-5110-C will trigger the manifestation of entities that resemble Eunice Aphroditus, more commonly known as Bobbit worms. Commonly found in coral reefs and in warmer waters like the Atlantic Ocean, Bobbit worms are a form of bristle worm that burrow their bodies under soft sand on the seabed, waiting to detect prey with their antenna. When they do, these aquatic ambush predators will grab at passing fish with sharp bristles. While bobbit worms rarely, if ever, attack humans, their mandibles are not only sharp enough to cut a fish in half, but are also venomous and could cause a person permanent nerve damage on contact. Having numerous entities similar to bobbit worms within a person's digestive system is, understandably, a cause for panic. The potential risk of internal bleeding and nerve damage from the sharp mouth parts aside, the burrowing nature of these worms can lead to significant and potentially fatal bodily trauma. When extracted surgically from a person or recovered posthumously, these bobbit worm-like creatures appear to be dyed in bright colors, resembling the SCP-5110-C Pure Worms candies. The fourth of the currently known Pure Foods products resembles other familiar and popular gummy candies. SCP-5110-D, or Pure Bears, appear to be multi-flavored gummy bears. Upon initial ingestion of one of these, the anomalous effects typically won't be felt immediately and can normally take anywhere between a full day or several to manifest. Once this occurs, however, whoever consumed the Pure Bears will have a juvenile Ursus arctos forming within their digestive system, the species more commonly known as the brown bear. To reiterate, this isn't a baby brown bear or an embryo of one, but instead a fully formed juvenile bear. Upon removal from the subject, or should the confined animal claw its way out, the bear's fur will appear to be dyed with bright colors that resemble the color of the gummy bear the person had consumed. Naturally, in accordance with their standard experimentation procedure, the Foundation has been able to document the effects of the various SCP-5110 products through extensive tests that utilize Class D personnel as test subjects. 
no other members of Foundation personnel are permitted to consume anything made by Pure Foods. Any of their anomalous products, including those recovered from retail outlets and intercepted shipments, are to be stored in a secure containment locker at a Foundation facility. Present on the back of all SCP-5110 products are a series of statements from their manufacturer, Pure Foods. Besides their own branding, this is the only consistent inclusion on their packaging. According to the company's own messaging, its mission statement is to deliver consumers with products that do not include additional unhealthy ingredients such as excess sugars, corn syrup, and other additives that are typically added to either artificially alter a product's taste or to make them more addictive for consumers. Pure Foods claims not to include fats or sugars that can lead to potential health complications when eaten in excess. Instead, they claim to take the essence of foods and encase them in gelatin. The nutritional information for a packet of Pure Bears, or SCP-5110-D, is listed as follows. 58,000 calories, 40,000 grams of total fat, 16 grams of sodium, with zero carbohydrates, zero sugars, and 260,000 grams of protein. The only ingredient listed is simply bear. A young woman steps onto her bathroom scale. She holds her breath and squeezes her eyes shut, afraid to see the results as she listens to the dial spinning. When it slows to a stop, she opens her eyes and looks down. She balks at the result. 150 pounds? That's unacceptable in her eyes. She steps off the scale and examines her reflection in the full-length mirror. In truth, her weight is far from out of control, but when she looks at herself, she can't help but see flaws. The subtle ring of pudge around her middle, the way her butt sticks out just a little too far for her liking, the very faint thickness around her cheeks and chin that hint at her history of snacking. As she leaves the bathroom, she reflects on her situation. Of course she's gaining weight. How could it be any other way? For the last two years, she's been in lockdown during a pandemic, and she's barely left her apartment. She let her gym membership lapse, and instead of cycling to work, she's instead taking the easy way out by just driving and it's not like she gets much exercise in her free time either. During these last two years of isolation, she's mostly stayed in and watched television. She's discovered a particular love for trashy daytime talk shows and court dramas. Intellectually, she knows that they're the equivalent of junk food, but at the same time, there is a certain mindless charm to them. She would be embarrassed to admit it to any of her friends, but she does enjoy just turning off her brain and absorbing some silly talk show about professional stunt dwarves or Satan-worshipping furry juggalos. That sort of entertainment has been a boon to get her through the tough times. Nevertheless, it's time to make a change. She promises herself that she's going to get into shape. Today, instead of vegging out on the couch, she's going to make an effort. She's going to go out and get some exercise and, she tells herself, she's going to watch those extra pounds melt away right before her eyes. She hopes that her old gym clothes will still fit her. After all, she's definitely put on some extra weight since her last trip to the gym. After rummaging through her drawers, she finds what she's looking for her spandex gym shorts and sports bra. She quickly changes her clothes and is relieved to see that, although they might be a little snugger than she would like, they still fit her pretty well. That's a good sign. She probably won't even have to work very hard to get herself down to her ideal weight. It's all a matter of willpower, she tells herself. I was fit before, so that means I should be able to do it again. All I have to do is avoid temptation. I'll just have to make sure I stay active instead of watching trash TV all day. After all, I don't want to rot my brain too much. On the first day, she actually does an admirable job of sticking to her plan. She cycles to work, enjoying the fresh air and the reassuring post-workout burn in her legs that let her know that she's making progress. She throws away all the junk food in her refrigerator and goes shopping for healthy fruits and vegetables. And, most important of all, she limits her television time. She knows that trashy TV is probably her biggest addiction, even more than junk food, so she needs to be careful of that. On the second day, though, she notices something strange. She starts off with a simple, healthy breakfast, just some granola and a glass of juice. It's barely enough to satisfy her, but she knows that she has to make sacrifices if she expects to actually lose any weight. After breakfast, she decides to go out for a jog. As she's out on the street, she's overcome with sudden hunger. Of course, that's to be expected. She's on a diet now, so it's going to take some time to adjust to these smaller meals. She puts her hand to her rumbling stomach and grimaces. She's never felt this hungry before. If she didn't know better, she would think that she hadn't eaten for a week with the amount of pain that she's feeling. In fact, she's actually starting to feel a little woozy and she has to lean against a light post to keep from fainting. She shakes her head to clear her thoughts. Okay, she thinks, I must have misjudged how many calories I need to get me through a morning. 
Her eyes stray to a nearby coffee shop. She sighs in relief. She thinks to herself, I'll just pop in there and get myself a small snack, just a little something to keep my blood sugar up. She walks into the cafe and gets in line. As she waits, she can't help but stare at the rows of pastries on display under the glass. They all look delicious, and she is really hungry. She fully intends to only get a bagel with a little smear of cream cheese, but when she gets to the counter, she finds herself ordering way too much food. I'd like two scones, three danishes, and a bear claw, she says. Also a large super raspberry frappuccino with extra syrup and whipped cream. The words just tumble out of her mouth almost as if it's not her saying them, but rather some other voice speaking through her mouth. What the? I didn't say that, she stammers. The clerk behind the counter eyes her strangely, and the young woman feels too embarrassed to protest further. She steps aside and waits for her order, pondering the strange event that just happened. Is she possessed? She's not a superstitious person, but she can't think of any other explanation for what just happened. She can admit to herself that she has broken down and lost to temptation over a tasty snack in the past, but this? This is ridiculous. Eventually, when the clerk hands her the order, she rationalizes the whole thing away. I must just be having a hunger hallucination, she says to herself. Obviously, I need to be a little more careful about not being so strict about my diet. I'm sure if I just eat sensibly, I won't have an experience like that again. Her stomach grumbles again, reminding her of the original reason why she stepped into this coffee shop. She retreats to a table in the corner and tears open the bag. She wolfs down her pastries with gusto and slurps at her rich, creamy drink. When she's finished, she sighs in satisfaction, although the uncomfortable, full feeling in her belly reminds her of her predicament. She only meant to eat enough to keep her from fainting, but instead, she's eating herself silly, and it's only day two of the diet. This does not bode well. Okay, she tells herself, this is my last cheat. From now on, I'm gonna be serious about this diet. She stands up and leaves the cafe, ready to complete the rest of her jog. But then, something even stranger happens. On the television, the matriarch of the family is furious. She has forbidden her daughter from marrying the gardener because she believes that he is too low class for her high-born daughter. But what she doesn't realize is that her daughter is in love and that she is determined to make it work. The daughter and the gardener have eloped, and the matriarch is hiring a private detective to track them down. Meanwhile, the matriarch's long-lost twin brother, whom she thought died in a plane crash in the tropics, has actually been alive the entire time. He has been in a South American hospital recovering from amnesia, but now he returns to the family estate, ready to claim his share of the inheritance. These events are all noted by the family's shady lawyer, who has big plans to usurp the family fortune himself. Unbeknownst to the family, he is actually secretly working for their mortal enemies and business rivals to destroy them. The young woman laughs, shoving a handful of potato chips into her mouth. Oh man, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes now. That lawyer is playing them all like fiddles. Suddenly, she startles, as if she's just waking up. Where is she? Wasn't she just in that coffee shop? How is it that she's at home? And why is she eating potato chips? She was sure that she threw out all the junk food in the house. She must have bought a bag on her way back home from jogging, but she literally cannot remember it. And what is she doing now? Watching television and eating junk food? In disgust, she grabs the remote and shuts off the TV. She was supposed to be jogging, and instead, she's sitting at home and watching stupid soap operas. The thing that worries her the most is her apparent blackout. She remembers nothing about her trip home from the coffee shop, although the evidence of the potato chip bag indicates that she must have stopped at a convenience store or supermarket on the way home. How could she forget something like that? I really must be having a blood sugar issue, she tells herself reassuringly, even though deep down, she knows that can't be the case. She had the blackout after eating the pastries at the coffee shop, so that can't be the cause. But she really doesn't want to think about that, so she puts it out of her head with a renewed promise to commit to her exercise and fitness program. Over the next few days, she makes a valiant effort to keep her promise. She cycles when she can, she jogs when she remembers, and yet, the blackouts continue. And no matter where she is when she loses her memory, she always recovers in the same place. Back home on her couch, always in the middle of eating some fatty junk food, always staring at the television set. Sure, she's always had an unhealthy television habit, and she knows that trashy talk shows and silly soap operas are her biggest weakness, but it doesn't make any sense that she would be seeking them out when she's in some kind of fugue state, right? As the weeks roll by, the young woman finds that her weight keeps rising. When she steps onto the bathroom scale, she's shocked to see that the dial points to 200 pounds. She's doing everything right, she thinks. How is that possible? How is it possible that she's ballooned up an extra 50 pounds since deciding to slim down? She can't fit into her old gym clothes anymore. She can barely tug the spandex shorts up to her thighs, and even if she could, she's afraid that they're going to split apart. In desperation, 
She switches to an old stretchy sweatsuit. It's the only thing that she owns that still fits her. This is just a temporary setback, she tells herself as she stares at her bloated reflection in the bathroom mirror. I just have to work harder. And she does. Or does she? When she goes to ride her bike, she finds that it's no longer strong enough to support her weight. She can't perch on the seat comfortably and the steel body frame starts to creak when she rests her full weight upon it. She steals her resolve. Sure, it might be embarrassing to go out in public wearing an ill-fitting sweatsuit and riding a bike groaning under her bulk, but she really has no choice. This time, she's going to do it. And she probably did ride her bike to work, right? She's not sure. The next thing that she knows, she's back at home, spread across the couch, basking in the comforting glow of the television. The floor is covered in empty bags and cartons, and her face is slathered with crumbs and sauce. The last thing that she remembers is that she was just about to go for a bike ride, but now she's back at home, and it looks like she just completely ruined her diet. She lifts her arm with some effort and stares at her watch. She's lost almost a whole day. That's the longest blackout yet. She must have gone out cycling and made her way home where she decided to reward herself for her strenuous efforts with a little snack. That's the only logical explanation. She tries to reassure herself that maybe she's past the worst of it, but she finds that these mysterious blackouts keep happening. They happen while she's at work, while she's at the gym, while she's out cycling, but she always comes to in the same place, sitting on her sofa at home, in front of the TV, surrounded by the debris of a massive meal. Again, she wonders if maybe she's having some sort of reaction to her new low-calorie diet. Maybe she's been cutting back so far on her food intake that she's starting to have fainting spells. Maybe her diet food is tainted in some way. But that doesn't explain why she keeps gaining weight. The scale in her bathroom doesn't lie. It keeps reporting higher and higher numbers. And as much as she tries to reassure herself that it must just be broken, her ever-tightening clothes and ever-widening reflection tell her otherwise. Her trips to the gym become less and less frequent as she finds that other patrons have started to stare and whisper about her. Are they laughing at her for not being able to control her weight? Are they whispering about how her new flab is spilling from the confines of her sweatsuit? She can't even run on the treadmill for more than a few minutes without being completely winded, and she's too wide to balance on her bike now. The young woman has grown absolutely massive, to the point that she completely fills the whole couch. She chews her way through yet another bag of potato chips, her eyes never straying from the ever-chattering television set. She barely moves from this spot, her tremendous girth sinking into a permanent groove in the cushions as the couch springs groan. She barely notices, however, because she's much too intent on enjoying herself. She loves to eat, and every bite brings her untold joy, her taste buds tingling with delight. She is constantly full, so much so that she feels slightly sick, so bloated that she feels like she might just burst, but she's powerless to resist the siren call of junk food. She scarfs down entire boxes of cookies and cartons of ice cream without a thought, having turned into the very definition of a mindless eater. Only occasionally does she rouse herself from this stupor of gorging, to reach for her telephone, to order more takeout or more grocery delivery, always choosing the most calorie-laden options. Other than eating, her attention is completely devoted to her television set. She watches a constant stream of daytime talk shows, laughing along with the studio audience as the hosts parade out an assortment of society's biggest freaks. Sometimes she'll switch the channel to watch soap operas, becoming so wrapped up in the ridiculous plot twists and melodramatic acting that she completely forgets the passage of time. Her bicycle stands propped against the wall in the hallway, completely forgotten and untouched now for months. At this point, all thoughts of losing weight have utterly evaporated, and all that she cares about is satisfying her appetites for junk food and junk television. One day, she suddenly shakes her head and looks down at herself in horror, as if seeing herself for the first time. What the? She says in disbelief. She drops her half-eaten carton of ice cream and grabs at her fleshy middle with her hands, as if to make sure that it's all her and not some kind of crazy dream. Her hands sink deep into her new flesh, and she realizes to her shock that indeed she has eaten herself into morbid obesity. How is this possible? I can't be this big. I was only… only… Her words trail off as the sound of an organ sting from the soap opera on TV diverts her attention. Within seconds, her eyes have glazed over and her hands move to pick up the dropped carton of ice cream. Her worries about her growing size forgotten, she's now only concerned with watching until the next commercial break. It might seem unbelievable that someone could undergo such a startling physical and mental transformation, but what that young woman experienced has led to her being classified by the Foundation as SCP-2611. SCP-2611 is, as you might have expected, a young woman currently weighing approximately 500 pounds. 
Her mobility is limited due to her weight, although SCP staff encourage her to take light exercise whenever possible, in hopes of preventing her mobility from deteriorating further. She also suffers from several health issues related to her weight and lifestyle, including diabetes, for which she is receiving treatment by Foundation personnel. Her awareness of her situation and surroundings is severely limited, as she spends most of her time in a stupor, but when she is lucid, she believes that she is in a special facility receiving treatment for her weight problem. In reality, SCP-2611 is under observation because of SCP-2611-1. SCP-2611-1 is a mass of sentient fat located on SCP-2611's left side. SCP-2611-1 has become integrated with several of SCP-2611's vital organs, making it too dangerous to attempt to remove SCP-2611-1 via liposuction or other means. SCP-2611-1 has gradually exerted increasing control over the mind and actions of its host, to the point that SCP-2611 is only fully conscious for one to two hours daily. The rest of the time, SCP-2611-1 is fully in control of its host's behavior. Prior to coming to the SCP facility, SCP-2611-1 influenced its host to consume massive amounts of calories, leading to the mysterious and sudden weight gain that we observed earlier. This was possibly an attempt by SCP-2611-1 to increase its own size and influence, but as of yet, its reasons, as well as how it exerts control over its host, are unknown. When in control, SCP-2611-1 can speak through its host, communicating in standard American English. SCP-2611's access to food has been limited since her arrival at the Foundation, so as to prevent her weight gain from accelerating to dangerous levels. Other than eating, SCP-2611-1's main interest appears to be daytime television. Attempts to communicate with SCP-2611-1 have so far met with little success due to the anomaly's limited attention span for anything other than the minutiae of daytime television. In a conversation with one researcher, however, SCP-2611-1 let slip that it preferred daytime television to the programming watched by, quote, that other guy suggesting that it lived inside a different host before it eventually took up residence within the body of SCP-2611. At another point, while in the middle of a conversation about a court drama, SCP-2611-1 suddenly announced, Kill it! Kill it now! I don't care if I die! Staff believe that this might not have been SCP-2611-1 at all, but rather the voice of SCP-2611 trying to break through the hypnotic control of her parasite to call for help. At this time, no drastic action is recommended until further observations can be made. SCP-2611-1 does not appear to be contagious, and the way that it bonds with the host is unknown, so it is currently classified as safe. At the moment, SCP-2611-1 is the only known instance of its kind. However, considering rising levels of obesity worldwide, it is not unfathomable to think that there could be countless other instances influencing the behavior of other hosts to dedicate their lives to consuming food and television. Who knows, it's not like most of us would need that much convincing. The young couple held hands as they walked through the forest, the only light coming from the full moon which streamed down between the branches. The young woman is riveted by her friend's story. She's never been a fan of ghost stories, she scares too easily, but her friends insisted. But what they didn't know was that there was something else out there in the forest, something watching them. The young woman can't help but look around, scanning the forest to see if there's anything out there watching her, but it's too dark to see anything past the dim ring of light cast by the campfire. Just then, something emerged from the forest. The couple had no idea that it was just feet behind them, matching them step for step. Slowly, it began to reach out towards them. What was it? The young woman instinctually asked. It was the Gashadokuro. The young woman screams in fear as she is grabbed from behind by a skeleton. But of course, the laughing of her friends clues her in immediately that this is not a real Gashadokuro. It's just her stupid friend in a mask. No one can contain their laughter. Even the young woman has to laugh a little. As her friend takes off his cheap skull mask, she playfully hits him in the arm. You jerk. You should have seen the look on your... The gigantic shrieking skeleton leaps from the woods and picks up the young man, shoving him straight into his mouth and consuming him, the boy crying out as his bones are snapped between its enormous jaws. Everyone screams and turns to run, but another colossal skeleton emerges from the forest, picking up two of the group, one in each hand, before smashing them together over and over, leaving nothing but a tenderized pile of flesh between its bony fingers that it then begins to devour. The young woman doesn't know what to do. She's petrified with fear, unable to move or even think. 
She's grabbed from behind and turns to see her friend who is telling the story. Come on, we have to go. She still doesn't move. She can't tear herself away from watching the horror that's playing out in front of her. But he grabs her hand and forcefully pulls her into the forest behind him. As they run through the woods, they can hear the sounds of their friends being eaten by the enormous skeletons. There's nothing they can do to help them, though. All they can do is run. The two sprint as fast as they can through the thick, dark forest, jumping over fallen trees, hoping that there's solid ground on the other side. The young woman's foot catches in a root, and she falls hard to the ground. Her friend stops and quickly comes back. As he is helping her stand up out of the mud, they both notice something. A sound. The heavy thuds of another giant skeleton. And it's getting closer to them. Come on, we have to keep going! With a loud shriek, a huge bony hand emerges from the forest and grabs the young man. The young woman watches as he is lifted a hundred feet into the air and stuffed whole into the gargantuan skeleton's mouth. She steps slowly backwards, knowing that she will soon meet the same fate, until the earth disappears beneath her feet. She tumbles down the hillside, somersaulting end over end, crashing through the brush on the hillside until dropping over an embankment. If the fall down the hill knocked her out, then the drop over the embankment was enough to wake her back up. Her wits come back just enough for her to roll under the embankment's ledge, and not a moment too soon. She huddles under the ledge and watches as the two skeletons stride over her hiding place and continue on deeper into the forest. She listens until the sounds of their thudding steps disappear. She doesn't know what to do. Should she try to get back to the campsite and see if any of her friends are still alive? If they are, they might need her help. But what if there are more of these things out there? What if they come back, looking for her? Her mind races, unsure of what to do, and she has trouble thinking clearly. Her ears are ringing from her tumble down the hillside and her teeth audibly chatter in fear. As she debates her next move, trying to make sense of the nightmare she's found herself in, she suddenly notices something. A shadow cast by the moonlight begins to grow on the ground in front of her. That's when she realizes something else. It's not her teeth that are chattering. The sound is coming from somewhere else. She stands up and turns around to see a huge skull slowly rising up behind her. The giant skeleton, this one even bigger than the others, reaches out towards her. The girl closes her eyes, preparing to meet her fate as the skeleton starts to shriek. But it's a different kind of sound. She opens her eyes and is almost blinded by the intense white light on the skeleton's face. It sounds like it is shrieking in pain from the light being cast on it, and she's forced to turn away and shield her eyes. As she does so, she sees the source of light. It's a man in a uniform. He looks like some sort of tactical police officer, but instead of a gun, he's holding an enormous flashlight that he's pointing at the skeleton. More men who are dressed just the same emerge from the woods, blasting the skeleton with more light. It continues shrieking but seems helpless to do anything. She watches as the skeleton seems to lose its form, slowly disintegrating in the light, until eventually it disappears completely. Later, the young woman is sitting in the back of a van with a blanket wrapped around her shoulders. One of the policemen, at least she thinks he must be a policeman, brings her a hot drink. She still can't believe what she saw that night. The monstrous creatures that killed and ate her friends, it felt like it wasn't real, like she was watching a movie play out. Were those... were those... Gasha Dokuro? She asks. A man in a white lab coat looks up from a nearby table where he had been working on something. She thinks he must be a doctor of some kind. Yes, he tells her, or something similar to them. Maybe they inspired the myth of the Gasha Dokuro? Maybe the myth inspired them? We simply don't know. She asks. All my friends are... Dead, he interjects. I know this is hard for you. Getting chased by giant anomalous skeletons and watching your friends eaten alive would be tough for anyone to deal with. The young woman starts to sob, the weight of the moment finally hitting her. But I have some good news, he tells her. She sniffs and looks up at the doctor. Believe it or not, I've seen this thing happen a lot. And you don't have to worry, because you're not going to remember any of this. Ouch! The young woman cries, and looks down to see that he has jabbed her in the thigh with a syringe. She tries to push him away, but she's already feeling weak and disoriented. She sways a little before her eyes shut, and she passes out. The young woman wakes in the cheery morning light of her own bedroom. She yawns and stretches, the strange dream about skeletons in the forest already drifting from her mind. Konnichiwa, I'm Dr. Bob, and today's file is a terrifying anomalous entity referred to in Japan as the Gashadokuro, but known by the SCP Foundation as SCP-2863 the starving skeletons. SCP-2863 is not just one, but an entire population of entities that resemble gigantic human skeletons. These enormous bony creatures' size can vary, but on average they are approximately 30 meters tall. 
While their exact number is unknown, over 200 separate individual instances have been identified and catalogued, with each having distinctive markings, such as their bones having different types of damage or burn marks present. SCP-2863 instances are currently found exclusively in Japan, where they will appear only after sunset. It is still unknown if the skeletons are sapient, though they do appear sentient as they engage in their primary behavior of hunting down and consuming humans. Despite their enormous size, they are capable of moving very quietly when they want to, though there have been reports from survivors of their appearance being preceded by a rattling-like sound, which may be their own teeth or giant bones hitting against each other. Once they have caught a human, they will immediately devour them, with the human's blood appearing to be absorbed directly into their bones, since they lack any digestive organs. It is unknown if they require the blood of humans for sustenance or if their predatory behavior is motivated by something else. Monitoring and control of SCP-2863 instances was previously the responsibility of the Imperial Japanese Anomalous Matters Examination Agency. The IJAMEA, which as the name suggests, was Imperial Japan's answer to the SCP Foundation, tasked with investigating the strange anomalies within their own borders for the benefit of the Empire. Several of the IJAMEA agents who had been investigating the Gashidokuro at the end of World War II transferred to the SCP Foundation when the Anomalous Matters Examination Agency was disbanded and continued their work on the anomaly. They also provided their original files on the anomaly, which gave the Foundation their first information on the giant anomalous skeletons. According to the IJAMEA's translated file, Gashodokuro are created by mass death by the concentrated suffering of hundreds. While the Gashodokuro will eventually fade, they remain for centuries after their creation, lingering until their sorrow has diffused and faded. There is no way to hasten this process. The IJAMEA file also explained that while conventional weaponry is useless against the anomalous skeletons, light can be used to banish the creatures, and either natural daylight or man-made light will suffice. When exposed to light, the skeletons will start to lose their corporeal form until they fade away completely. This doesn't kill instances of SCP-2863 though, it only temporarily neutralizes them, and appearances of the same instance will often be reported the very next night. Just as the IJAMEA had noted in their file, the SCP Foundation also made the connection between SCP-2863 and locations of mass suffering. While Imperial Japan's Anomalous Investigation Unit identified 203 instances of SCP-2863, the Foundation has since become aware of three others, each of which were found at sites connected to death and destruction. The first new instance was found near Nanjing, China, the location of an especially brutal massacre during the Second World War that may have resulted in as many as 300,000 deaths. It's believed that the entity first appeared in this location in 1938, just after the massacre while the city was still under the control of Imperial Japan. This has led some to speculate that the locations where Gashodokuro appear are inherently tied to the borders of Japan as a nation and have fluctuated with geopolitical changes. The second was discovered several kilometers from Fukuoka City in Japan, a city that saw heavy firebombing by Allied forces during the war. The third was identified in 2011 in the Tohoku region of Japan, which is where the Fukushima nuclear disaster occurred. Each of these new instances appeared to bear injuries consistent with someone who suffered through the nearby tragedies, with the first showing evidence of crushed bones, the second appearing to have suffered intense burning, and the third missing teeth, which is common in cases of extreme radiation poisoning. These specific injuries add further evidence of the connection the Gashodokuro may have to human misery. The impermanent nature of SCP-2863 and their ability to manifest even after being neutralized has made long-term containment of this anomaly all but impossible, and they have been classified as Keter. In the event that an instance is spotted, Mobile Task Force Omicron 3 is dispatched to the area, where they will attempt to neutralize the entity through the use of high-powered floodlights. Any civilians who are exposed to SCP-2863 and survive are given Class A amnestics so that they can hopefully move on with their lives and forget their horrifying encounter with the starving skeletons. A man opens his mouth to bite a hot dog and suddenly freezes. His eyes widen, and the hot dog drops from his hand, falling to the ground. Ahead, a stampede of people is running toward him, screaming, crying out for help. Behind them, a man walks at an ordinary, casual pace, but something is off. His eyes have a glazed, unfocused look to them, and he keeps shoveling random items into his open mouth swallowing them down. He eats a clipboard and pen, a discarded shoe, and as the first man watches in horror, the very hungry man grabs the ankle of a fallen member of the crowd and pulls him into his mouth, devouring him. 
The first man turns to run for his life, only to be knocked to the ground by the rest of the crowd, trying to escape. He struggles to climb back to his feet, and a hand reaches out to take his. When he makes it to his feet, he looks up and sees the hungry man pulling him in, mouth stretching open wide. The sky is a perfect, cloudless blue. The air is warm from the unbroken sunlight, but cooled to the perfect temperature by a gentle breeze. There is a sense of electricity, excitement, and competition in the air. Throngs of people have gathered together in a makeshift arena, piled into plastic chairs and swarming around concession stands, all training their eyes on the arena's center. What are they here for? Some sort of Olympic Games? A baseball tournament? A horse race? No, it's something greater. Something meatier. It is the annual Midsummer Hot Dog Eating Contest, and locals and tourists alike are coming together to see just who can cram the most pork or beef hot dogs and buns down their gullets in front of a roaring crowd. The announcer makes his way to the front of the arena, standing with his arms wide in front of the long table behind him. As he calls out the names of this year's contestants, they file in, each taking his place behind the table. There is the previous year's champion, a burly man with a bushy beard and twinkling eyes, and there is this year's surprise competitor, a skinny 19-year-old college student with a hungry grin. Then there are the lesser-known contestants, a local father who signed up after making a joke with his daughter, an uncle who scrawled his name on the sign-up sheet after a few too many drinks, a recently retired man checking off another item on his golden year's bucket list. All have come to the event today with full hearts and empty stomachs, ready to see who the year's victor will be. The announcer riles up the crowd, encouraging them to cheer as loudly as possible to spur on their chosen competitor. All the while, staff are carrying out trays piled high with hot dogs, more hot dogs than most people see in a year, except for the people who just really, really love hot dogs. Each contestant receives a tray of hot dogs, a bucket of water, and an additional empty bucket, just in case, well, you get the idea. With the supplies and competitors all in place, it is time to begin the countdown. The announcer holds up his favorite air horn and calls out, Three, two, one, eat! At the sound of the air horn's blast, the men leap into action, seizing hot dogs from plates and each engaging in their unique competitive eating technique. The previous year's champion employs the method of famous hot dog eating champion Joey Chestnut, dunking his entire hot dog sloppily into his water, then swallowing it as quickly as possible. The new challenger, on the other hand, employs the Solomon method, named for King Solomon. Much like the fabled king suggested doing with a stolen infant, eaters using the Solomon method break the focus of their feasting in half before polishing it off. One of the more casual competitors attempts a divide-and-conquer technique, eating first the dog itself and then the bun. Others employ no specific technique at all, attempting to devour the stack of hot dogs before them, using the same classic eating style they might employ at a family barbecue. This is a grave mistake. One by one, the less prepared competitors drop out, spitting into their buckets, wiping meat sweats from their foreheads, waddling out of the arena while groaning and holding their aching stomachs. Soon, only the two front runners remain. But what's this? A challenger approaches. An unassuming black man, clad in a shirt and dress pants, rushes into the arena, his face a mask of single-minded determination, and begins seizing the discarded hot dogs off the table, gobbling them up as fast as he can. The announcer and the rest of the audience watch in stunned disbelief. This is unprecedented, and as exciting as it is, definitely against the rules. This man is not a registered competitor, and he certainly can't join the contest in the champion stretch. Unsure of what else to do, the announcer beckons to the staff on the sidelines, ushering them back toward the table to clear the food and escort this surprise drop-in out of the arena. The audience watches with rapt attention as the staff members attempt to remove the stranger from his place at the table. He shakes his head violently, refusing to go, and snatches the hot dogs away from them even as they try to clear the trays away. All the while, the remaining competitors standing are attempting to stay the course and finish strong in spite of the interruption. The new, younger man collapses, slumping down onto the table in a hot dog-induced stupor. He has tapped out. The victor is the previous year's champion, with a staggering ultimate tally of 38 hot dogs. As four staff members work together to wrestle the stranger out of the arena, the champion steps forward to receive his trophy. The crowd roars as he holds up his arms, grinning ear to ear and basking in yet another win. The announcer can still see the staff struggling with the stranger out of the corner of his eye, but this crowd wants to see their champion crown, and the show must go on. So he grabs the Hot Dog King sash, the crown made from gold, well, gold-plated, hot dogs, and even the massive gold trophy. He crowns the winner, placing the sash over his shoulders. 
Then, as the music swells triumphantly, courtesy of the local high school marching band, the announcer holds up the trophy, sunlight glinting off its shiny surface. It represents so many things, achievement, celebration, the ability to eat just so much meat and not get sick, and now it is time for it to be awarded to the man who earned it. The announcer stretches his arms, handing over the trophy to the contest winner, when all of a sudden, another hand grabs hold of its handle, ripping it from the announcer's grasp. The stranger has returned, somehow freeing himself from the multiple security guards who escorted him away, and he has taken the trophy for himself. But he isn't just attempting to crown himself the hot dog king. No, this is not a simple coup de hot dog. He lifts the trophy up over his head, opening his mouth as wide as it will go, and tears the metal in half with a horrible screeching sound, shoving the pieces into his mouth, chewing and swallowing. By the time the announcer and the champion recover from their shock enough to move again, the trophy is completely gone, vanished into the stranger's belly. After a day of seemingly impossible feats of feasting, the sight of this strange man consuming a truly impossible meal of metal is just too much for the already anxious crowd to take. The arena erupts into absolute chaos as people spill out of their seats en masse, fleeing the area. The champion, however, does not turn and run. He feels robbed of his victory. Though it may have occurred in an utterly bizarre fashion, he won't stand for this kind of disrespect. He has trained all year for this moment, only to watch his trophy be eaten right in front of him. He marches right up to the stranger and pokes him in the chest, demanding to know who he thinks he is, what gives him the right to crash the hot dog eating contest, interrupt the proceedings, and upstage his victory by chowing down on the trophy. The man doesn't answer him, so the champion continues to berate him, wagging his finger in his face. The stranger's eyes follow the finger, and slowly he opens his mouth. There is a sudden chop, and the champion screams, holding his hand to his chest, using his shirt to stem the bleeding. He turns to run with the rest of the crowd, but it's too late. The stranger's hand clamps down on his shoulder, holding him in place with a surprising strength. The only thing he sees before his life is snuffed out is the stranger's wide-open mouth, before everything goes dark with another sickening chomp. All the while, the crowd's terror rises to a fever pitch at the horrible sight. They trample each other as they scramble to vacate the area, shoving strangers and loved ones alike out of the way in a bid to escape this mysterious equal opportunity omnivore with an appetite for far more than just hot dogs. Some manage to escape, running far enough from the arena that they can stop to catch their breaths and glance back at the ones who were not so lucky. Those who tripped and fell in the madness, who had the wind knocked out of them by an elbow to the gut from one of their neighbors, those with weak ankles or who hadn't tied their shoes carefully enough. All of these poor, unfortunate souls are next on the menu for the stranger. He devours them one by one, rarely even stopping to chew. As one surviving woman watching from a distance pulls out her phone to call 911, she can't escape noticing the parallels to the contest itself, the way the stranger eats with a singular focus on consuming as much as possible. There's no pause to enjoy the meal, but there is no sadism or malice in the act either, just the sheer, undeniable drive to keep eating. The woman's call to the police is one of the strangest moments of her life and utterly baffles the local police department. Ma'am, please calm down, one officer repeats again and again. What do you mean there's a man eating people? I mean exactly what I said, she shouts. A man showed up at the hot dog contest and started eating people. Please, you have to do something. I think this is above our pay grade, miss, another officer chimes in. You think we should call, you know, the first officer trails off. Who? Who? the woman demands, but the line goes dead before she can ask another question. The police are clearly no help, and she isn't about to stick around and see just how big this stranger's appetite is. She tried to save the others, but now she needs to save herself. She runs all the way home without another glance back. Meanwhile, the local police did make that mysterious call, and an SCP Foundation mobile task force is currently en route to the scene. By the time they arrive, the park is a ghost town with nothing but the blood-stained grass and abandoned arena to suggest that something horrible ever happened here at all. But these aren't some bumbling local police officers who have no idea what to do with a man-eating anomaly. This team has seen enough bizarre sights to fill a lifetime, and another lifetime after that. They spy a trail of sticky red footprints leading away from the arena. At first, they assume that the substance is blood, but a closer examination reveals that it is, in fact, ketchup. They track the savory footprints away from the scene of the day's unsavory events, following them to a nearby warehouse. Judging from the scattered wooden beams, rustling metal, and boarded up windows, this place has been abandoned for some time. The perfect place for an anomaly to hide away. If they weren't certain, 
the sound of someone inside biting through sheets of metal is plenty of indication that this is the right place. With no time to waste, they break down the door of the warehouse, weapons drawn and ready. They follow the sound of the chewing, splitting up to apprehend the subject from all available directions. The shriek of tearing metal echoes through the building, bouncing off the walls and creating a cacophony that is difficult to track. They do their best to follow the sound, but quickly veer off in separate directions in an attempt to cover as much ground as possible. One operative confronts the stranger just as he is reaching for another piece of metal. He watches as the man takes a massive bite out of the steel, a bite that should have shattered his teeth and broken his jaw. Instead, a cartoonish bite mark is taken out of the metal. He approaches the stranger, who, upon locking eyes with him, begins to shake his head, still chewing. The MTF operative ignores this visual cue, approaching the man and attempting to physically restrain him. This, like the confrontation with the champion before, is cut off with a fateful chomp and the operative screams ringing out through the warehouse, alerting his teammates to his unfortunate fate. The screams suddenly go silent, and another MTF operative stops cold, listening as the sound of chewing draws nearer and nearer. He spins around to face the presence behind him and spots the stranger standing there. The otherwise ordinary man is polishing off the tip of a steel beam, grimacing as he swallows it. The operative lifts his weapon, pointing it at the subject. The operative tells him to stand down and come quietly. The hungry man pleads wide-eyed for the operative to turn and run while he still can. He takes small, reluctant steps toward the operative, muttering that he can't stop. The operative brandishes his weapon again, barking another order for the man to stop. Before he can make another move, the stranger snatches the weapon out of his hand, opens his mouth, and swallows it. He winces as he does, but does not stop until the weapon is completely devoured. All at once, he lets out a loud belch, his knees buckle, and he slumps to the ground. He rubs his stomach, wipes his brow, and sighs heavily. I'm so sorry about that. I was just so hungry I couldn't help it. The man shakes his head sadly. I hope you can get a new weapon. And I'm sorry about your friend, too. You said you couldn't help it. Why'd you stop? The stranger shrugs, sighs again, and simply says, Well, because I was full. After a bit of convincing, and a test confirming that the subject's strength and bite force has returned to ordinary human levels, the remaining mobile task force agree to bring him into Foundation custody unharmed, though restrained. They pile into one of the SCP Foundation's trademark unmarked vans and set off toward the nearest Foundation site. About one hour into the trip, the subject begins to lament his growling stomach, asking if they could possibly stop somewhere for a bite to eat. Ordinarily, this is against protocol, but after what happened to their teammate, the task force members aren't taking any chances. They pull into a fast food drive through and permit the subject to order whatever he wants. They'll declare it as a business expense later. Five burgers, five fries, five tacos, five pies, five cokes, ten tater tots, ten tenders, five shakes, five pancakes, five jalapeno poppers, and five baked potatoes later, the task force successfully reached the Foundation site with their newest subject, SCP-913. SCP-913 appears to be an average African-American man around middle age. Though his appearance is completely ordinary, his metabolism is unnaturally fast. He requires the recommended daily caloric intake for an average human being every two hours and has an unusually high internal temperature, though the specific number has been redacted from his official file. If he does not meet his calorie requirement for a given two-hour period, he will enter a trance state in which he is unable to control himself. In this state, he will break down and ingest any solid matter in his line of sight. This includes matter that would ordinarily be indigestible, including wood, plastic, and metal. In this state, his appetite does not distinguish between living and non-living subjects. When he is in this hunger-driven state, he is aware of all his actions, but cannot stop himself, even when he eats dense materials that cause him extreme discomfort. If this state hits while the subject is sleeping, he will be forced awake. In addition to his anomalous appetite, SCP-913 can rend objects at an estimated force of 3,000 newtons and can bite objects with an estimated force of 5,000 newtons when eating them. Whenever he is not in his trance state, he cannot replicate this strength. An examination of SCP-913's liver tissue showed that it is capable of producing new enzymes in response to foreign material, allowing his body to digest matter that should be highly dangerous to consume. These enzymes metabolize the substrate at an efficiency of approximately 98%, detoxifying any drugs or toxins consumed by the subject during the hunger state or otherwise. This includes, but is not limited to, amnestics and anesthetics. When SCP-913 was first discovered, he was wearing a shirt and dress pants, both with the brand name Doctor's Orders sewn onto their tags. 
SCP-913 has no tattoos aside from one on his right calf, which reads, Mr. Hungry, from Little Misters by Dr. Wondertainment. Just in case you aren't aware, the Little Misters are a line of humanoid anomalies created by the mysterious Dr. Wondertainment Corporation, including the fish-headed Mr. Fish, the candy-coated Ms. Sweetie, and Mr. Life and Mr. Death, who is every bit as existentially upsetting as he sounds. The purpose of these creations is currently unknown, though like many Dr. Wondertainment products, their existence invites endless speculation. SCP-913 must be contained in a customized humanoid containment cell lined with one meter thick carbon steel. 913 is to be provided standard furnishings for his containment cell, coinciding with the usual necessities for a comfortable humanoid dwelling. He may be given pre-recorded entertainment materials, such as concerts, films, and television shows upon request. The cell may be accessed via a reinforced carbon steel door. Once every two hours, SCP-913 is provided with one nutritional supplement as specified in Document 913-2. I attempted to locate a copy of 913-2 for further details on said nutritional supplement, but access to it appears to be limited to researchers assigned to SCP-913. While the subject is sleeping, nutrition is provided to SCP-913 via a central venous catheter that must be changed once every three months. These measures allow SCP-913 to receive the calories that he needs to avoid entering a hunger state, ensuring the safety of everyone on site as well as his own comfort. Like the rest of the Little Misters, SCP-913 presents a puzzle that may never be solved. I could spend my limited time on this earth wondering why Dr. Wondertainment would create a being that seems to serve no purpose other than eating as much as possible, lest he unwillingly destroy the environment around him, but I believe that would be a waste of time. Why does Dr. Wondertainment do anything that they do? Why create a woman who can turn men into candy soldiers? Why create an ordinary man with a fish head, a tiny top hat, and a Boston accent? The personal motivations of Dr. Wondertainment, whether they are an individual or a massive conglomerate, are as inscrutable to me as the meaning of life itself, or the reasons why a person would want to eat more than two hot dogs in one sitting. The store manager had heard of crazy customers, but this was something else. A mob comes barreling towards the store, visible through the display windows as they charge down the street. They all look crazed, much closer in appearance to rabid animals than human beings, frenzying, foaming at the mouth. A few of them stumble in their haste while rushing for the automatic sliding doors. Some fall to the ground, only for others to clamber over them, leaping like athletes going over hurdles, with all the same speed, but with none of the grace. To the staff inside the store, they look like a pack of zombies, all apparently infected by the same virus that had given them such a ravenous hunger. For savings! I thought Black Friday was a week ago, the trainee remarks as the doors slide open and the first of the mob spills inside. Welcome to the Mattress Madness Megastore, everyone. If you could kindly form an orderly... Within seconds, the trainee vanishes as a tidal wave of Madden Mattress Store customers starts to pile into the store. Each and every one of them is deranged. That much is clear, even from a distance. Across the store, the store manager watches as his colleagues are shoved and tackled out of the way, just from their misfortune of standing too close to the entrance. It's only as one of the mob wanders closer that the store manager notices their eyes. Both lids stay shut, somehow closed, despite the crazed customer standing upright. They aren't screwed tightly. It's clear this person isn't forcefully keeping their eyelids clamped down. Instead, they're gently sealed as if the customer is still asleep or sleepwalking. The whole situation was astounding. First thing in the morning, just at opening time, a horde of sleepwalking customers barged their way into the Mattress Madness megastore, moving and fighting retail staff as if they were all still awake and fully aware. And as if that isn't bizarre enough, it quickly turns out these people aren't here because they're eager not to miss out on great deals on their bedroom furniture. To the store manager's horror, the mob has come to the Mattress Madness Megastore for breakfast. He watches an elderly woman, eyes closed, shuffle up to a luxury cashmere pillow top California king-size mattress and proceed to eat it. And not bite by bite either, not even ripping off pieces to chomp through like so much cotton candy. In a far more horrifying fashion, the old lady eats the mattress whole. The store manager feels his blood run cold at the sight of her mouth widening unnaturally unhinging like a snake eating its prey. Except in this bizarre, unaired nature documentary, the snake is a human being, and its meal is a perfectly good bed that moments before had been resting on a stylish ottoman frame. 
The same exact display of confusing carnage is unfolding all over the Mattress Madness megastore, people devouring entire Egyptian cotton mattresses. Some had even already devoured their respective meals and were already moving on to any accompanying pillows or cushions, feeding on them in much the same way. The few members of staff bold enough to try and intervene couldn't seem to wake the sleepwalking shoppers up. No matter how hard they grip each one by the shoulders and shake, nothing could deter them from devouring divans and munching on memory foam. A sudden, terrifying, and inescapable thought cuts through all the confusion, striking the store manager with an even greater fear. The stock room. Behind a series of doors, marked with signs reading, employees only, are shelves upon shelves of new units. The Mattress Madness Megastore being a much bigger outlet means that there's additional inventory to replace any mattresses on the shop floor that gets sold, and more mattresses mean more food for the mob. The worry that these sleepwalkers might soon develop a taste for human flesh never occurs to the store manager. He hurriedly races around the store, gathering up as many of his surviving staff as he can, and urges them to help him defend the stock in the back room. Some are already abandoning their posts, ripping name tags off their polo shirt uniforms and rushing to leave the store. They aren't willing to die for $7.25 an hour. The Mattress Madness Megastore has insurance. It'll cover the damaged stock once the crazed customers have feasted on feather beds, but the manager urges them to stay. The store's insurance covers stock that is damaged in transit, not mattresses that are eaten by hungry lunatics. A few stay, using the manager's desperation to leverage pay raises and more annual vacation days in exchange for their help during this crisis of cashmere carnivory. With his resistance force gathered, the store manager commands the remaining employees to charge for the door at the back of the store, but some of the nearby mattress eaters overhear in their sleepwalking state. The staff freeze, uncertain whether to bolt for the stockroom and risk being chased by the hungry customers. They need a distraction, a sacrificial lamb to grab the horde's attention. And with a solemn expression, the store manager realizes what he must do. This isn't a fight he'll make it out of alive. He leaps up onto a twin inner spring and calls out to the crazed customers. Attention everyone, he bellows. I'd like to announce that all our mattresses are half off for the next five minutes. The crowd goes even more rabid, all eager to eat the pillowy pedestal the store manager is standing upon. His staff flees in the opposite direction, rushing to barricade themselves inside the storeroom while their boss meets a grisly demise, and the crazed customers devour every remaining mattress in sight. But what on earth could have possibly caused such a scene to unfold? What was the inciting incident for this unprecedented act of mass matricide, the divan destruction, and combination carnage? All it took was one seemingly innocuous image, an unassuming online post, to stir over 7,000 people into a featherbed feeding frenzy. It's December the 3rd, 2020, almost an entire day before the deranged events that would soon unfold at the Mattress Madness Megastore. And just like he does most days after college, the student is trawling various internet forums in search of things to laugh at. He's procrastinating and, through inaction, allowing himself to be buried under a veritable avalanche of assignments, all with rapidly approaching dates that they're due in by. But he doesn't care. He can always do them tomorrow. As far as he's concerned, there's plenty of time for him to waste doing, well, very little. But no matter where he looks, nothing brings with it even the smallest hit of dopamine. It's been hours since he stopped checking the clock at the bottom right-hand corner of his computer screen, instead wearing out the muscles of his finger as it spins the scrolling wheel of his mouse. His social media feed is all the same, more doom and gloom, and despite his searching, he can't find anything funny to alleviate his ongoing existential nightmare for so much as a second. If anything, seeing every anxiety-inducing post about the state of the world or dour headlines of reposted news articles only makes everything worse. That is, until the fateful link appears in his inbox. It's from one of his friends at college, living in the dorm across campus. The pair of them constantly swapped links and exchanged memes over direct messages, sometimes while sitting in the middle of important lectures. So the student quickly opens up the latest message from his friend, pleased to have something to relieve the monotony instilled by the prior several hours worth of mindless scrolling. Sure enough, his friend's message sits waiting to be read in his inbox. It's just a single blue hyperlink, with no additional context offered, nothing to indicate what the link is or what website it leads to, or even why the student's friend bothered to send it. They're long past the need to provide context for the memes they send each other, 
The link redirects to a familiar corner of the internet to the student, the Deep Fried Meme subreddit. Just seeing that written in the hyperlink is enough to spur an enthusiastic click. It's like going home, back to somewhere warm and welcoming, where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came, and where the student knows he's bound to find something to entertain himself. A deep fried meme is usually a heavily edited image with a number of different filters added to it. Its contrast is boosted, the picture is oversaturated and distorted, all to the point wherein the colors are unnatural, and the image appears as a grainy, washed out mess of pixels. And they're one of the student's favorite subgenre of funny posts. Opening up the link sent by his friend, he finds one such deep fried meme staring back at him. It depicts a man, long haired and wearing dark clothes, presumably a fan of heavy metal music. In front of the metal head is a table with a chessboard placed neatly atop it. The pieces on the board are distributed in such a way that places the metal head in checkmate, and his opponent? Directly opposite him at the table is a glass bowl filled with water and a goldfish aimlessly swimming around. And to top off this Louvre-worthy masterpiece is text, seemingly cut and paste from various different places, judging by the alternating fonts and styles. The words have been placed into a sentence that reads, Tell me your secrets, fish. And the student explodes with laughter, as if answering his prayers for some humorous entertainment to avoid working on his college assignments, his friend had appeared out of the blue and delivered a perfect deep-fried meme. But that momentary boost in serotonin levels quickly subsides, and the student knows how these exchanges work. This has to be reciprocal, a mutual trading of memes, like for like, akin to swapping trading cards in the playground at a younger age. And so he searches the subreddit for a token worthy of returning to his friend. He clicks on a search filter, sorting the results from the top posts of all time to the most recent posts of the day. These were fresh, hot off the presses, or out of the deep fryer in this case. And the newer they were, the lower the chances that his friend had already seen them. Scrolling through, the student is met with a few underwhelming attempts that weren't worthy of the prestige expected by the deep fried meme subreddit. They'd be better suited for posting on R cringe. But then, it appears, the perfect, deep fried, crispy, golden brown, cooked to perfection picture to send back to his friend. The distorted image is a photograph of a bed specifically a king-size mattress on what looks like a polished wooden bed frame, although it's not easy to tell thanks to just how grainy the picture has been made. Whoever edited this meme knew what they were doing and has nailed the absurdist, bizarre humor that the student and his friend thrive on. A label over the mattress simply reads, King Size, and the meme is captioned in a classic top text, bottom text format with the phrase, a feast fit for a king. And the piece de resistance the crowning touch that makes this meme worthy of the student's lofty standards is the title given to it by the original poster. It sums up the meme perfectly, succinctly in three words, eat your mattress. The student erupts into uncontrollable fits of laughter, so much so that tears start to stream down his face. His stomach almost feels like it might explode at just how fine he thinks the post he's found is. Through giggles that hit like the aftershock of an earthquake, he copies the link to the Eat Your Mattress meme into a message and hits send to share the hilarity with his friend. Little does he know, he's just condemned his friend to the same fate that now awaits him. As soon as he falls asleep, it'll happen. And the student and his friend aren't the only ones either. The post spreads, either sent directly from one person to another or seen by those just browsing the deep fried meme subreddit and happening across the Eat Your Mattress photo. Not all of them find it funny. They don't have to. They aren't even required to share it, to pass it on to someone else and help the post spread like wildfire. They've looked at it, and that's enough. Come the next day, an estimated 7,000 people across the world have seen the same meme, and it affects them all in the exact same way, becoming a directive, a command planted in their subconscious, one that they will act on without even realizing. It's been only a few hours since all the carnage erupted at the Mattress Madness Megastore, but by now, the SCP Foundation has swept in and taken control of the scene. A cordoned section of multiple blocks under the cover story of a dangerous gas leak, it's enough to keep civilians and prying eyes away without asking too many questions. But as for the Foundation personnel themselves, they've got plenty of unanswered questions of their own. Two members of the cleanup team are reviewing the store's security footage, baffled by the sights of the chaos that unfolded there earlier that same morning. On the screen, frenzied customers are eating entire mattresses, stretching their mouths wide open and swallowing them whole. 
They watch as the store manager appears to make an attempt at a noble sacrifice to distract the horde of ravenous customers so his employees can rush towards the storeroom. But the manager is fine. Once the horde has eaten all the mattresses out on the store's main floor, they start trying to break into the stockroom out back, where the other employees have used layers upon layers of cellophane-wrapped mattresses to barricade the door. By the time the Foundation arrives, the customers have already forced their way into the stockroom and have devoured around half of the mattresses while exhausted employees try to wake them from their sleepwalking state. The Foundation sees to it that everyone affected is rapidly administered with memory-wiping amnestics to forget all about the ordeal. Their next job is to try and track down the source of whatever caused this unprecedented outbreak of mattress eating. But being experts in all things anomalous, it doesn't take the Foundation long to start pursuing possible explanations. Having already confirmed this wasn't a viral anomaly, their next course of action is to investigate possible mimetic causes, and sure enough, a common factor quickly presents itself. The mob that attacked the Mattress Madness Megastore, along with subjects who have engaged in similar acts of mattress eating across the world, all have one thing in common. Each one has been exposed to the Eat Your Mattress post on the Deep Fried Meme subreddit. It takes some deduction on the Foundation's part to figure out the cause, after all, the meme in question is similar to a number of others posted in the same subreddit. As a result, the Foundation's online detection software, or web crawlers, initially fail to flag the mattress meme as an anomalous image. Once they do, it is designated as SCP-5126. But with a cause established, the pieces start to fit together. The Foundation's researchers soon realize what the image does. Another reason it was initially missed is that its effects only occur once the subject that has seen it falls asleep. The student is one such subject who lived through this. He dozes off in his gaming chair well past the middle of the night, hours after he's first seen SCP-5126. While sound asleep, without waking up once, he starts to seek out his mattress, laying unoccupied on his bed on the other side of his cramped dorm room. He and all the others who have seen SCP-5126 then consume their mattresses, including in many cases their pillows, any cushions, and even plush toys. Their bodies stretch unnaturally to accommodate the meal, only to return to normal once they have done the deed. Having returned to normal, the student and the others like him remain unaware they've just eaten a mattress. But the Foundation is left puzzled. There's still one question that hasn't been answered. Their examination of the several hundred customers at the Mattress Madness Megastore revealed that the consumed mattresses aren't digested like food ordinarily is. They vanish without a trace. So this naturally begs the question, where are all these eaten mattresses going? Well, the Foundation quickly comes up with an experiment to find out. They place tracking devices inside of the cell of a member of D-Class personnel and expose him to SCP-5126. Sure enough, the meme takes effect, and once asleep, he eats his mattress. The experiment is going exactly as the Foundation planned. Now they can follow the signal from the tracking devices to pinpoint the destination that all the consumed mattresses are disappearing to. And after several sweeps of the Earth's surface, their satellites discover a ping coming from a remote location in the state of Montana. MTF Sigma-16 suit up, ready to head out to the location. This mobile task force operates under the code name slumber party, and it's up to them to investigate. They come across a large structure. It looks a lot like a medieval castle, but it has been built out of mattresses and large cushions. It's the ultimate pillow fort. It even has pillars and all the fortifications you'd expect from a real historical castle, all made out of even more pillows. The slumber party team enters the fort and quickly discovers that the structure is able to anomalously reconstruct itself. Sigma-3 kicks over a stack of pillows and plush toys arranged to resemble a statue and watches as it reforms after collapsing. The team ventures deeper into the pillow fort and is quickly met with humanoid entities that are also made out of pillows. An entity swipes a pillow arm at Sigma-1, but she ducks out of the path of the attack. Drawing her firearm, she fires, causing a plume of feathers to spray out of the pillow person. The entity is unfazed, and several additional shots do nothing. Even a taser is ineffective. The pillow entities are exhibiting extreme resistance to damage, but Sigma-2 has an idea. She grabs a pillow from one of the walls and uses it to bash the entity attacking her teammate Sigma-1. The pillow person collapses into a pile on the floor, inanimate, and just like that, the mobile task force has a way to fight back. They all grab pillows and make quick work of their attackers before they move on to explore the rest of the castle. 
Then they encounter the king. There is a man sitting atop a large stack of cushions, wearing a nightcap and pajamas, eating feathers from an expensive brand of pillow. Scattered around him are empty pillowcases. Trying to ignore the smell, the slumber party team attempts to interrogate him. He claims to be the king of cushion, obsessed with pillows since a young age. Their smell, taste, and texture inspire him to create a kingdom of plush, his masterpiece of mattresses. It doesn't take very long for the Foundation operatives to realize that this man is insane. They question him about how SCP-5126, the Eat Your Mattress meme, works. How is it able to make people consume entire mattresses and send them to the king's cushiony castle? And why? Well, the king explains that buying mattresses is expensive, so in order to build his castle, he's outsourced the gathering of building materials. As he sees it, he is offering people affected by the meme a delicious meal in exchange for their beds, spreading the world of pillows so he can gather resources for his kingdom. Suddenly, he challenges the slumber party team to a pillow fight for having tracked him down. The King of Cushion takes up a pillow in one hand and charges towards the mobile task force, armed and ready to do battle with them all. He is quickly incapacitated by Sigma-1's taser and drops to the floor defeated. Now designated SCP-5126-A, the King of Cushion is transported back to the SCP Foundation for analysis and containment. Their testing reveals he possesses no anomalous properties whatsoever, and the King actually requires his stomach to be pumped thanks to the copious amounts of pillow feathers he's been eating. The Foundation gets to work dismantling his pillow fort and moving all the components into storage. And as for the Eat Your Mattress meme itself, the Foundation's web crawlers are keeping an eye out for any other posts of the anomalous image. And don't worry, if you find yourself giggling at a funny deep-fried image that jokingly implies you should eat your mattress, the Foundation will ensure you don't remember it happening, and they'll even throw in a replacement for your swallowed mattress at no added cost. Now that's a bargain. It's never a nice feeling waking up lying amongst shards of broken glass in the middle of the road. The dawn sky above the biker looks almost peaceful. It's as if nothing had gone wrong at all, as if everything is right in the world. But slowly, the throbbing pain washes into his helmeted head, and the sound of the traffic surrounding him rises in his ears. A sea of onlookers gathers around as the cars blast their horns. Through the cracked visor of his helmet, the biker can see concerned faces, people calling emergency services, and a few women crying. His paramedic bike is toppled on its side about 40 feet from him, there are long black tire marks running up to where it lies, smoking slightly on its side. With a groan, the biker sits himself up and shakes his head. Bad idea. Looking around, though, it seems he's the only one injured. His bike had gone into the front of a car at the junction. The occupants of the car stand by nervously, offering him whatever little assistance they can. But there's no time for that, the biker suddenly realizes. He looks down at his watch frantically. It's 12.03 p.m. There's not enough time. He rushes over to the bike as fast as he can and lifts it back upright. A couple of onlookers try to grab his arms, trying to sit down to rest, but he can't. There's no time. He has just three minutes to get to St. Mary's Hospital in central London. Right now, he's at the junction outside Baker Street Station. He can still make it on time if he gets on his bike and goes now. The biker swings his leg onto the bike and kicks it into life. He takes a deep gulp and looks over his shoulder at the box on the back of his bike. He can't risk opening it here. The damage may already be done, but if the heart is still alive in that box, it is the only chance that a ten-year-old boy has for a normal life. If he doesn't get to the hospital in the next three minutes, his life could be over. The school children stand in a circle, looking down at the dead bird with a morbid fascination. Do you think it's alive? No, no way. The boy in the middle of the group goes to pick up a stick. With an air of false confidence, he walks up to the bird and gives it a prod. It makes a squelching noise. The other kids all reel in shock, making retching noises and laughing about it. It's only when their teacher comes out to call them inside that the group disperses, leaving the animal carcass alone, sitting at the edge of the playground, outside the view of boring adults. Each passing day, the kids wander over to the bird's body. It's kind of the best biology lesson they've ever had as they watch the animal slowly decompose. At first, its body just shrinks, goes flat almost. The feathers start falling out, and it loses all of its color. Then it starts to get puffy. Different parts of its flesh bulge out in weird places, as if they're being inflated like a balloon animal at someone's birthday party. But then, the maggots come. 
There are only a couple of tiny white crawling wrigglers in the bird's body at first, but a couple of days after that, it's infested with them. The creepy crawlies wriggle all over the body. But as the boy looks down at the dead bird, he spots something very peculiar, something they haven't seen in a biology class before. There's a red maggot, wriggling and crawling in amongst the rest of the creepy crawlies. It squirms like the rest of them, but even over the course of the school day, it quickly grows larger than any of the others. What do you think it is? The boy stares at it. It looks like a worm. And a worm is exactly what it was. The next day, when the kids return, they see that the red maggot is now much larger than any of the others feasting on the bird. With a slightly translucent body, cherry red coloring, and small white speckles on its skin, it looks unlike anything they've ever seen before. Actually, not unlike anything they've ever seen before, it looks exactly like something that all the kids recognize very well. In fact, one of the kids has a bag of them right now that he's chewing on. A candied worm. The kids stare in curiosity, first at the bag of candy that their friend has in his hand, and then down at the worm, slowly eating its way through the decomposing bird. As far as their eyes can tell, the two things are exactly the same. Except, of course, that the one eating the bird seems to be alive. Kids being kids, the next thing that happened was sort of inevitable. One dares the boy to eat it. He almost wretches in disgust. There's no way he's even touching it. And then, another one of the children throws down the poison chalice and dares him. The boy stands there nervously. He knows that he's not allowed to eat worms. That had been a lesson ingrained in him from a very young age. But his mother isn't here right now. And this thing doesn't look like any kind of worm that he's seen before. It almost looks a bit… tasty. In exchange for eating the worm, another one of the children promises he'll give him five English pounds. The kids around the circle gasp. That's a lot of money. None of them have even got two pounds on them, let alone five. Think of all the sweets you could buy with that kind of money. But the boy is adamant. He puffs his chest out, he stands up tall, and he nods firmly. Five pounds, or he wouldn't do it. After some intense schoolyard debate, the deal is sealed. As the boy lies in bed that night, staring at the ceiling and grumbling, he knows that he is not happy about what his friends have done to him today. He's going to get them back for this. Only he's getting a bit of a tummy ache. Getting is the wrong word. He's had a tummy ache for most of the evening. What he's experiencing now is heartburn. It feels as if something is crawling in his chest. The boy just ignores it. It's probably just his worries about the worm inside of him. He chewed it up pretty well. There's no way that it's still alive in him, surely. His uneasy sleep is punctuated by rotten dreams. Dreams in which he finds himself lying on the floor and his playground lying on the ground at school, unable to move as people gather around him to poke him with a stick. He feels his skin covered with maggots. They even crawl across the surface of his eyes. In his chest, there's a searing pain. The boy wakes with a start as he feels his heart pounding, thudding against his ribs. It's agonizing. Adrenaline courses through him as he sweats off his face. Crying out for his mom, the boy lies there in bed, feeling the heart attacking his system. When you decide to become a surgeon, you have to accept that you're not going to get very much sleep most nights. In fact, it's more than that. You have to not only accept that you won't get much sleep most nights, but you also have to be at your absolute best when you've had no sleep and it's the middle of the night. With over 40 years under his belt, the surgeon doesn't need coffee anymore, even when the junior doctor offers it to him as he strides toward the operating theater. Instead, he asks them to fill him in on the situation. Who's his patient? What's going on? What needs to be done? The doctor accompanying him reads the notes in a calm but hurried voice. They haven't got much time on this one at all. At any moment, the boy's heart could give out. The surgeon asks what's wrong with the organ, and the doctor looks at his notes in apparent confusion. Apparently, over the course of the night, the boy has suffered a 72% reduction in the mass of his heart. The surgeon stops just on the other side of the door. He doesn't want to have this conversation in front of his whole team. He whispers to the doctor in a terse voice, What kind of infection does this boy have that his heart has undergone that rapid of a deterioration? It's not an infection at all, sir. It's… well, sir, it's a worm. The doctor holds out a sheet to him. The surgeon takes it from him. He looks down at the x-ray to see a scan of the boy's chest cavity. It doesn't look so bad. There's a hole in the heart for sure, but the surgeon has encountered worse in his career. This was taken when the boy was first admitted. The doctor hands the surgeon a second x-ray. And this was taken just one hour later. 
It is barely recognizable as a human heart. There seems to be a mass growing in the cavity that was left by the heart. And there, infecting all of the boy's organs, was the shape of a worm. The biker weaves his way through the traffic down on Marylebone Road, eyes darting frantically in all directions. He may have a concussion, and he may not be allowed to drive at all right now. In fact, he knows he definitely isn't. But he is under strict instructions. This heart needs to get to St. Mary's Hospital before it's too late. The bike careens around the corner and skids to a halt outside the emergency doors. An ambulance team in front of him is trying to help an old lady out of the back of their vehicle, but the biker doesn't have time for them. He grabs the organ box from the back of the bike and races into the building. It takes all of his remaining concentration to navigate through the maze of hospital corridors on his way to the operating theater. On a better day, he'd be able to do this with no problem, but with his head injury, he can see the light starting to blur all around him. Ward 6, Ward 7, Ward 7A, Ward 7B, he runs as fast as his heavy boots will allow him, feeling that energy draining from his system. He can't look at his watch, he can't check the time, he just has to find this boy. Operating theater, there, right up ahead of him, just a couple of hundred feet. There's a doctor waiting outside the door who looks up at the sound of his footsteps. The biker rips his helmet off and holds out the box with a heart in it, panting heavily. It's the moment of truth. Is he too late? The doctor looks shell-shocked, not at the biker's arrival, but clearly at something else she's just seen. The man starts to explain, but runs out of words, and instead beckons the biker to follow him into the observation room. There, the two of them stand looking through the glass at the little boy lying on the operating table with the surgeon standing over him. There's something in the air. The biker sniffs, confused. Can anyone else smell sugar? Next time you open a packet of candied worms, take a second to look through the little creepy crawlies in the bag. Perhaps poke a couple of them, just to see if any of them are moving. You can never be too careful. If you had told the parents of that young boy on the night when their son woke up with heart palpitations, telling stories of eating a worm at school, that the only health concerns he would have going forward were mild diabetes and a slightly raised level of blood sugar, I'm sure they would have been thrilled to hear it. You see, SCP-839, commonly referred to within the Foundation as candied worms, is much scarier on the surface than it is underneath. Not only does this SCP resemble your usual candy worm, but its body is actually composed of sugar flavorings and colorings, roughly equivalent to what you would find in most convenience store candy aisles. Each instance even has a small raised bit of writing near the tail specifying which flavor it is. While the origins of these worms are yet to be determined, cases have sprung up across much of the Western world, with higher numbers reported in areas with higher levels of diabetes. There seems to be a parallel between high-sugar diets and the presence of SCP-839. Whether they are of man-made or other origins is yet to be determined. That is not to say that SCP-839 cannot survive outside of human populations. This SCP in the wild primarily feeds on decomposing organic matter and is capable of sustaining itself on a purely vegetarian diet. However, when ingested into the human body, SCP-839 will target specific organs and burrow its way towards them. The organ in question depends on which color candied worm the SCP instance is. For example, the red cherry-flavored candied worms will burrow towards the heart and consume that, while the blue raspberry ones will instead feed on the human's kidney. One would expect the health consequences of this feeding to be severe. However, as the SCP feeds, it will also change its own shape and chemical composition until the worm itself becomes a substitute organ for the one that it is consuming. However, this substitute organ is not a perfect replacement, as other health consequences are derived from its presence. For example, the green apple-flavored SCP-839-3 targets the eye and replaces it with a jelly-green version of the human eye. While this eye is mostly capable of sight, subjects have reported mild hallucinations and blurriness of vision, as well as a greenish tint to how they see the world. Fortunately for the Foundation, SCP-839 reproduces sexually, meaning that individual instances require a partner in order to have offspring. This has made containment of this SCP much more feasible. Though they are a relatively low-priority entity in the broader scope of the Foundation, there are no known cases as of yet of any SCP-839 infections leading to death or serious chronic illness. Therefore, any instances that are captured by the Foundation are sent to Storage Site 839-1, where they are kept in a glass housing and regularly fed a diet of plant matter each day. Here, their reproductive activity can be closely monitored and controlled based on what research is needed. 
Those infected with SCP-839 instances can continue to live long and healthy lives, with only minor health complications arising. Therefore, the Foundation is comfortable allowing a reasonable number of cases to go unexamined in the world. So, like I said, for next time you open up a bag of candied worms, maybe just give them a quick poke. You could be saving yourself a trip to the hospital and a lifetime dependence on insulin. A storm rages outside of the little old house, as inside, a little old woman bounces a little baby on her little old knee. The baby coos and laughs as the old woman makes funny faces and noises for the child, trying to keep it entertained as they wait for his parents to return from their much-needed night out by themselves. The old woman herself needs a rest now, though. He's forgotten how exhausting it can be to watch a child. Okay, that's enough. It's time for both of us to take a little nap before your parents get back. She gets up and takes the baby into a nearby room that looks as though it was a nursery at one time, but it hasn't been used for many years. As she goes to set the child into the crib, a strong gust of wind blows through the room. She places the baby down and rushes to the window and closes it shut. It must have been left cracked open by mistake. Brr, the room is cold from the wind, but she has just the thing to fix that. She moves to a small closet and opens the creaky door. The little old woman strains to reach up to the top shelf and feels around. Ah, there it is. She pulls down a baby blanket, a soft baby blue with colorful animals printed on it. It looks as though it's been up there for a long time, and she gives it a good shake before walking back to the crib. Look what we have here. It's your daddy's own blankie. She gives it another shake. There we go, good as new. She leans into the crib and wraps the small helpless child in the blanket before giving him a gentle kiss on the forehead. Now you get some sleep. Your mommy and daddy will be back before you know it and we want to show them what a good babysitter Grammy is, don't we? That way I get to see you all the time. The little old woman switches off the light and exits the room, leaving the door cracked just a few inches. She heads back to the couch and plops down on it. Almost as soon as she does though, the baby starts crying. With a sigh, she gets back up and goes back to the nursery. What's the matter, little dear? She says as she turns the lights on. Oh no, she rushes to the crib. You've kicked your blanket off. You must be freezing. She grabs the blanket from the end of the crib and tucks it around the baby once again. There you go, that's better. The old woman leaves the room and quietly closes the door shut, leaving it open just a few inches. The moment she turns around to go back to the couch, though, the crying starts again. With a sigh, she opens the door and goes back into the room. Once again, the blanket is stuffed at the end of the crib where the baby has kicked it off. Fine, don't want a blanket, that's fine. She picks the baby up out of the crib and rocks him in her arms until it stops crying. She sets him back in the crib. There you go, no blankets, just please get some sleep. Grammy's tired. The old woman takes the blanket out of the crib and leaves the room. She closes the door most of the way and, incredibly, this time the child remains silent. The old woman resumes her place on the couch and starts to yawn. Just as she does, the wind outside picks up and howls loudly. The old woman shivers. She looks next to her and spots the baby blanket. She picks it up and examines the cute animal print, remembering when her own son was a baby wrapped in it. She smiles at the happy thought and throws the blanket around her shoulders. She leans back on the couch and finds that her eyes are growing very heavy. She'll rest them for just a moment. She won't fall asleep, she'll just rest. Mom, it's us, we're back. Thanks again for... The couple both scream when they enter the house to find that the old woman is lying face down on the floor in a pool of blood. The source of the blood is obvious. Chunks of flesh from her shoulders and upper back have been torn out, leaving jagged holes, as if she were mauled by an animal. As the man runs to the old woman, trying to do anything he can to help her, the woman runs to the nursery to find that the baby is sleeping peacefully in his crib. The woman picks up the child, tears streaming down her cheeks, and returns to the living room to see her husband kneeling beside his dead mother. Both the husband and wife are so shocked by what they have found that neither notices the baby blanket lying on the couch, or that the cruel, blood-covered mouth on it is slowly fading from view until it disappears completely. There is little in life that is more comforting than a favorite blanket. Perhaps you've had the same one since you were a child, or you have a heavy one that you like to wrap yourself in when you're feeling down, or maybe it's just one that's especially fluffy and warm that you'd do anything to keep. Today's anomaly plays on those very feelings, using them against its victims to become one of the more insidious predatory anomalies in the SCP Foundation archives. This is SCP-799, also known as the Carnivorous Blanket. 
SCP-799 is a type of creature that can vary in shape, size, and appearance, but, as the name implies, always takes the form of a blanket of some kind. The exact material the anomaly is made out of is unknown, but it is a very soft fiber that in many ways resembles a high-quality merino wool blend, though one that retains heat even more effectively than its natural counterpart. SCP-799's weight can vary from between half a kilogram all the way to six kilograms, and while examples have been found in nearly every color imaginable, it seems predisposed towards pastels and will frequently have patterns featuring stylized, friendly depictions of various animals. Both the pastel colors and the childish patterns are especially common in instances of SCP-799 that weigh less than 2 kilograms and would colloquially be known as baby blankets. While SCP-799 is undoubtedly a living organism, there is some debate as to whether it is itself an animal or perhaps a type of fungal colony. Instances of 799 are incapable of locomotion, lying motionless for long periods of time, and require little in the way of nutrition. What small amount they do need, they appear to be able to gain almost entirely from the organic particles present in normal household dust, such as animal dander and dead human skin cells. The blanket feeds via a series of minute, filter-feeding mouth-like structures that are spread across the surface of the creature, which wait for nutrients to fall into them, not unlike a sponge on the ocean floor. Instances of SCP-799 can survive for quite a while in this state, and one specimen was noted as having lived for multiple years in a damp attic, subsisting entirely on the small organic particles that would drift down from the rafters above. Should an instance of SCP-799 be forced to go for long periods of time without a source of nutrition though, like when, for example, it is placed inside of a sealed closet or drawer, it will begin to undergo certain physical changes which result in it metamorphosing into its predatory form. These changes aren't noticeable from only casual observation and consist of the blanket converting its many filter-feeding mouths into a single, large one that is lined with multiple rows of extremely sharp teeth. The blanket creature also develops a new form of tissue inside its cloth-like structure, one that is similar to muscle and capable of contracting and squeezing. Once its metamorphosis is complete, the instance of SCP-799 will lie in wait for an unsuspecting creature to cover themselves with it or wrap it around their body. Once they do, the blanket will bide its time until they enter a state of rest, usually waiting for them to fall asleep entirely, at which point its feeding phase will begin. Once the creature has detected that its victim is dormant, it will use its newly formed muscle to latch onto them, holding them in place as it opens its tooth-lined maw. It will begin to bite at its confined prey, tearing off several kilograms of flesh, bone, and any other organic material it can, swallowing it and converting it into a thin slurry that it spreads through its body almost immediately. This traumatic, violent process nearly always leads to the victim dying of blood loss. Within 10 minutes of the attack, the mouth on SCP-799 will have been completely reabsorbed, leaving no signs that it is anything other than a normal, everyday blanket, though one which now mysteriously weighs several kilograms more than it did before. By 40 minutes after the attack, the entire digestive system within SCP-799 will have demetamorphosed back into its original form, with a single digestive tract being changed once again to the many dispersed filter-feeding mouths. While SCP-799 is more than happy to feed on any warm-blooded animal, including humans, it shows no interest in cold-blooded ones or inanimate objects. It appears, then, that its senses may be limited to only touch and heat, using those as signs that it is now wrapped around a potential meal. Adding to the strangeness of SCP-799 is that it reproduces through budding, like flatworms and corals. When it has absorbed enough nutrients and sufficiently increased its mass, either very slowly through filter feeding or rapidly via its carnivorous phase, it will begin to take on a quilt-like appearance. Over several weeks, one of the quilt squares will puff up and slide off the blanket. This new, smaller instance will resemble a doily or a throw pillow, until it too begins to feed and grow. The new instance is a perfect clone of its parent, identical in every way, and it will eventually grow to a similar size and begin its own reproductive cycle. It is unknown exactly how long it takes SCP-799 to reach full maturity, but the current best guess is that when kept in its filter-feeding phase, an instance will reproduce every 50 to 60 years. Instances of SCP-799 are quite prevalent across the planet, and the SCP Foundation currently has hundreds of examples in containment. Unfortunately, it is unknown just how many still exist in the wild, as it is very difficult to identify instances with one of the only reliable means being through genetic testing. 
Should any instances be located, though, they are to be destroyed immediately, as the Foundation already has a large enough population in containment for research purposes, and they pose too much of a risk both in terms of harm and exposure to the general public. SCP-799 has been classified as Euclid, and each instance is kept in its own separate biocontainment cell at Biosite 66. Dust is regularly collected from the on-site D-Class personnel dorms and is sprinkled over the blankets regularly to keep them in their filter-feeding state, though only just enough to hopefully maintain their size and not allow them to reproduce. Should any small cloth objects appear in their containment lockers, it is to be removed immediately and contained separately. SCP-799 isn't the only predatory creature that resembles a cloth good in Foundation containment and research into possible connections to SCP-1626, the oversized gray hooded sweatshirt that sends penetrating fibers into anyone unlucky enough to put it on, is ongoing. The early morning sun rises, casting its radiance over the field. The shepherd stands guard, watching his sheep graze. It's a beautiful morning, the sheep are quiet, and his loyal dog is at his side. But the shepherd is perturbed. He is certain that there are sheep missing. He wanders through the field, counting the sheep off one by one, but no matter how many times he counts, he simply cannot make the numbers gel. There are definitely five sheep missing. How is this even possible? His family has been in the sheep herding business for generations. They survive on the money that they make from shearing, selling, and spinning the wool from these sheep. They can't afford to simply lose sheep. That's money directly from the family wallet, food directly off the family table. But even worse, it's a matter of pride. He likes to think of himself as a good shepherd who cares about his flock. Losing a single sheep is a failure of his responsibility to his charges, and he can't stand it. He knows that if he returns to the farm without those five missing sheep, he's going to be in big trouble. He's already thinking about the lecture he's going to get from his father, and that's if he's lucky. One missing sheep might be forgiven, but five? He'll be lucky if his family doesn't throw him out of the house for his failure. It's imperative that he find them and bring them back. He pats the head of his trusty sheepdog, Every shepherd, of course, has a sheepdog to help them keep their flock safe. His dog has been with him for many years, and she has never failed in the past. She keeps watch over the flock as if they were her own puppies, so the shepherd thinks it very strange that his dog didn't bark to sound the alarm when the missing sheep started to wander off. Could something more sinister be at play here? Maybe someone stole his sheep. If a thief came during the night to sneak away with the lost sheep, that might explain why they were able to get away without his dog knowing. They might have been clever enough to cause some kind of distraction to keep her busy. The shepherd notices that the fence at the edge of the field is broken. This must be how the missing sheep got away. He examines the splintered wood. It's not a natural break because the wood is sturdy and far from rotten. Someone or something must have broken the fence sometime last night. He clutches at his shepherd's crook, his brow set in determination. This isn't good. It's looking more and more likely that thieves are behind this disappearance. He needs to track them down, but you will have to be careful. Sheep thieves are usually desperate men, and they might resort to violence to protect their ill-gotten gains. A glint of sunlight flashes against something shiny caught on the fence, catching the shepherd's eye. He scoops it up and examines it closely. It looks like a scrap of fabric. Could it be that the thief snagged his clothes against the fence as he made his escape? The fabric is thin and brittle, and doesn't look like any sort of material that the shepherd has ever seen before. It more resembles a scrap of snakeskin than a scrap of shirt, but it's his only lead, so it'll have to do. He holds the scrap to his dog's nose and allows her to sniff it. She snuffles at it and then immediately raises her ears, alert. He commands her to follow the scent, and she obeys. She puts her nose to the ground and starts to track. He follows her. The dog leads him out of the field and across the way. He is surprised to see that she is leading him toward a nearby forest. He gulps in sudden fear. He's never been into these woods and, in fact, his family has often warned him to stay away. Everyone in his village loves to repeat rumors that this forest is haunted, filled with every sorts of scary monsters and demons. Why would the sheep thief brave these cursed woods? On the other hand, that would make sense though, wouldn't it? A thief would need a lair that was hidden and difficult to approach, so that they wouldn't have to worry about getting caught. These woods would be a perfect hiding place. Still, he can't help but wonder. His dog lifts her head and whines at him, indicating that he should follow. He steals his resolve and continues on. His fingers clutch tightly to his staff, his knuckles going white with fear and tension. He's almost convinced that he might see a monster here in these woods, and he's ready to defend himself from the worst. Eventually, his dog leads him into an unexpected clearing. The shepherd blinks in amazement. Standing at the center of the glen is what appears to be the remains 
of an ancient temple. He hasn't given much thought to the history of this place, to all the people who lived here in ancient times, and to what monuments they left behind. The crumbling ruins are overgrown with vines, and the columns look like they might disintegrate at a touch. He wonders what ancient civilization might have built this lost citadel, and what strange rites they might have performed here. But he doesn't have time to wonder about that, because his dog is barreling ahead, right through the ancient temple archway, and into the interior of the building. He wants to turn and run. Everything that he's ever heard about these cursed woods makes him think that this is a very bad idea, but he knows he can't return home without those sheep. Just as he's about to enter the temple himself, he suddenly hears loud barking, followed by whining and whimpering. He rushes inside, and a terrifying sight meets his eyes. Indeed, it seems like his family was right when they said that these woods are full of monsters, because his dog has cornered one right here. The creature looks like an overgrown lizard with scaly skin and a long whip-like tail. Immediately, the shepherd surmises that the scrap of fabric that he found earlier didn't come from a person's clothes after all. It's obviously a piece of shed skin, no doubt from this creature. That long tail definitely looks especially snake-like, so it's no surprise to think that this thing might also shed skin just like a snake would. In the gloom of the temple, he can see his missing sheep standing in the corner, perfectly still and perfectly quiet. He's surprised to see that they're still alive. What kind of predator kidnaps its prey and then keeps it alive instead of devouring it instantly? It's also very odd that the sheep are being so still, but it's probably just that they're petrified with fear. The good news, though, is that if his sheep are alive, that means he can rescue them. The creature spreads a large frill around its neck as it hisses, apparently hoping to intimidate the shepherd's dog. The dog is not frightened, though, and only barks louder. She's bravely guarded the shepherd's flock for years, and she's never been one to back down from a fight, even when she's threatened by a bear or wolf. So of course, she's not going to back down from a lizard. The shepherd feels nervous being so close to this creature, simply because it's so strange. But the truth is that it doesn't look like it could do that much damage. That hissing feels like bluffing, because, realistically, what's it going to do? Bite? The shepherd is no expert, but he's never heard of a venomous lizard. He steps forward to get a better look, and the creature tenses. It's obviously nervous. It's not even that big. His dog is way bigger than this creature and shouldn't have any trouble taking it in a fight. He's seen his dog fight off rats bigger than this lizard. The creature spreads its frill again and hisses even more sharply, but that only makes the shepherd even more confident in his assessment. It's trying to look bigger than it really is, he realizes. It's trying to intimidate him. Well, that's not going to work. But then, to his astonishment, his dog stops. The dog and the creature stare at one another so intently that the shepherd thinks they are actually gazing into each other's eyes. After holding its gaze for a beat, the dog suddenly collapses. The shepherd yelps in fear and confusion. His first instinct is to run to his dog to see if she's hurt. But suddenly, the creature turns its gaze on him. He stands frozen. The creature's eyes almost seem to cast a spell on him, and he feels mesmerized, unable to move or even to think. All his thoughts drain away, and the whole world starts to fade. Nothing is real except those two malevolent red eyes. The shepherd is absolutely paralyzed. It's not just terror. He finds that he can't move a muscle. He can only watch as the strange reptile approaches his frozen dog and suddenly bites her on her exposed flank. It lashes out like a snake would when it injects venom into a victim. The shepherd was sure that there weren't any venomous lizards in this area, but now he's not so sure when he's watching this scenario play out. He expects his dog might start to convulse or spasm if she's been poisoned, but she remains completely still. Suddenly, he sees something so shocking that he's certain he must be losing his mind. Could it be? The area around the bite is starting to change color, becoming a dull gray. But as he watches, he realizes to his horror that he's not just watching a color change. This is something more. His dog is slowly petrifying, hardening, her fur stiffening into stone. She is literally turning into a statue right before his eyes. He can't move, but his eyes flick to the corner of the room where his sheep are still standing. Now he understands. It was hard to tell before, because of the darkness and also because the very idea was so preposterous that it didn't even occur to him. But the reason that the sheep were so still and quiet was because they weren't sheep anymore. They were mere statues. Somehow, this creature was able to turn things to stone with the force of its venom. He wants to scream, he wants to yell, he wants to break free and run away, but he's powerless to move. Fear wells up inside him as he sees the creature turn its attention from his rapidly petrifying dog and start to move toward him. It hisses again and strikes out, sinking sharp, needle-like teeth into his leg. 
The shepherd is so frozen that he can't scream, not even at the unbelievable pain as those teeth sink deep into his flesh. But the pain doesn't stop when the creature retracts its teeth. He can feel the pain spreading outward from the site of the bite, spreading down his shins and up his legs, through his whole body. His body is hardening fast, making it hard to breathe and impossible to move. But even as he turns into a statue, he can still see everything around him, still sense the presence of the creature, still think. His thoughts aren't affected at all, other than being nearly out of his mind with terror. What could be next? The shepherd is frightened, but all he can do is wait. He's not sure how long he waits, because time has no meaning here. In the gloom of this ancient temple, he's not sure if it's day or night. He idly wonders if this temple was built for this monster, by people who worshipped it for its great and terrible power, or by people who feared it and hoped that maybe this temple would keep it contained. Or is it mere coincidence that it's taken up residence here, just as bats might roost in an abandoned building? He has no way of ever knowing. The only indication of the passage of time is the coming and going of the creature, which, even if he can't turn his head to see its movement, he can hear its shuffling and hissing. Occasionally, he hears a sound that frightens him even more, a sound that can only be described as statuary shattering, and he wonders if that will ultimately be his fate. His question is answered one day when it seems that hunger has driven the creature to dig into its larder of petrified prisoners. The creature approaches him, and he can feel it gnawing at his feet with its big, ugly beak. It's pecking at him, harder and harder, until suddenly, the shell breaks and it's chewing on the flesh of his leg. Once again, the pain is unbearable, but the shepherd can do nothing but wait. At least, he thinks, it will all be over soon. Better a quick end at the jaws of a monster and a slow death trapped frozen in stone, he thinks. It's the very best that he can hope for. That shepherd had just run afoul of a creature that appears to come straight out of medieval mythology, matching the description of the deadly monster known as a cockatrice or basilisk, but the SCP Foundation knows it as SCP-1013, a nasty little piece of work with, quite literally, a paralyzing stare. SCP-1013 is a small reptile resembling a lizard, but with several key differences that set it apart from any other animal in this order. It was recovered in Egypt, an interesting coincidence, since medieval bestiaries often regard that region as the ancestral home of the basilisk. However, Foundation agents believe that since no other specimens were found in the area, that SCP-1013 is not a naturally occurring animal and might have actually been bioengineered. While SCP-1013 itself is only 60 centimeters long, its abnormally long tail measures nearly 121 centimeters long. It can use its tail to distract prey. It has a wide frill around its neck that it can extend at will, similar to that of the Australian frilled lizard. Its head does not look like any other known lizard, though, with a serrated beak and a distinctive head waddle that many researchers feel gives it the appearance of a rooster. Its beak is filled with long, needle-like teeth. But stranger than its appearance is its hunting methods. When it spies potential prey, SCP-1013 will extend its neck frill with a sudden, snapping sound. The frill appears designed to attract attention and encourage victims to look into the eyes of SCP-1013, because its eyes are, of course, where it holds its real power. The mythical cockatrice was said to be able to turn a person to stone with the power of its gaze, similar to the petrifying powers attributed to the Gorgon Medusa of Greek mythology, and SCP-1013 is very similar to its legendary namesake in this regard. Anyone or anything making direct eye contact with SCP-1013 will experience stabbing pain in most major muscle groups, followed by full paralysis setting in within three seconds and lasting up until eight minutes. It is currently unknown how SCP-1013 achieves this paralyzing effect. Once its prey is paralyzed, SCP-1013 will bite its victim with its needle-like teeth, thus initiating a process of calcification. The victim will gradually stiffen and harden, almost as if they are turning into a statue. The process will begin at the site of the bite and gradually work its way through the body so that a full-grown adult will become completely calcified within 15 minutes. As of yet, there is no known way to stop or reverse the process. The calcification process only affects the outer layers of the victim, extending about 3 centimeters into the body, leaving all organs and internal tissues intact. It also does not affect the eyes or mucous membranes. This means that victims of SCP-1013 are still alive but cannot move or react. Perhaps even more horrifying, SCP-1013 then eats its victims alive. SCP-1013 feeds by breaking the hardened outer layer with its beak, much like a young chick would break its way out of an egg, and then feeding on the soft tissues preserved within. 
The victim will experience excruciating pain as the creature eats them alive, but they cannot resist. They cannot even scream to give voice to their pain. SCP-1013 has a voracious appetite and will consume nearly twice its body weight at each feeding. Victims usually die of blood loss before SCP-1013 can complete its meal. SCP-1013 does engage in caching behavior and has been known to store petrified victims for later consumption. It prefers mammals as prey and will attack livestock and game just as readily as it will attack humans. In times when mammal food sources are not available, desperation may drive SCP-1013 to turn its paralyzing powers on fish, birds, or even insects, but it will only do this if it is near to starving. SCP-1013 is hermaphroditic and, unlike other reptiles, does not reproduce sexually but instead undergoes a process similar to budding or basic cellular division. Before reproducing, SCP-1013 will increase its feeding, gorging on food and growing rapidly in size. Eventually, it will develop cyst-like structures in its abnormally long tail, each of which contains a juvenile SCP-1013. Juvenile SCP-1013 hatch after only 48 hours. Parent SCP-1013 will typically release hatchlings within calcified prey, providing a ready food source for the juveniles until they can hunt on their own. Juvenile SCP-1013 will seek out cool, dark places like caves or abandoned buildings and begin rapid molting, doubling in size every six hours until reaching full adult size. Once they have reached adulthood, SCP-1013 will set out on their own and quickly establish their own hunting territories. SCP-1013 is extremely aggressive and will attack and attempt to calcify anyone that enters its enclosure, making it extremely difficult to contain. For this reason, combined with its deadly powers of calcification, SCP-1013 has been designated Object Level Keter. Any staff entering the containment area are to wear the AR-68 Armored Variant Hazmat Suit. Staff exiting the area with damaged suits are to be remanded to quarantine for one hour. Staff becoming paralyzed during cleaning, feeding, or testing cycles are to be immediately removed and remanded to medical custody until five hours after recovery. SCP-1013 is to be fed daily with one small mammal. However, any calcified animal remains are to be removed from the 1013 containment chamber and incinerated for safety reasons. 1013 is a frightening reminder that, while many entities have piercing gazes, comparatively few can end your life. Few, however, does not mean zero. These winters are getting worse every year, that's for sure. The old cattle rancher doesn't know if it's the climate changing, God's judgment arriving, or if he's just getting older and struggling to keep up. Probably a strong mix of all of it. Whatever the cause, it doesn't change the facts. It's deathly cold out there. His ailing, elderly Ma's health continues to deteriorate. He hasn't heard from his delivery driver Orhe in days, and on top of it all, his loyal dog, Mary Bell, is out there barking into the darkness of the barn. The rancher heads out to fetch her. He doesn't know what he'd do if she froze. He whistles, but she doesn't look back at him. She just carries on barking up that road into the snowy night. The rancher wades through the snow and peers in the direction she's looking. There's nothing there, girl. Get inside. But Mary Bell keeps barking. She's insisting. He looks again. Is that? The rancher takes off running up the road. All thoughts of cold immediately gone from his mind, he races towards the figure as fast as he can. His frozen fingers fumble at the zipper on his parka. Icy wind stabs the insides of his lungs. Mary Bell shoots off ahead of him. There, he pulls the zipper down and wrestles the thick coat off of his shoulders just as he reaches the tiny figure. He drops to his knees and throws the coat over the shoulders of the little girl standing alone in the snow. Quick as he can, he wraps it tightly around her, pulling the hood up and over her head. He takes her tiny shoulders in his hands and gives her a shake. You okay? Hello? Can you hear me? The girl sways for a moment, then collapses. He catches her and in one deft motion scoops her into his arms and takes off back down the road in the direction of his farm. Where the hell had she come from? There are no buildings around here for miles. No one uses that road except Jorge. And in this weather, she couldn't have walked all the way over those mountains. She'd have frozen solid. He bites the finger of a glove and pulls it off. With his bare hand, he clasps one of hers. By the feel of her skin, she pretty much is frozen solid already. He needs to get her warmed up, now. He kicks open the front door and bundles inside with a flurry of snowflakes and an anxious dog at his heels. The fire's not quite dead yet, so he rushes over to the hearth and lays the little girl down next to it. He can barely see her at all wrapped up in his enormous coat. She doesn't seem to be moving. 
Ma, I'm home. I... I found someone. The rancher grabs two dry logs from the side and throws them onto the fire. He piles kindling high on top of them and blows steadily into the embers at the bottom. They glow and swell in size. No taking yet. He blows again for longer, and again. He feels his head starting to swim. A crackle, a lick of flame. It's taken. Panting, he turns back to the bundled-up coat on the floor with the child inside. Still no movement. A sickening knot tightens his stomach. What if she's... No, don't let yourself think that. Not yet. He reaches down and gently undoes the zipper on the parka. His trembling fingers push back the hood. She's pale. Deathly pale. Her dark brown hair is wet and clings to her scalp. The tips are frozen. At a guess, she must only be nine years old. Eyes closed, lips a sickening blue. But that's not the color that scares him the most. On her neck, there's red. Delicately as he can, the rancher takes the coat off her shoulders and hangs it up by the fire. She's dressed only in a plaid shirt, way too big for her. It looks like an adult's shirt, similar to an old one he used to have years ago. But on her neck, her hands, her feet, is that same deep red, layers of blood frozen to her skin. He sits back, his mind blank. He's seen that much blood before. Sure he has. When you work with cattle, it's an unfortunate part of the job. He's seen cows bleed out during childbirth. The girl in front of him? She's the same color as those orphaned calves that lie crying on the floor. A groaning sound fills the room. The rancher looks across at the armchair where his ma sits. She doesn't look at him, doesn't look at the girl on the floor. She just stares into the fire, same way she always does. Ma groans again, trying to express something she doesn't understand, being in a world without living in it. Ma, it's okay. Sorry if I startled you. We have a, um... We have a guest with us. But she just keeps on groaning and staring into the fire. The rancher buries his head in his hands and lets out a deep breath. Only, the sound of his breath is joined by another. A tiny breath rattling and rasping through a damaged child's throat, trying its best to keep its host alive. The rancher opens his eyes and stares at the child. She isn't conscious, not by a long shot, but she's breathing, a little at a time. The icicles in her hair have turned into rounded droplets of water that glow by the heat of the fire. He snaps back to his senses. He's not doing her much if she's just lying there soaking wet. He runs off upstairs and grabs some towels and a fresh flannel shirt to wear. After several minutes of drying her off, he's confident enough that he's got most of the water off. There's still a lot of blood caked to her skin, but as far as he can tell, there's no wound anywhere that it could have come from. Brow furrowed, he leaves her under a bundle of blankets and fills up the kettle with water. Hanging it carefully over the fire, he walks over to the cabinet and fishes out a tin of cocoa from the top shelf. Hasn't been used in years, but should still be fine. He would make it with milk, but she's probably dehydrated. Lifting the kettle's lid with the poker, the rancher pours the brown powder inside and waits for it to boil. The little girl's eyes are open now. She's staring into the flames. Her lips are looking a little more pink, her skin a little more blotchy. You're safe here. Just stay by the fire and warm up a bit. You like Coco? The little girl drags her eyes away from the flames. Her expression is mostly blank. She looks too tired to be confused. I don't know. I think you will. Ma always gave me Coco. Okay. And with that, the farmhouse falls silent. The little girl stares into the fire. The rancher watches her, finally feeling the wave of exhaustion crashing over him. His ma has fallen asleep in her armchair. Only Marybelle stays awake through the whole night, staying close to the little girl by the fire, occasionally licking her toes to try and warm them up. By the morning, the snow stopped, but the huge drifts remain. As the rancher walks across to the barn, he finds it hard to believe that just a few hours ago, the winds were whipping at his face as hard as they were. The world this morning is totally still. What the rancher finds even harder to believe is that there's a little girl in his house right now, fast asleep by the fire. He checked her forehead when he woke up this morning, and she miraculously hadn't caught a fever. She couldn't have been out in that weather for too long, but it only made the question more mysterious. Where did she come from? Mary Bell didn't get up this morning. From all of the excitement last night, she must have been too tired for today. Walking through the crisp morning air, he can't really blame her. He shoulders the barn door open. A column of steam curls out of the opening. All of that warmth, humidity, and cattle smell is strangely comforting this morning. But as the rancher goes around checking on all the cows inside, he very quickly discovers a problem. They're thin, way too thin. Some of them look to be on the verge of starvation. 
He'd missed it last night as he drove them down in the dark, but in the warm glow of the barn's lights, it's unmistakable. These cows haven't been eating properly. He pours out several sacks of grain for them into the troughs, and they all gather around hungrily, filling both their stomachs as fast as they can. The rancher leans on the railing for a moment, confused. Even in this cold, there was still plenty of green grass for them up on the ridge. That's why he'd taken them up there. They should have had no trouble eating until the snow came in last night. He doesn't like this one bit. Last time Orge had driven down and collected some of the meat, he'd had a few questions about the quantity being smaller than usual. Were the cows sick at all? Not that the rancher could tell. But now, looking at them, it's clear as day. Something's up. You hungry? The little girl nods. They sit across the table from one another, eating homemade bread and soup. Ma stays over by the fire. Mary Bell slowly wanders over to the kitchenette and flops down on the floor, exhausted. Where are you from? The girl shrugs her shoulders. You know how you got out here? Remember anything from last night? The little girl just eats her soup and shakes her head. She doesn't look particularly scared or worried, just a little confused. Where are your parents? Do you have parents? Again, the little girl shrugs. The rancher sits back and folds his arms. He's tried to call into town, but his phone line's gone out in the blizzard. Not much to be done until the snow clears. He's got a good relationship with the police around here. If he explains the situation, then it'll all be okay. What do you know? Can you remember anything from last night? It was dark. The girl slurps her soup. I was hungry. So hungry. Then I saw the light and I went towards that. My car? No. Well, yes, later on it was your car, but before it wasn't. What was the light then? Where were you? I don't know. It was just... the light. Now he's even more confused, but try as he might, the rancher can't figure any of it out, and try as she might, the little girl can't remember anything more precise than that. The pair of them hop into the car and drive back out up the road that afternoon. The snow is piled so high that the rancher is having to get out twice as often as he did the previous night to clear a track for them. He isn't actually sure what he's brought her out here looking for. Clues, maybe? He almost laughs at himself at the thought, but that's probably the best word for it. If he can figure out how she got here, then he can work on understanding who she is and how to get her home. There's the damage to the phone line. One of the masts has collapsed, sagging heavily on the lines. That's not something he can fix on his own. No, sir. Looks like he'll have to wait for the snow to melt before making any phone calls again. That could be in one week. That could be in three months. He glances at the child sitting in the passenger seat. She's just staring out of the window in amazement, wrapped up in as many layers as he could put on her. They may be stuck together for a while. A lurch. The pickup plunges dangerously to the left. The rancher slams on the brakes and it comes to a stop just in time. A large chunk of snow in front of them comes loose and slips off the side of the road. It tumbles down into a gully that he hadn't even spotted. With all this snow on the ground, he has no frame of reference. Everything is just white. Stay here. The rancher opens the door and climbs out. He wishes Mary Bell was with him, but she'd wanted to stay home again. Poor dog. She must really be going through it if she wasn't even up for a ride in the pickup. Carefully as he can, testing every step before making it, the rancher creeps over to the edge of the gully. It's bigger than he thought, much bigger. It continues down, more and more sharply for a few hundred feet, all the way down into a... Oh no. There's a semi down there. A big rig, warped and bent, lying on the rocks. Just a glance is enough to tell the rancher it's Orges, but he just keeps staring at it in disbelief. Can't be. It... But it is. Stay in the car. The rancher reaches past the little girl and into the back seat. Grabbing a pair of crampons and some rope, he straightens up and looks at the girl. She knows it's serious. He can see the concern on her face. Stay in the car, he repeats. By the time the rancher makes it down to the truck, his legs and back are killing him. All this work over the last 24 hours is going to start taking its toll sooner or later, but some things have to be done. He pauses by the semi. It's on its side. He'll have to climb up onto it and try to open the door. Some things have to be done. He hoists himself up and manages to clamber onto the metal door. It's badly crumpled, and the window is smashed in. He doesn't fancy his chances of being able to get it open. One look through the window shows him that he won't want to do that anyway. Blood coats every inch of the inside of Orge's truck. The cabin that the rancher is so used to seeing and sitting in is almost unrecognizable. Smashed glass is sprinkled across every surface with a dark brownish red layer of gore frozen into everything else. There, in the midst of it all, still wearing a seatbelt, 
is Orhe's body. It dangles like a limp carcass at a butcher shop, like the cows he hangs in the slaughterhouse. And like those cows, a large chunk of Orhe is missing. His fat stomach is gone, not just cut open, but gone. The tops of his thighs, too, and much of his chest. So much of him is just missing. Open arteries and lifeless nerves dangle in place. That must have been a hell of a crash. The rancher reaches over and pulls Orhe's cap down over his eyes. Not much else to be done right now. No way he can clean this mess up by himself. But as the rancher climbs up the valley, his mind starts to connect some dots. Dots that leave a sick feeling in his stomach. He's seen that much blood somewhere else, or rather, on someone else, just last night. He slams the door to the pickup shut and starts to drive back down the track. Since the snow stopped, all of the drifts that he'd cleared earlier remain clear. It's only a few minutes' drive back down to the farm. He doesn't say a word the whole way, and neither does the little girl. She clearly senses something's up. The sick feeling in his stomach remains. He pulls up the handbrake, and the two of them sit in silence outside the farmhouse. There's a truck in that valley. Did you know that? Yes. Is that where you came from last night? I don't remember. Was he... The rancher stops. Jorge didn't have any kids. What were you doing in his truck? I don't know. Did he... Was he... The rancher can't bring himself to accuse his best friend of the words that almost left his mouth. Do you think you might not remember because something bad happened to you? I don't know. The rancher closes his eyes for a long moment. Silence fills the pickup. Come on, let's get inside. But inside wasn't the safe haven he'd been hoping for. Ma's been throwing up. Not just once, but a few times. She's distressed, groaning aimlessly for someone to come and save her. Marybelle is pacing around the room, yelping and whining. The rancher immediately goes upstairs to get some rags to clean up with. Perfect timing, as usual. But he stops in his tracks when he comes back down. His ma has stopped moaning. The little girl is kneeling by the armchair, holding the old lady's hand. The room is calm. The little girl gently places the frail hand back on the armrest and comes over to take the rags from the rancher. Returning to the old lady, the girl goes about mopping her up as best she can. Marybelle slumps back down on the floor. And that is how the four of them exist for the next few days. Ma gets sicker steadily, but the little girl stays by her side all day long, caring for her in every way. The rancher's glad of that. It gives him the time he needs to help his cows outside. None of them are in a good shape. Whatever it is, they're still getting thinner. He feeds them all the grain they'd normally need, and then some, and they always finish it off. Yet none of them are getting any fatter. The rancher leans on the railing, trusty dog by his side. His energy is starting to really lag behind what he needs. The last couple of days, even though he hasn't done all that much, have totally taken it out of him. Who do you think it is, Mary Bell? He looks down at his little friend. She's looking thinner too, actually, but she's been eating just fine. It hits him. Tapeworms. As soon as the word comes into his head, it makes total sense. His cows, his entire herd by the looks of things, have been riddled with tapeworms. Ah, oh, hell. He hasn't got anywhere near the amount of medicine needed to give some to all of them. Even if he did, a lot of them are looking pretty far gone. The chance of reinfection would be high. He needs supplies. He needs Orhe. Marybelle whines softly next to him. He knows what they have to do. Laying Marybelle down carefully by the fire, the rancher administers the tapeworm medicine. For a few hours, they lie there together. He strokes her side, waiting for her to pass it. The little girl watches over his shoulder. His ma sits back in her chair, mumbling to herself. He hasn't talked to the little girl anymore about Orhe yet. He isn't sure what there is to say. Maybe he should ask if Orhe was sick. After all, the cows clearly have had these tapeworms since before the other night. Orhe may have picked up contaminated meat from him last time he came. Maybe... Marybelle passes the worm on the rug. Ugh, the smell. The rancher uses the tongs next to the fire to pick the worm up. It's long and pale. And dead. He tosses it into the fire and puts the tongs in the flames for a bit to sterilize them. The worm sizzles and pops in the flames. The sound makes his stomach crawl. The rancher glances around and sees the little girl staring at the tapeworm. He looks past the girl to his ma sitting in the chair. Her turn next. But as that night and the following morning reveal, it's too late. His ma's groans turn into cries of pain. She openly sobs by the fire, clutching at her stomach. Every time the rancher tries to give her the medicine, she just vomits it back up. Each time she vomits, there's more and more blood mixed in. The little girl gets more and more upset. 
It's not fair on her to have to witness something this traumatic and disgusting. There's nowhere else for her to go. She shouldn't even be here at all. The fact that she is means she has to help. That's all there is to it. By sunrise, his ma has passed away. There is nasty red bruising all across her abdomen, which tells him she must have bled out internally from this worm. He'd been too late to realize what was wrong. Too late with the cows, and too late with his ma. He covers his ma with a blanket, and tells the little girl not to go and wash her hands. He needs to check on the cattle. Sure enough, during the night, a handful of them died too. The calves. They were the ones to go first whenever something like this happened. Mother cows stood over their calves, licking their heads, willing them to wake up. The rancher drags each body out to the back and burns them. He can't risk any more contamination. As the carcasses burn, he allows himself to cry. But when the rancher comes back into the house, it's full of noise, a noise that takes his brain a long time to comprehend. Crying, but not his own, not the little girl either. No, it was a new sound. It was a baby, a newborn child screaming at the top of its lungs. The rancher can't believe what he's looking at. The little girl is sitting at the hearth with Marybelle at her feet. In her arms, drenched in blood, is a baby. The girl looks up at him and smiles sweetly. It's a boy. Then she turns around to his ma's body under the blanket. A sickening red patch soaks through the fabric, right over where her stomach would be. What the hell happened here? I've got a little brother. Securing and containing SCP-1003 has proven challenging. This is largely because the tapeworm that causes all of this damage is virtually indistinguishable from Echinococcus granulosus, the common variety of tapeworm that causes hydatid disease. The tapeworm, designated SCP-1003-1, follows the same life cycle as other regular worms. Its eggs come into contact with an animal through contaminated meat, saliva, or unclean surfaces and are ingested. Once inside the gut, they grow and latch onto the inside of the digestive tract, where they feed on the nutrients of the food traveling past them, steadily growing bigger and stronger. Once mature, they lay eggs, which pass out in the animal's excrement to continue the process. Infections spread quickly, particularly in unsanitary conditions amongst livestock, and can often be difficult to contain, as by the time the symptoms – nausea, weight loss, fever – start to manifest in the infected, the worms have likely already reproduced and have a new generation growing in the guts of other animals. As far as the Foundation is aware, SCP-1003 follows this normal pattern in all observed animals except humans. When a human ingests an egg from this tapeworm, a very different creature starts to grow in their gut. Human embryos, with the same genetic code as the tapeworm, begin to form. The rate of their growth is greatly accelerated, however. By just eight weeks, they are as mature as the typical three-week-old neonate or newborn child, although similar in size to an eight-week-old embryo at 13 to 16 centimeters. Many eggs usually enter this fertilization period, but almost all of them die before having a chance to develop much beyond the early stages. They stand the best chance of survival when buried in the hepatic tissue, where they can absorb plenty of nutrients from their host. The host at this point usually starts to experience mild symptoms, lethargy, the occasional stomach cramp, nothing particularly severe, yet the embryos that survive soon develop rows of temporary, razor-sharp teeth. At this point, passively absorbing nutrients is no longer enough for them. They bury their teeth into the soft tissue surrounding them and begin to eat. Once they enter this stage, their rate of growth increases exponentially the more flesh they consume. Eventually burrowing out into the world, the tapeworm child is born drenched in blood. The size and apparent age of the child that emerges from the corpse are determined by the size of the person they consume. For example, the child eating its way out of the rancher's maw appeared to be only a ten-month-old child, as there was very little of the frail old woman for it to eat. By contrast, the little girl who emerged from Orhe's gut had plenty of fat to feast on and so was able to grow to the size of a nine-year-old. Once the child emerges, the teeth that they'd used to eat their way out quickly become loose and are replaced by regular human teeth. The children themselves have no memory at all of where they've come from or what they are. They have the same motor and linguistic skills that a regular child would possess at their age. Nothing, aside from their DNA, marks them out as being any different from the children around them, blissfully ignorant, just like the children around them. It is theorized that many of these children end up in orphanages. With no birth certificates or identifiable parents, they fall through the gaps in the system, quickly lost to the world. The only way to really track them at all is to follow the infections they cause. You see, these tapeworm children have one final curse they must live with. 
their bodily fluids, their saliva, and sweat contain the same tapeworm protoscolex that will develop into SCP-1003-1 as soon as it is ingested by another creature, making the cycle start all over again. If you want to track down a tapeworm child, and I highly advise that you don't, all you have to do is follow the trail of nasty stomach infections, internal bleeding, and freak pregnancies amongst the outcasts of society. It, unfortunately, will not take long. There are currently 10 instances of SCP-1003-2 in containment. The children live in Bioresearch Area 13 under strict supervision. Researchers are only permitted to enter their cells whilst wearing full-body biohazard suits, but first must have level 4 security clearance and must have written permission, and can only enter with specific research goals agreed upon. All staff are regularly tested for the presence of any kind of tapeworms in their system. No other animals are permitted in this facility. The boy screams as his body transforms. His bones warp and twist as feathers emerge from his pores and his skull sharpens into a long, hard beak. He's in a living nightmare. And who could have guessed it all started with an innocent attempt to play hooky? It's an ordinary Monday morning, and all over town, children are waking up and reluctantly dragging themselves out of bed for school. Some are oversleeping, hitting the snooze on their alarms, and getting a bit of extra shut-eye before their exhausted parents notice, wake them up, and rush to get them to school before the first morning bell. In one particular bedroom, a young boy is awake but still in bed, brainstorming as fast as he can. He is determined to skip school today however he can. He usually doesn't mind school very much, but today all he can think about is the math test he didn't study for and the mean classmate who likes to knock his books out of his hands. But he can't just ask to skip school for no reason. He has to come up with a plan. He runs to the bathroom, splashing hot water in his face to give him a flushed appearance and a warm forehead. Then he hops back into bed and begins to loudly cough and sniffle until his mother comes to check on him. He complains that he doesn't feel well enough to go to school, and sure enough, when his mother feels his forehead, it is hot to the touch. She agrees to let him stay home from school for the day, provided he stays in bed and gets plenty of rest. He promises that he will, and she leaves to go to work. On her way to work, the boy's mother remembers that there isn't much for him to eat while he's home alone all day. At least, there isn't much that he would want to eat while he's sick. She decides that she can be a little bit late to work for the sake of her son's health and pulls into a nearby grocery store. She rushes out of her car and into the store, making a beeline for the soup aisle. She reaches for her usual go-to brand of chicken noodle soup, but finds the shelf completely bare. That's right, it's flu season. Of course, the soup is sold out. Oh great, this is exactly what she needs. A sick kid at home, one can of chicken noodle soup left at the store, and the machine won't even scan it. She smacks the side of the machine in frustration, and the screen reads, invalid code, transaction cancelled. With a heavy sigh, she glances over her shoulder. No one is watching. She tried to pay for the can to do the right thing, but the machine wouldn't let her. So she grabs the can and runs out of the store before anyone can spot her. While his mother is out, the boy is at home raiding the pantry for snacks to sate his not at all sick appetite. He fills up on Oreos and toaster pastries, cheesy crackers and chips. When he hears his mother's car pulling into the driveway, he quickly wipes the crumbs from his face and jumps back into bed, just in time for his mother to find him there, resting like he promised he would. She gives him a kiss on the forehead and tells him that she'll heat up some chicken noodle soup for him to eat. She's in a hurry to make it to work though, so she'll need to leave it in the microwave for him. She pours the contents of the soup into a bowl, adds a bit of water, and pops the bowl into the microwave for a few minutes. She calls up to her son, letting him know that the soup will be ready when the microwave dings. Then she rushes out the door and heads to work for the day, confident that her son will be fine through her shift. If he happens to need anything, he can call her and let her know. The boy hears the microwave ding, but his stomach is too full from his rummage through the pantry for him to want any of the soup, in spite of its heavenly aroma. Instead, he creeps into the living room and sits down to play video games until his eyes start to hurt. As he boots up his gaming system, he thinks for a moment that he can hear a strange noise coming from the kitchen. A soft, clucking sound, like the chickens he saw on his grandparents' farm. But he quickly forgets about the sound as the screen lights up, and he disappears into the world of his favorite game. He plays for hours, until the grumbling of his stomach interrupts his concentration. He's suddenly very hungry, and remembers the soup his mother left in the microwave. It is certainly cold and unappealing by now, but he can just reheat it first. He punches the buttons on the microwave and waits for the soup to be ready. Again, he can hear strange noises coming from the microwave, but he doesn't think anything of it. 
The microwave dings, and he pulls out the bowl of soup, grabs a spoon, and digs in. A little while later, the boy's mother pulls into the driveway in a panic. She left work early when her phone rang with a call from her son. She answered, asking what was wrong, but he wouldn't answer her. All she could hear on the other end was rustling, heavy breathing, and some pain grunting. Fearing the worst, she drove back as fast as she could, running several red lights along the way. Now she fumbles with her keys as she unlocks the door, terrified of what she will find. She grips her phone in her other hand, thumb hovering over the buttons, ready to dial 911 if the situation calls for it. She pushes the front door open, calling her son's name. He doesn't answer, and her stomach drops. Suddenly, she hears the loud thud of something heavy being knocked to the ground. Something is terribly wrong here, and even though she might find her worst nightmare, she has to face whatever is waiting for her inside. She runs into the kitchen and finds it a mess. The bowl of soup is shattered on the floor, congealed, cold soup pooling on the tile. The kitchen table is turned over on its side. The kitchen chairs are in disarray. But the strangest sight is the dozens of tiny, white, fluffy things on the floor, counters, and furniture. She picks one up for a closer look and finds herself even more confused than before. It's a feather. They're all feathers. She calls her son's name again, praying for a response. This time, she receives one, though not the one she hopes for. She hears the sound of shuffling footsteps up above, followed by a strangled sound like a scream caught in someone's throat. She sprints up the stairs as fast as her legs can carry her, throwing open the door to her son's bedroom. There, she finds him. But this is not the bright-eyed boy that she left behind when she left for work. His arms are covered with a thick layer of white feathers, the same feathers that are beginning to poke through the skin of his face. The top of his head has elongated into a floppy comb of excess skin, the same sort of excess skin that is wobbling below his chin. And his mouth, it doesn't look like a mouth anymore. It's pointed and hard, and his lips click together when he speaks, or rather, clucks. His bare feet are scaly and red, with claws protruding from his toes. He flaps his wings frantically, eyes wide and wild, clucking and running back and forth across the room. When he looks at her, she does not see recognition in his gaze. Her son, her beloved boy, has turned into a chicken. Unable to do anything else, the mother calls an ambulance. At first, the paramedics that arrive on the scene think the call was some sort of elaborate prank, but when they set eyes on the boy, they agree that something truly bizarre is going on. They speed to the hospital with the chicken boy in tow, but sadly are unable to save his life. The mother turns over the can of the mysterious soup to the authorities, who launch a formal investigation. Unfortunately, they are unable to trace the can to any store, nor are they able to verify the existence of the company name on its label. Employees of the grocery store where she found the can insist that they have never seen it in their lives. Several weeks after this incident occurred, the SCP Foundation conducted a raid on a New York office of Marshall, Carter, and Dark. For those of you unfamiliar with the organization, and that is most of the general population by design, Marshall, Carter, and Dark LTD is an extremely powerful multinational corporation founded by three individuals with those surnames, specializing in the acquisition and sale of anomalous items, entities, and experiences. To put it simply, they run the largest anomalous black market in the world and are the crime bosses of the paranormal world. During this particular raid, SCP Foundation operatives recovered 17 different unusual items. Among the items discovered was a shipping crate recently delivered by the Federal Postal Service from an invalid return address. This crate contained 103 cans of SCP-2057, as well as a copy of a letter written to one of the company's associates. So far, the letter has not been traced to an address. It reads, Dear Cyrus, Maria has told me of the unfortunate circumstances that have befallen your children. I had hoped to hear about the improvement of their condition soon. As their godfather, I am extremely distressed to hear this. Having experienced a child suffering from the measles myself, I know how terrifying it can be when it seems as if they are getting worse. Recently, we received a shipment of something that I hope can help your family. There is a crate in the storage area marked with Wondertainment Discontinued Item. It will not be there long, as it goes to auction next week. I will leave a key under the photo of your family on your desk. Follow the instructions exactly. Do not, under any circumstances, do anything different than what is directed on the can. Destroy this message as soon as possible. I do not want any of this to come back on us. Be careful, my friend. Williams
SCP-2057 consists of 92 318 milliliter cans of condensed chicken noodle soup. Each can is covered with a brightly colored label depicting images of noodles, a cartoon chicken, and dancing vegetables. In addition to this inviting imagery, each label is emblazoned with the text, Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids. Each can has a pull-top lid for easy opening, and is printed with a set of nutrition facts, ingredients, and instructions for heating. The nutrition facts are as follows, calories, 95, fat, 3.17 grams, carbohydrates, 2.2 grams, protein, 13.48 grams, vitamin W, 2 grams, and mother's love, 10 grams. The SCP Foundation attempted to analyze the contents of the soup in order to compare it to the posted nutrition facts. The calories, fat, carbohydrates, and protein were found to be accurately reported. Vitamin W was present in the reported amount as well, though it was not a compound that the Foundation scientists had ever encountered before. Mother's love, as it is an intangible concept, was not able to be identified or measured in the analyzed soup samples. The ingredients are listed as ultralicious chicken stock, enriched Chinese egg noodles, finest cooked chicken breast, farm fresh carrots, crispy crunchy celery, sweet Vidalia onions, no paint thinner, fresh mountain spring water, vitamin W. Contains less than 2% of the following ingredients. A pinch of salt, a smidgen of chicken fat, sprinkle of spice extracted from rare plants, a dash of high quality unicorn tears. The instructions for heating read, Hey kids, feeling sick, icky, or downright yucky? Just pop open a can of Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids. Place contents of the can in a medium-sized soup pot. Add a can of water, stir, and heat. Watch as the fun begins. Eat hearty, and you'll feel better and ready to play with Dr. Wondertainment toys in no time. All of this is relatively straightforward, give or take a few unusual ingredients. Someone taking only a quick look might mistake a can of this soup for any other chicken noodle soup. However, it does have something that most ordinary canned soup does not, a warning label. Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids is intended to be eaten while it is hot to make you feel better in no time at all. Do not consume after it has become cold. Do not reheat. By purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment, you agree to not hold Dr. Wondertainment or any of Dr. Wondertainment's affiliates accountable for injuries or damages incurred by your product. Thank you for purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment. So what exactly is in a can of Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids? Well, when the SCP Foundation first opened a can to take a look, they found that it was filled with condensed chicken broth and a mass of egg noodles shaped like an egg. When water was added and the contents of the can were heated to a temperature of 70 degrees Celsius, the noodle-based egg hatched. Inside was a small domesticated chicken made up of egg noodles, carrot, celery, onion, and cooked chicken breast. For simplicity's sake, this chicken noodle soup chicken is referred to as SCP-2057-1. As the Foundation researchers continued to heat the broth to a higher temperature, SCP-2057-1 began to move around, make audible chirping sounds, and eat the broth. As it ate, it grew larger and larger until it reached a mass of 85 grams and resembled a miniature adult chicken. At a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, SCP-2057-1 behaved much like an ordinary chicken. It continued to behave normally even as it was consumed or cut apart, apparently feeling no pain or awareness of its situation. Dissection of SCP-2057-1 revealed that its insides were made up of soup ingredients, including celery and onion bones, cooked chicken breast muscles, carrot beak and legs, and chicken broth blood. When SCP-2057-1's temperature dropped below 35 degrees Celsius, it stopped moving and collapsed into the soup. At a temperature below 20 degrees Celsius, it became congealed and unappetizing. With these observations completed, the Foundation then attempted to measure the effects of this unusual chicken soup on a person that ingested it. When test subjects were fed samples of the soup at a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, they had a very positive experience. The soup's taste was described as excellent, delicious, and homey. Though the meal caused a bit of psychological distress due to the soup chicken's realistic appearance and behavior, it improved every test subject's physical well-being. This eventually applied to test subjects with a case of influenza, measles, or the common cold. Following consumption of SCP-2057, each subject with a diagnosed illness of this kind 
reported immediate relief from their symptoms, including fever, aches and pains, cough, and congestion. With this positive, if a bit disturbing, effect documented, the Foundation next set out to determine what would happen if they let the soup get cold before it was eaten. Test subjects served this version of the soup had a far worse experience, describing the taste of their meal as bland, disgusting, and repulsive. 67% of the test subjects experienced cramps, chills, and diarrhea following their consumption of the soup, and 62% found themselves making involuntary clucking noises, as well as experiencing a strong aversion to poultry products. Again, several test subjects were deliberately selected based on their cases of influenza, measles, and the common cold. These test subjects immediately began to develop troubling symptoms, including the growth of pin feathers on their forearms, loosened excess skin on their heads and under their chins, a change in their ability to walk normally, and distressing hallucinations of being hung upside down by the ankles. Following these two rounds of testing, the research team decided to see why exactly the warning label advised against reheating the soup. D-Class 45782 was selected as the test subject for this particular experiment and was instructed to reheat a bowl of cooled SCP-2057-1 in a microwave on high for 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Then, he was to consume the reheated soup and report his experience to a camera placed in the room with him. As instructed, D-45782 microwaved the bowl of soup. As it heated in the microwave, it emitted unintelligible vocalizations in a deep voice. After removing the bowl from the microwave, D-45782 noted that it was gelatinous-looking, with blackened burnt bits around the edges. He took three bites of the disgusting, hot and cold at the same time mixture before spitting it out onto the floor and refusing to eat another bite. Fifteen minutes after tasting the reheated soup, D-45872 began to exhibit significant distress, plucking angrily into the camera. Five minutes later, D-45872 became more difficult to understand clucks and other chicken-like vocalizations, making up most of his attempted speech. He began scratching vigorously at his arms to the point of drawing blood. Loose skin could be seen gathering on the top of his head and under his neck. Six minutes later, D-45872 had lost the ability to speak. Large white pin feathers had sprouted from his arms, covering the skin, and smaller white feathers were beginning to sprout from his face. After 16 more minutes passed, D-45872 began attacking other objects in the room, attempting to destroy the microwave, knocking the bowl of soup to the floor, and flipping over a table and chair. He had grown feathers over 67% of his skin, and his face had begun to change drastically. His nasal area was elongated and hardened, joining with his lower jaw in an appendage resembling a bird's beak. His upper lip had disappeared into his nasal cavity. Only five minutes later, D-45872 suddenly stopped moving and collapsed to the floor, dead. Following D-45872's death, an autopsy was performed. These were the findings. Autopsy revealed D-45782's cause of death was due to extreme and sudden physical change of internal organs, resulting in shock and cardiac arrest. 93% of the subject's skin was covered in feathers. Physical changes in the face resulted in a beak-like alteration of the nose and mouth, Loose skin under the neck and on the top of the head resemble a waddle and comb. Subjects' lower legs were found to be covered in thick, scaly skin, with the toes of the subject's feet ending in small, rounded claws. The subject and instance of SCP-2057-1 were incinerated after testing and autopsy. Whenever not being used for approved experimentation, all cans of SCP-2057 must be stored in a standard, large-volume storage locker in Containment Area 27 and kept at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Because SCP-2057 is in limited supply, all experiments must first be approved by at least two personnel with 2-1103 clearance, as well as receiving the go-ahead from Dr. Applegate. There are still 41 cans of Dr. Wondertainment's chicken soup unaccounted for, and the Foundation has been unable to track them down so far. Who knows where they ended up? Maybe at another office of Marshall Carter and Dark. Or maybe, just maybe, one made its way onto the shelves at your local grocery store. Best to be careful out there. When you're feeling sick, hungry, or in need of a little pick-me-up, there's nothing quite like a steaming hot bowl of chicken noodle soup. Just make sure to read the label carefully and always follow the printed instructions. If you ignore them, you might just find that your chickens have come home to roost. After all, as the saying goes, you are what you eat. The homeless man in the alley looks down at his arm, wide-eyed in horror. Is his skin 
moving. It almost seems to bubble, like water coming to a boil. He is experiencing a kind of pain he can't even imagine. He can feel something moving up against his bones, chewing through the calcium. He can't move. They're everywhere inside him, just eating. He opens his mouth to scream, but they've already chewed too many holes through his lungs for him to make a sound. Within the hour, he will be dead. But what's killing him? The store owner pulls a gleaming, serrated edge knife from the knife block, and with deft, practiced hands, he slices a delicious ciabatta roll in two. From there, he butters the bread, slices a juicy pair of New York steaks into thick, medium-rare chunks, adds in some diced vegetables and lettuce leaves, sprinkles on just a pinch of lime zest, and hey presto, he's got a delectable Caribbean-style pork sandwich. It's a thing of beauty, but he can't help but feel it's missing something. Oh, that's it. The thought hits him like a lightning bolt. This sandwich would be delicious, but it'd also be far too dry. How could he have made such a rookie mistake? He saunters across the kitchen and reaches into one of the many luxuriously appointed cabinets, feeling around for one of the many jars of mayonnaise he's got stowed away in there. He twists off the cap with a pleasing pop and spreads a little mayo onto the sandwich. It looks positively delicious, and he wastes no time in placing it pride of place in the display case. Everything is moving along perfectly. Boston is a foodie town. That's what the store owner tells himself as he flips around the sign on the door from closed to open for the very first time. After years working as a chef in other people's restaurants, the store owner has racked up the experience to strike out on his own and achieve his dream, a boutique sandwich store on the Boston waterfront, where tourists from hither and yarn would be able to enjoy artisanal sandwiches while browsing the city's many historic locales. His employees are busying themselves around the store. They're all people he personally interviewed and selected. They all aligned with his mission and had a passion for sandwiches. One wipes down the tables in prep for the inevitable rush of customers when it turns lunchtime. Another is artfully posing a selection of pre-made sandwiches behind a sheet of glass at the counter. Leg ham and strong cheese, BLT, tuna mayo, and, of course, lobster. We can't forget that this is Boston, after all. But as the hours creep on, something horrible happens. Nobody shows up. The store owner doesn't know what he's done wrong. He managed to pay for an ad about the grand opening in one of the local papers and released some coupons in a local food magazine, too. He even put a grand opening sign and garland in the window, showing off the grand opening discount. For every sandwich a customer buys, they'll get another half off. But it seems that none of this conventional business wisdom actually shook out. His optimism wanes as the course of the day passes, and though they're all keeping up brave faces, he can see the doubt in the eyes of his employees, too. All of their minds are bubbling with the same terrifying thought, too awful to ever be spoken aloud. This whole thing has been a complete bust. When closing time comes, the store owner gathers his employees together to give him a pep talk, hoping to assuage all their fears about potentially losing their new jobs the same week they got them. He gives an inspiring speech about the importance of perseverance and grit and sticking to their dreams, despite the fact that there may be discouraging setbacks along the way. As he listens to himself talking, it occurs to him that these are the words he needs to hear as much as they are the words he needs to say. But after they've all gone home, he's left alone, looking at the uneaten sandwiches in the display case. The anxiety of the day has killed any hope of his appetite, and then it dawns on him. Those sandwiches are going to be stale by tomorrow. All his hard work, all his passion, and he's going to need to throw them out. He takes the Caribbean pork sandwich first and morosely exit out of the back door. He sees the dumpster around the back of the building, but he also sees something else. A homeless man, looking cold and hungry, wrapped in dirty sheets deep in the alley. And in that moment, he has an idea. Perhaps he can still serve a hungry person today. The store owner offers his precious sandwich to the homeless man, who gratefully accepts. Deciding it would be a terrible waste to just throw food away while there was a man going hungry behind his building, he gives all the sandwiches from the display case to the homeless man, who acts like it's the first time someone has been kind to him in many, many years. He eats every single sandwich and tells the store owner that it's one of the tastiest meals he's ever had. Clearly, when it comes to making sandwiches, the store owner has a gift. In one moment, he's reminded of why he does this, making people happy with food. He has no idea that, in a sense, he's just murdered the man who rekindled his passion. The next day, things change for the better, 
With renewed passion and vigor for the art of making and selling delicious sandwiches to tourists and the Boston public, he puts his all into the sandwich business, and Lady Luck responds. A few customers each day at first, and then the place becomes a local curiosity, the subject of online write-ups and must-visit-in-Boston lists. There are familiar faces that he sees every single day, and it's only a matter of weeks until he needs to start implementing a waiting list for customers. Business is booming, and despite his sudden and miraculous success, the store owner never forgets what sparked his second wind. He owes it all to the homeless man out behind the store, who reminded him of his true purpose. One day, he decides he needs to repay his old friend. He whips up a delicious tuna mayo sub and steps outside to give it to the homeless man. But the man is gone. It's strange. He's left some crumpled clothes behind and the piece of cardboard he'd always sleep on. But the man is gone. The store owner steps forward, concerned for the man's safety. It had been a particularly cold and unforgiving winter after all. But he sees something instead that utterly disgusts him. In amongst the scattered clothes, there's a worm-like creature, glistening white and about a foot long. It lays there in the pile of clothes, mercifully dead. But the mere sight of it so revolts the store owner that he drops the tuna mayo sub onto the ground, splattering it across the asphalt. It's a terrible waste of food, but after seeing that disgusting worm thing, he doesn't have any kind of appetite for the rest of the day. If that's as terrible as this whole thing got, it would have been bad enough. But the floodgates of terror are about to open, and when it does, only a certain organization has the tools to close it. The store owner starts noticing strange things at work after that. Something about the regulars, some of them seem kind of strange and doughy. They've got pallid skin and a vacant look behind their eyes. Some of them who've ordered the same sandwich day after day, who've memorized the menus by heart, are taking full minutes to decide what they want to order, as though the workings of their very minds have been gummed up. As disturbing as these strange little signs are, they're nothing compared to the nightmarish things a number of Boston EMTs and emergency room doctors were encountering around that same time. People collapsing in their homes in a state of extreme pain, their panicked friends and spouses calling in, crying and unable to explain what's happening to their formerly healthy loved ones. This, of course, would be disturbing enough, but what happens to these people after being taken in takes it to a whole other level. In every single case, the technicians see something moving under their skin. They take x-rays, ultrasounds, or in some cases, even make incisions, and the result is always the same. The bodies of the people experiencing these symptoms are full of thousands upon thousands of white worms eating their innards from within, slowly killing them in perhaps the most painful way imaginable. Even seasoned doctors are passing out from sheer horror when they see the masses of impossible white parasites wriggling within their patients. The one piece of vital information they don't have is that all these victims had recently eaten at a certain up-and-coming sandwich store on the Boston Harbor. After 10 weeks of business, things are starting to cool down again for the sandwich store. The owner thinks that's to be expected. That opening FOMO hype can't go on forever. But the mysterious absence of some of his most loyal repeat customers is undeniably a little disturbing to him. Is it something he did wrong? Did he somehow alienate them? These thoughts are plaguing his mind when he's alone in the store one evening, cleaning up after everyone else has gone home. His thoughts are so occupied that as he's preparing to screw the top back onto a jar of mayonnaise, he accidentally drops it. The jar stays intact, but a large, disgusting blob of mayo splatters out onto the floor. Ah, great, now he has to clean that up. He picks up the jar and takes it into the back alley, where he intends to throw it into the dumpster. With half of it spilled out onto the ground, it's too much of a hygiene risk for him to keep it in the restaurant anymore. But before he can throw it into the trash, his arm freezes in a moment of inexplicable hesitation. In that strange moment, it occurs to him that it's the only one in the cabinet of that particular brand. He's used it on so many sandwiches before, and yet he's never needed to buy a new jar of it either. On a pure whim, he decides to inspect it closer. The label on the back of the jar reads, Water, vegetable oil, vinegar, eggs, 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 eat eggs, be eggs. Your flesh is but the nursery and sustenance of our incalculable ravenous mouths. Eat eggs, consume us, let us be realized within you. Sugar, salt, lemon juice, and love. Oh, he thinks to himself, that isn't good. 
Without a second's delay, he runs back into the sandwich store, wondering with horror just what exactly he'd been feeding his customers all this time. But these thoughts are interrupted when he sees that the mess of mayonnaise is somehow gone from the floor. He didn't clean it up, did he? Something is terribly wrong here. That's the only thing he knows for certain. He may not even be safe in here. He lunges out and grabs a frying pan, the one he uses to sizzle up the steak for the store's famous Boston-style cheesesteak sandwiches, and assumes a defensive position. His instincts might just save his life here, as something watches him from the shadows. Without warning, something comes squealing towards him, about the size of a rat, with shiny, smooth, white skin propelling itself along the ground on a collection of horrid little tendrils. It makes a horrific shrieking sound and lunges for him. Almost instinctually, he whacks it with his frying pan, sending it flying across the kitchen, where it lands against the wall with a splat. Did… did he just get attacked by a living blob of mayonnaise? Before he can even contemplate all the implications of that, he sees the splat slithering down the wall and gathering in a puddle on the floor. This puddle then twists and warps, taking the exact same horrible shape it had before. Tendrils sliding out of its shimmering skin. It must have formed out of the contents of almost the entire mysterious jar. And it dawns on him all at once, in every single sandwich his shop had served which contained mayonnaise, he's been putting these little monsters into people's bodies. And as the beast shakes off the shock and prepares to charge again, he's starting to worry that he might be in for the same fate. Only in Boston, right? Whether you love or despise mayonnaise, it's likely that SCP-2484, aptly titled The Parasitic Mayonnaise Worms, made you feel a little queasy. But if you're anything like the Foundation field agents who first discovered this caustic condiment, you likely have some pressing questions about what exactly you just witnessed. Thanks to my research into a number of classified files, I'm able to give you the answers, but I'm afraid I can't tell you that it won't get any less repulsive. To the untrained eye, SCP-2484 is a mayonnaise jar of indeterminate brand containing approximately 1,024 grams of a substance that, to all chemical tests, seems to be identical to regular mayonnaise. This substance, for the sake of avoiding confusion, will be referred to as SCP-2484-A. While inside the jar, SCP-2484-A poses no threat to anyone. But the second the anomalous mayonnaise leaves the jar or is consumed by a vertebrate animal, the disturbing effects you've already witnessed take hold. The jar contains an infinite quantity of this mayonnaise too. When the contents of SCP-2484 are removed, it will begin to refill by 2 milliliters every hour. Luckily for the Foundation's biohazard control units, SCP-2484-A can be destroyed in any manner that non-anomalous mayonnaise can be destroyed. Personally, I've never contemplated ways of destroying mayonnaise, so I'll leave the devising of these methods to greater minds than my own. Any quantity of SCP-2484-A less than 5 grams doesn't seem to display any anomalous properties, so if you're content with a tiny quantity of mayo on your food, you may encounter this anomaly and live to tell the tale. But masses between 5 grams and 63 grams are another story. These masses will develop a repulsive, congealed membrane, a kind of smooth, glossy skin over their body, as well as crude, tentacle-like pseudopods. These creatures will slither and crawl around without any real direction. These won't pose any threat to other organisms, so long as they don't touch or ingest them. If only the same could be said for the larger ones. Slightly larger creatures formed out of SCP-2484-A, specifically ones weighing between 63 grams and 235 grams, will move with more direction and purpose. They will seek out solid foods and potable liquids, diffusing themselves into them and infecting them with their secondary anomalous quality, which we'll discuss shortly. Needless to say, one should avoid consuming food infected in this manner at all costs. Masses of SCP-2484-A ranging from 235 grams to 804 grams take a more direct and aggressive route to infecting their hosts. They will use their pseudopods to actively seek out vertebrate animals and try to enter their body through any means necessary from all major bodily orifices and even more novel methods of intrusion, such as pores and open wounds. But this is nothing compared to the danger presented by masses of SCP-2484-A ranging from 804 grams to 1,024 grams. These creatures are highly violent and aggressive, stopping at nothing to attack and enter vertebrate animals, going as far as forcing themselves through the victim's skin. 
It goes without saying that these are the most dangerous types to encounter of any of them, and you may need to brush up on your methods of destroying mayonnaise that we mentioned earlier in order to survive. But let's say, for the sake of argument, that your greatest anti-mayonnaise contingency plans have failed. The anomalous SCP-2484-A mayonnaise has entered your body in a dangerous quantity, which is to say, 3 grams per every kilogram of body weight. If this describes your experience, then you're about to undergo the secondary effects of this anomaly, which I'm sorry to tell you are even more unpleasant than the primary effects. At first, the effects will appear to be relatively benign, including higher blood sugar levels, increased heart rate, slower cognition, and higher body heat. Not dissimilar to the effects of consuming a large quantity of non-anomalous mayonnaise. Within the body, however, things will be taking a considerably more drastic turn. The SCP-2484-A in the victim's body will begin to turn into small, gamete-like cells through some kind of anomalous force of metabolization. Then things will accelerate considerably. Within three to six hours, the cells will develop into tiny nematodes around a millimeter in length that begin swimming through the body. A single gram of SCP-2484-A can become around 500 of these parasitic nematodes. If that's already making your skin itch, it's going to get an awful lot worse from there. Between 5 and 40 hours after SCP-2484-A infects its hosts, whether through consumption or forceful entry, the parasitic nematodes will begin eating the host's tissues, giving them the mass to grow up to 12 centimeters long, at which point the host is likely to experience horrific pain as they're eaten from within. When the host has been entirely devoured, the parasitic mayonnaise worms will turn on each other and start eating. After all this, only one worm will be left, measuring from 20 to 30 centimeters in length. It will then enter a dormant state and die within four days. As obligate parasites, the creatures spawned by SCP-2484-A are not designed to survive outside the host body after they've developed. Any worms removed from the victim's body will die within five hours, but no attempts thus far to save anyone infected with SCP-2484-A have been successful. Infection is, sadly, invariably lethal. Our opening tale was also the first recorded case study of SCP-2484 encountered by Foundation field agents. The source was an independent sandwich store in Boston, Massachusetts, triangulated after a series of reports of strange parasite behavior over a 10-week period. The SCP-2484 jar had been in the store's refrigerator with a number of non-anomalous mayonnaise jars, though the store's owner, when questioned by Foundation operatives, could not remember ever having bought this particular jar of mayo. How it made its way into the store is, to this day, a mystery. Once the Foundation had contained the threat, all surviving sandwich store employees were given amnestics, along with a number of medical personnel who'd also encountered the parasites. All the hosts were, of course, lost. SCP-2484 is currently classified as safe. It is kept in a standard refrigerated perishables unit, essentially a kind of high-security fridge. No more than 400 grams of the anomalous mayonnaise is allowed to be removed for experimentation at any time, and no destructive tests are authorized at this time. Any personnel hoping to access SCP-2484 need to have Level 3 access clearance or above. Condiments can be a loaded issue. I've personally witnessed arguments on the merits of ketchup, mustard, and mayonnaise that have reached greater intensity than some Keter-class containment breaches, but I'd advise you to exercise caution. Next time you make yourself a delicious BLT and you're preparing to spread some mayo across the bread, or you're wondering which flavor will perfectly accompany your next hot dog, take a second to think. You may not know what you're really putting into your body. A bear mauling you to death, being stalked by cougars in the dead of night, only to be eaten in your sleep. Wandering off the path and getting lost for days, the elements slowly withering you away to nothingness. There are plenty of ways you can die in the wilderness, but few would expect death to come as a result of a simple bodily function with a decidedly anomalous twist. Springtime in the Sierra Nevada is undeniably beautiful. The unpredictable storms of winter are a thing of the past, but the oppressive heat of summer hasn't yet crept in. The highest peaks of the mountains are still spotted with snow, but in the foothills, the wildflowers sprout from the earth, blooming in a tapestry of yellow, pink, purple, and orange. Crystal clear waterfalls roar down the rocky mountainsides, water set free from its slumber by the melting ice as the world wakes up from a long hibernation. The summer vacation crowds haven't yet flooded the hiking trails and ski slopes, 
but a few groups of early adventurers can be spotted hiking through the mountains, taking in the sights, and breathing in the fresh, fragrant air. Among these springtime visitors are a pair of young men, one with blonde hair and one with dark hair, each wearing a small backpack and carrying a canteen of water, not a scuff to be seen on their brand new hiking boots. These two young men are on their senior spring break from college, gleefully taking the hiking trip they have been talking about since they were paired up as roommates their freshman year. Neither of these young men is especially experienced in hiking, but they have both spent dozens of hours in the library reading up on wilderness survival, on the best ways to pitch a tent and start a fire with nothing more than a stick and two rocks. The lighter-haired of the two especially prides himself on his knowledge of foraging for edible wild plants, a skill he is excited to put to the test on this trip. His dark-haired companion is a bit more suspicious of wild plants, frightened by the stories of foraging gone wrong and unfortunate explorers confusing a delicious mushroom for one that stops the heart in minutes. He has filled his bag with provisions, with granola and jerky, dried fruits, and cans of beans that he hopes his friend will share with him, rather than risking his safety by gambling on a wild root or berry. Still, his concerns about foraging are soon forgotten as the two proceed further along the trail, passing sparkling waterfalls, bighorn sheep grazing on wild plants, and a bird that just might be a bald eagle soaring by overhead. The two are lost in the majesty of nature, so lost, in fact, that they forget to eat until the sun is dipping over the horizon and the world is growing dark around them. Out here in the mountains, with no light pollution to speak of, dark is dark. Even with the help of the lanterns they brought, the two men can scarcely see well enough to put up their tents and build a small fire. Still, they remember all of their reading and manage to set up a modest camp for the night. The dark-haired man pulls a bag of beans from his backpack and begins to heat them over the flame. He offers some to his companion, but he refuses. The blonde man has found a shrub that he recognizes, weighed down with ripe fruit. This shrub, he explains to his friend, is a species of manzanita, an evergreen shrub that produces berries similar in flavor to little apples. The dark-haired man is dubious. Aren't manzanita berries typically red in color? These appear to be a shade of brown. Wait! The young man reaches out and stops his friend just before he can pop the berries into his mouth. At least let me look them up on my phone. That won't work out here, his friend tells him. The government blocks access to the web out here. They don't want you on the internet. It's a big conspiracy. Everyone knows about it. Page unavailable. His friend is right. But wait! He has the ultimate tool to defeat this intrusion on his lunch lookup liberties because he has Surfshark VPN. Surfshark, the sponsor of today's video. The virtual private network that keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet. With the simple press of a button, he's able to change his location to somewhere well outside the Sierra Nevadas and access the blocked content thanks to over 3,200 servers Surfshark has around the world in 100 countries that allow you to bypass censorship and geo restrictions no matter where you are. And you don't need to worry about who might be watching you since Surfshark masks your IP address to make sure that your city, country, and download history aren't linked back to your identity. It's the absolute best way to stay safe online and keep your personal information secure from whoever might want to use it for their nefarious deeds. So why not try it out for yourself? Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk. Dr. Bob viewers who use my code Dr. Bob get an extra three months free. So use the link in the description and check it out for yourself. You'll be glad you did. The wannabe forager insists that he has correctly identified the plant and that these berries will be his dinner. The dark-haired man shrugs and treats himself to a meal of beans and dried apples, while his friend munches on handfuls of the brown berries. He has no complaints about the taste and does not immediately drop dead upon eating them, so perhaps he was right, and these are manzanitas after all. As soon as the thought crosses the dark-haired man's mind, he sees his friend double over, clutching at his stomach in discomfort. Afraid for his friend's safety, he rushes to his side, only to be met with a long, loud fart. The two share a laugh, the tension broken by the sudden smelly outburst, but the humor soon fades as the blonde man farts again, and again, and again. All through the night, he continues to emit loud, excruciatingly smelly farts. The smell permeates the campsite, seeping into the dark-haired man's tent no matter how he tries to cover his nose with his sleeping bag. He doesn't get a wink of sleep, spending the night wide awake, staring at the ceiling of his tent, and silently wishing for the relentless stream of gas to stop but it doesn't. It just carries on until the dark-haired man can scarcely remember a time when he wasn't listening to the maddening sound. Again and again and again, the endless farts. 
He clenches his fists until the knuckles turn white, clenches his jaw, and grinds his teeth. It's enough to drive a man insane. The next morning, it is still happening. The blonde man expresses embarrassment, but does not apologize for ignoring his friend's warnings about the berries. He tries to laugh it off, but the dark-haired man does not join him in his laughter. If he had only listened, they wouldn't be in this situation. They wouldn't be about to continue their hike with this rancid, gaseous albatross around their necks. As they pack up camp, the dark-haired man glances down at the tent pole in his hand. One good swing, and he could put a stop to the madness. No, that's ridiculous. He shakes his head, clearing the impulse from his mind. The gastrointestinal distress will pass soon, and they will be able to continue the trip like they planned. But it doesn't pass. Nothing passes, but the gas itself. The blonde man asks if they can stop for water before they've even been hiking for an hour. He isn't feeling very well, he explains. He woke up dizzy and nauseated, disoriented from lying there all night, breathing in the fumes. The dark-haired man wants to say something, to retort that he too was suffering all night. But he doesn't. He just lets his friend stop to drink some water, and they proceed with the hike. Gone is the magic of the previous day, the time before the cursed berries. The men can no longer smell the wildflowers, the crisp mountain air. There are no wild animals to be found, not a single ground squirrel or little bird. Up ahead on the trail, the dark-haired man catches the barest glimpse of a tail vanishing into the brush as a mountain lion runs the other way. Is it fleeing from them? From the stench? He wouldn't blame the beast if it was. They have five more days of this planned, and he can feel his resolve beginning to fade. Maybe he can turn back, ask to cut the trip short now, but why should he have to suffer just because his friend made a mistake identifying a wild berry? It isn't fair. If he could just get a moment to think without the incessant farting, if he could just have one second of peace, maybe he could come up with a solution. But no respite comes. If anything, it only seems to get worse. The smell burns his nostrils, the sound rings in his ears. The blonde man tries to speak over it, to clear the air with pleasant conversation, but the dark-haired man brushes him off with grunts and shrugs. His eyes sting and water, he chokes on the stench. He knows in his heart that he can't take much more of this. When the men make camp for the night again, the dark-haired man's thoughts turn dark. He could just leave in the dead of night while his friend is sleeping, rush off into the wilderness and abandon his companion there, freeing himself from the farts. He tries to justify it to himself. They both have the survival skills to make it. He'll be fine. His thoughts of leaving his friend alone in the woods are interrupted by the sound of chewing. Is there any animal nearby? No, surely no animal would approach given the smell. He takes a look in the blonde man's tent and finds his friend eating another handful of those same brown berries. The dark-haired man flies into a rage, unable to contain his fury. How could he do this? How could he eat more of them after what happened the first time? Doesn't he understand what this is doing to him, what it's doing to the both of them? How could he be so selfish? The blonde man insists that it's fine, that the farting can't possibly be related to the berries, because manzanitas don't cause that sort of thing. At this, something in the dark-haired man snaps. He can't take it anymore. He turns away from the tent, throwing up his hands and telling the blonde man to find his own way back. They'll split up from here. The blonde man emerges from his tent, begging his friend not to cast him out. He's certain the farting will stop any day now. At this, it seems to grow louder and more potent. The dark-haired man spots a large rock by the campfire, small enough to hold in his hand, hefty enough to do some real damage. He picks it up and turns to meet his friend. Without thinking, he swings the rock at the blonde man's head. For the first time in days, the sound of farts goes silent. The air smells sweet, like flowers, leaves, and campfire smoke. He did what he had to do. The dark-haired man lets out a sigh of relief, the rock falling from his hand. He glances at the rock on the ground, at the blood dripping down its surface, and realizes the full weight of what he has just done. He packs up the campsite as quickly as he can, douses the fire, and dumps the body over the edge of a nearby cliff. Over the next few days, he hikes back the way he and his friend came, noticing in spite of his gnawing guilt that the walk really is so much better without those damned farts. On the way, he passes that bush, that horrible bush, weighed down by the fruit that destroyed his spring break trip, that destroyed his friend's life. He opens his backpack, tearing a page from one of his books and grabbing a pen. He scribbles a warning, no matter what, do not eat these berries, and affixes it to the bush. He can only hope that the next person to stumble on this shrub will see the note and heed its warning. If they don't, they might meet a similar fate. Days later, the park rangers discover the blonde man's body and declare the death an accident 
caused when the man fell over the side of the cliff. Some of them suspect foul play, but are unable to find any evidence. All they can find is a strange note on an unidentified shrub and the faintest smell of something foul, like rotten eggs. The two doomed hikers had no way of knowing this, but the fruit they foraged was not from the Manzanita family. It was from a plant known as SCP-4032. SCP-4032 is a wide, deciduous shrub characterized by a rounded crown and wider base. It produces a distinct, small, round brown fruit that has been designated SCP-4032-1. Whenever any animal or human consumes an instance of SCP-4032-1, this meal will result in intense gastrointestinal distress. I will try to describe this as delicately as I possibly can, but as I have learned over the years in my line of work, the truth is rarely delicate or polite. One hour following the consumption of an SCP-4032-1 instance, the person or animal will begin to emit an excessive amount of flatulence, consisting of elevated hydrogen sulfide levels and a small but detectable amount of methane gas. Perhaps you are familiar with an old rhyming song about the wonders of beans, the magical fruit. These berries function quite similarly. The more one eats, the more one does, in fact, for want of a better word, toot. However, unlike the second part of the bean-based rhyme, these fruits do not cause their unfortunate consumers to feel better, nor should they be eaten at every or any meal. The Foundation first discovered SCP-4032 on April 2, 2018, after a man named Anthony Green happened upon the plant in the foothills of Northern California. Hungry enough to forget his better judgment, Anthony ate some of the fruit and became immediately concerned for his physical well-being, as SCP-4032's effects began to take hold. Fearing he had unknowingly consumed a poisonous plant, he made a distress call to the local search and rescue team. This call was intercepted by Foundation operatives, who swiftly arrived at the scene to bring both Anthony and the plant itself into custody. The affected individual will continue to produce this flatulence until they have expired. Both starvation and dehydration have no impact on the flatulence, and no identifiable source of the gaseous output has been detected via endoscopy. If an affected individual finds themselves in an area without adequate ventilation, they will gradually begin to experience symptoms brought on by hydrogen sulfide poisoning, including but not limited to conjunctivitis, respiratory irritation and coughing, loss of smell, and eventually pulmonary edema and death. Shortly following SCP-4032's discovery, Dr. Logari began conducting a thorough observation of Anthony Green, referred to as D-14478 for the purposes of official documentation, as he suffered from the effects of consuming SCP-4032-1. First, he was brought in for observation and placed in cell 14B on the outside of Site 88. Dr. Logari noted copious amounts of flatulence being emitted by the subject with high levels of hydrogen sulfide and methane. Five hours later, the subject was complaining about gas buildup in his cell and the interior venting hood was activated. Three hours and over 50 complaints later, the maintenance staff deactivated the interior venting hood and opened exterior windows. In an attempt to quell some of the relentless flatulence, D-14478 was placed on an intravenous diet. After two days on the intravenous diet and no changes to the subject's gas emissions, medical staff conducted an endoscopy, which revealed that the colon was clear and there were no visible signs of rectal gas. The following day, a staff meeting was held in order to discuss the impact of D-14478's condition on the quality of life at the facility. Both residents and researchers alike had complained about the persistent smell, which they were unable to escape, and was permeating the air outside as well as throughout the interior of the building. Several options were proposed, including relocation, treatment, and failing all else, termination of the subject. A resolution was passed to house D-14478 in an outdoor facility until proper filtering equipment could be installed. A little over a week later, Foundation agents intercepted reports from nearby environmental watch groups concerning an increase in airborne pollution in the central Alabama area around Site-88. With D-14478's condition threatening not only the morale at Site-88, but the environment itself, an additional resolution was passed in order to transfer D-14478 into an experimental air filtering cell. The cell had not yet passed a safety inspection, but those with objections were overruled by the vote of the majority. The following day, subject D-14478 was found dead in his cell. An investigation into the cause of death determined that the primary filter was improperly constructed, and both it and its associated sensor had malfunctioned. There was one silver lining to this unfortunate incident, however. 
the effects of SCP-4032-1 mercifully ceased following the subject's death. The post-mortem report was filed with the Ethics Committee, and Dr. Logari was placed on temporary administrative leave. Meanwhile, a large order of scented candles was placed by the staff of Site-88, and soon, the unpleasant odor was replaced with the smells of lavender, vanilla, sugar, and pine. In Dr. Logari's absence, Dr. Carlyle was appointed to the position of lead researcher on SCP-4032. Following the approval of the Ethics Committee, Dr. Carlyle began conducting a series of animal tests using SCP-4032. The first test subject selected was the Araucanian herring. An instance of SCP-4032-1 was crushed and added to a mix of coat pods and krill, which were then fed to a small school of herring. Fifteen minutes after the consumption of SCP-4032-1, the herring's usual flattus production increased dramatically. This caused great distress to the school of fish, as this species ordinarily uses flatulence as a means of communication. Samples of the flatus were taken and analyzed, and were found to contain hydrogen sulfide and methane, though the levels of both were lower than they had been in human subjects. Three hours after their initial feeding, the herring were euthanized and taken for autopsy and chemical analysis. There was no post-mortem evidence found of SCP-4032-1's effects. Next, a flock of chickens was selected for testing. They were offered a handful of SCP-4032-1 directly, which they refused to taste. The fruit was then crushed and added to chicken feed, which was fed to the chickens with great success. Two hours after eating SCP-4032-1, all of the chickens began to emit gas containing low levels of methane and hydrogen sulfide. The chickens were promptly euthanized and taken for analysis, where an autopsy determined that the bird's short intestinal tracts were distended. This marked the first recorded visible sign of the fruit's impact on a test subject. The next animal selected for testing were brown-throated three-toed sloths. This particular species was chosen due to its lack of flatulence, as these sloths tend to absorb flatus and release it through their lungs rather than rectally. The fruit was offered directly at first, but the sloths rejected it. The fruit was then crushed and ground with a mixture of tree leaves and fed to the sloths. Whatever happened next has been redacted from the official Foundation file, but it was disturbing enough to bring a grinding halt to any and all future testing of SCP-4032 on large mammals. Any potential animal experiments involving SCP-4032 must be approved by the Ethics Committee in order to prevent another, quote, sloth incident. SCP-4032 has been contained in a cordoned off portion of the research gardens at Site-67, which consists of the area around SCP-4032's original location. This land was purchased by the Foundation, and a research facility disguised as a personal estate was constructed there. SCP-4032, along with several other anomalous plants, is kept in the garden portion of the site. All instances of SCP-4032-1 are to be gathered from the ground on a daily basis and incinerated on site. Any employees found to be using the berries for unapproved personal purposes will be suspended or terminated from their positions. If any animals wander onto the grounds and consume the berries, they must be captured and euthanized, and their bodies incinerated. Though there is currently only one known specimen of SCP-4032, the Foundation has a contingency plan in place should any additional specimens be discovered. If this happens, Mobile Task Force Alpha-67 Weed Whackers will be dispatched to the specimen's location, where they will uproot it and bring it back to Site-67 to be contained. Any humans that consume an instance of SCP-4032-1 must be contained in holding cells B1 through B5 along the outer perimeter of Site-67. Each of these cells is equipped with three air filters containing Thiobacillus thioparis, chemolithoatrophic sulfur-oxidizing bacteria embedded in a mixture of peat and polyurethane. Each filter also contains sensors intended to detect hydrogen sulfide and methane. When the sensors are activated, members of Mobile Task Force Alpha-13, Odor Eaters, are dispatched to escort the affected individual outside until the filters in their cell can be repaired. Currently, the Foundation does not believe there to be any additional specimens of SCP-4032 in the wild. However, there is no way to be certain of this, due to the plant's relatively unassuming appearance and the lack of any information on its origins. It is entirely possible that there are more of these shrubs just waiting to be discovered by an unfortunate hiker wandering off the beaten path. So if you find yourself out in nature with an empty stomach, make sure that you have accurately identified any of the wild plants you consume. If you don't, you may be met with a fate that is silent but deadly. The trucker tumbles to the greasy floor of the diner, thrown out of his booth. 
only to come crashing down before he can regain his footing. He'd be climbing back to his feet, ready to square up to the patron who has just hurled him, but staring up at them has made him freeze on the spot. As he lies on the diner floor, the trucker's eyes lock on to the bizarre horror towering over him. It looks like a huge fleshy mess, more akin to a chewed up wad of gum than a living being. It's nearly impossible to differentiate what parts of its head are facial features. Is the mouth right there in the center, or is it one of the various other strange and inexplicable orifices? Does it even have a mouth? And where are its eyes? Does it have the standard human too, or does it see by smelling sounds or tasting the air? And are those tusks? They are. The trucker has only stopped off for a hot cup of coffee and a bite to eat. Now he's facing off against a puzzling creature ripped straight out of a David Cronenberg movie. But then again, that's what he gets for stopping off at Freddy's Diner. It all begins a few moments prior. The trucker is at the wheel, exhausted but making good time on a long haul across the interstate. Thanks to life on the road, he's been lucky enough to see much more of the country than most, driving from the west coast to the east coast and back again plenty of times. And being so familiar with his roots, the trucker has his very own curated list of the best places to eat while on the road. He double checks the time and realizes he's got plenty to spare, so decides to make a quick detour and heads towards a little known roadside restaurant, Freddy's Diner. The trucker still remembers the previous time he took a pit stop in Freddy's place. It never ceases to amaze him that it even exists. After all, there's not another diner like it from here in California to the truck stops over in New Jersey and the trucker knows he'd pick Freddy's Diner over any maritime-themed novelty seafood place. He likes going there so much, he's even kept it a secret from his fellow truckers on the road. He'd simply hate for everyone to start piling over there and turning his favorite spot into a rowdy trucker hangout or tourist attraction. Pulling his truck up outside, the trucker locks the vehicle up securely and heads inside. From outside, it's just a calm, quiet-seeming place, a diner like any other in that stereotypical 1950s style. That's part of what the trucker likes so much about Freddy's. It's got that comforting, nostalgic feeling to it, like one of the few remaining vestiges of an era that nearly nobody alive remembers anymore, except from seeing it secondhand in old movies. But despite it looking quiet, practically empty from the outside, stepping through the doors at Freddy's is like setting foot on another planet. The entrance isn't just the way into the restaurant, it's the access point to the trucker's other favorite part about visiting there, the people. At first, it seems normal. There's always a decent number of customers bustling about, talking to each other or ordering from Freddy, the friendly silver-haired old owner dressed in his typical pinstriped apron over a shirt and bow tie. No matter if he's in the middle of serving a customer, Freddy always turns to greet the newest arrival with a warm smile and his classic motto, Welcome to Freddy's Diner, the only place where you can eat cuisine that's out of your world. The trucker loves how gradually it creeps up on him. Taking a cursory glance around the diner, nothing seems all that out of the ordinary. But looking closer, he enjoys noticing the other patrons and how… eccentric they all seem. When taking a gamble on Freddy's and making his first ever visit on another long drive to California, the trucker finds himself convinced that there must be some kind of science fiction or comic book convention in town. Then soon after, he starts to get a little worried thinking that maybe he's been on the road too long and is starting to see hallucinations out of pure exhaustion. But now he's been in enough times to know the folks who pitch up to eat at Freddy's Diner. Well, the best way to put it is that they're from out of town. Wandering past the bar, looking for somewhere to sit down, the trucker notices a trio of figures sitting down and enjoying plates full of freshly grilled burgers and baskets of golden fries hot from the fryer. What does it matter that all three are wearing huge, bulky spacesuits with metal piping snaking down them and vents hissing out warm steam? They're just enjoying their meals, after all. The trucker finds a vacant booth and sits down on the comfortable leather seat, scanning the diner for Freddy so he can order a coffee. Sitting across from him at the opposite booth, his eyes fall across a couple, smiling and giggling to each other as they chat. He's so caught up in their infectious, positive vibes that he barely realizes how one of them has had her entire right arm replaced with an intricate cybernetic one, or that the other is entirely blue and has pointed ears. It's just nice seeing how happy they are. That's when a voice that sounds like someone gargling water chimes up, and a sinewy tentacle grabs the trucker by his flannel shirt. Uh, what the hell do you think you're doing? The patron gurgles. I got up to use the bathroom for five minutes and find some chump in my seat. 
That's my table, Pipsqueak. Moments later, the trucker is on the floor, looking up at a creature he's never seen before. In fact, he's not even sure if the patron is human. Judging by the chewing gum head and the disproportionate limbs protruding from random points across its blobby body, it's a safe bet that it isn't. The trucker stumbles towards the bar and asks Freddy for a cup of coffee, a strong one, to wake him up in case he's dreaming. Across his visits to the diner, he's been convinced that all the flamboyant and eccentrically dressed customers are all just wearing costumes, either for a local convention or because of an anything-goes dress code. But after seeing the patron, the trucker's starting to think that he might have been very, very wrong about this place. Not to be confused with a certain pizzeria populated with quirky animatronic characters, Freddy's Diner is a restaurant experience like no other. But if you're hoping to experience its comfort food and unique atmosphere for yourself, then you might have a hard time getting past the quarantine zone that now surrounds the diner, thanks to the SCP Foundation. Technically, Freddy's Diner is still very much in business, although you're not likely to see anyone stepping through or out of the front doors anytime soon. Well, not from this dimension, at least. Before it would go on to be known as SCP-4258, the SCP Foundation learns of this seemingly innocuous restaurant two months after it first appears. To begin, none of the people that live in the nearby area pay the place much mind. As far as they know, Freddy's Diner is just a harmless, 50s-themed diner. Each and every one of them remains totally unaware that their memories have been tampered with, so that as far as they're concerned, SCP-4258 feels like it's always been a local staple, despite only having been around for a few short months. However, some new folks roll into town, and pretty soon the Foundation are getting rather suspicious about Freddy's Diner, thanks to abundant reports of a strange restaurant with weird cosplayers from the newcomers. They send in an undercover agent to investigate, making sure to be as subtle as possible. After all, at this point, there's still every possibility that Freddy's Diner really is just a hotspot for cosplayers and other eccentrically dressed individuals. But if only things were that simple. Inside, the agent is greeted by familiar, nostalgic surroundings. Circular seated bar stools, black and white tiled floors like a chessboard underfoot, a jukebox in one corner blaring out hits from the likes of Chuck Berry and Elvis Presley. Even the menu has all the old classics on there. Thick, frothy milkshakes served in tall glasses, freshly made burgers and fries, the kind of food that fits the atmosphere of the 1950s. The thing that doesn't, of course, is the various, unusual customers that frequently eat at Freddy's Diner. Even without his extensive training in identifying anomalies, it doesn't take the Foundation's agent very long to realize that some of the people enjoying their meals inside SCP-4258 aren't all human. Some are. In fact, most of them do still resemble something close to humanoid. Although, upon closer inspection, it would appear that almost everyone in the diner has widely different physiology. Even those that look mostly human on the outside aren't a perfect match, at least by our standards. That's because everyone who visits Freddy's Diner has come from a completely different reality. SCP-4258 isn't your average diner. It's an interdimensional diner. People from all across the multiverse have made their way to this specific restaurant for a bite. And it's definitely popular with those that visit. Freddy's Diner might be the only restaurant that can claim to be multiversally loved, frequented by customers from multiple different dimensions all at once. Some days, you might see little more to indicate this than a few patrons wearing weird clothing, the kind that you've never seen before. A site like that is easy to write off as a bizarre fashion statement after all. But on other days, when you find yourself enjoying a classically made milkshake at the bar when a six and a half foot anthropomorphic slime creature sits down on the stool next to you, then it becomes a bit more apparent that Freddy's Diner is anything but ordinary. And the agent sent to investigate the place by the Foundation quickly gets that very same impression during his first visit. Perhaps in an effort not to get swept up in the wondrous Moss Eisley Cantina energy of SCP-4258, the agent approaches the bar and begins to conduct an impromptu interview in the field. He talks directly with an old gentleman who appears to be running the place, the sole worker and owner of the establishment, the man the diner is named after, Freddy. Although he'll later become known as SCP-4258-1. Freddy greets the agent with the same charming, well-mannered demeanor as all his customers, before the agent starts trying to get to the bottom of what exactly the place is. It's a diner, Freddy tells him after a quick chuckle. They don't have these in your dimension, kid. The agent clarifies that there are indeed similar diners elsewhere in this dimension, although they aren't quite like Freddy's. 
The owner reassured the agent that he's only kidding, and then delivers the diner's motto, which apparently took him a century to come up with. Welcome to Freddy's Diner, the only place where you can eat cuisine that's out of your world. Being well-versed in the anomalous and aware of the existence of other universes, it doesn't take the agent very long to figure out that this diner acts as some form of multiversal junction point, a nexus where various different worlds can intersect. But Freddy points out that's not exactly entirely correct, but the agent has at least grasped some of the core principle. More than happy to converse with his new customer, Freddy explains that his diner exists in what is known as Todash space. This, according to him, is the space between dimensions, and the door to SCP-4258 does indeed connect to all sorts of drastically different realities. As the agent takes a look through the diner windows, he notices a change in the scenery. Where there was once the familiar setting of Earth, there is now a wide, sprawling desert that seems to stretch endlessly into the horizon and beyond. Just then, a tall humanoid figure wearing a mask steps into Freddy's diner, wrapped in extravagant robes. Freddy greets the newcomer as Quarelf. He's clearly a regular customer. The agent returns to questioning the old man, curious as to how the diner actually functions, and hoping to gain as much intelligence on the matter as possible for the SCP Foundation. One of the main questions the agent wants answered is, if Freddy's Diner exists between dimensions, how can the customers possibly pay for their meals? After all, even on Earth, there are multiple forms of currency with different competing values. Across an infinite number of entire universes, there's hardly going to be one multiversally accepted form of payment. But luckily, Freddy has an answer, even if it is a little abstract. As he explains it, the restaurant is funded, in a sense, by something called Empathius. You know that happy feeling you get when you remember something nice or someone compliments you? The restaurant feeds off that, so it keeps the place running. Confused as to what he means, the agent asks for clarity. For a moment, it sounds like Freddy's Diner extracts positive emotions from its clientele, like a leech draining blood. But Freddy assures him that it's not quite the same. The diner itself only takes away the excess empathias, the positive emotions, that its customers experience from being there, enjoying their meals and the atmosphere of the interdimensional diner. Freddy likens it to trimming the edges of a hedge. SCP-4258 doesn't rob people of their enjoyment, it just takes a little bit to keep the lights on. The patrons that visit only have to feel happiness, and that's the only payment for their meal that Freddy wants. That brings the agent to a final question. If the restaurant takes a little bit of Empathias as payment, then what exactly is Freddy? <laughs> the owner chuckles and says that he's just an old man looking to make good food. Speaking of which, he offers to take the agent's order. Not wanting to be rude, the agent asks for a hamburger and fries to go. He tries to see if there are any other staff working in the kitchen, but there doesn't look to be anyone at all, save for a pair of transparent hands that place a plate down on the kitchen line. Foundation researchers conduct a few different tests on the food that the agent received from SCP-4258, but their analysis quickly reveals that there's nothing harmful about it at all. It's just a well-made burger. The agent is subsequently sent back to the diner to gather more information about it. This time, he's given instructions from the Foundation to change up his approach and speak with some of the customers instead, to see what they think of Freddy's Diner. After all, despite his friendly demeanor, the old man could always be a liar trying to cover up a more sinister nature to his restaurant so he can lure in more unsuspecting people from across the multiverse. Although the agent has little reason to suspect anything untoward about SCP-4258, the Foundation is nothing if not thorough. During his second visit, the agent sits down with one of the customers enjoying a meal at Freddy's Diner, a humanoid being whose body is composed entirely of different types of stone. Just from a cursory glance, there looks to be a mixture of basalt, granite, and limestone all over the entity, who introduces itself as… Rock. The agent starts by remarking that the creature has a very interesting name. Everyone on Rock's world is named Rock. Pushing for more information on the creature's universe, the agent decides to ask if Rock's homeworld has a name, to which the reply is… Rock. As far as the agent can attain from Rock's fairly blunt description, the stone entity originates from a universe that lacks any life forms with flesh and blood bodies, or squishies, as Rock refers to them. It also states, with a similar lack of descriptive detail, that its home universe also lacks anything resembling vegetation. There are no trees or plants, which means that the denizens of this dimension only eat Rock. Very delicious, yes. The agent submits a proposal to the Foundation for a third visit to Freddy's Diner, writing in his report that his latest interview has proven to be completely useless. 
although it does at least provide one interesting detail about SCP-4258, besides all the facts about rocks. It seems that everyone within Freddy's Diner, regardless of which dimension they originate from, is capable of understanding each other. It's almost like a multiversal translator is in effect within the restaurant itself to make it easier for Freddy and his patrons to communicate. Returning to SCP-4258 for a third time, the agent finds himself striking up a conversation with a rather familiar face. His own. Against the improbable odds of infinite different people across an infinite number of universes in an endless multiverse, the Foundation agent happens to bump into one of his own counterparts from an alternate reality. And for the most part, this alternate agent seems to be from a universe that is practically identical to the first agent's. The two men sit down and begin to have a friendly discussion almost immediately after entering Freddy's diner. After all, it's likely that nobody else in the establishment is as familiar with each other as the pair of them are. The first agent is quick to remark at how strange this encounter is, even amongst his own years of experience at the SCP Foundation. Working with anomalies on a day-to-day -day basis is strange enough, but interviewing an alternate version of yourself has to be a jarring experience to say the least. The agent tries to establish any major differences between their two universes, asking his counterpart who he works for in his reality. The alternate agent explains that he also works for the SCP Foundation, or another version of it. So far, no differences. Next, the agent asks a more personal question. Is the alternate agent married? It turns out he is. As a matter of fact, they both are, and their wives are not only alternates of each other, but both versions of the couple have been together for 20 years. Next, the agent asks his interdimensional doppelganger to describe his world in more detail. More than happy to oblige, the alternate agent describes that, in his universe, it is currently the 21st century. Most of the socio-economic issues faced in this dimension are the same as this one. Political corruption is rife, there are shortages of essentials like food and water in many countries, along with various other problems. But, the alternate remarks, there are good things there too, like Shark Week. That sounds fairly close to our world, the agent observes. Seems like there aren't any noticeable differences between the two. Guess not. Pretty funny, huh? His alternate reality counterpart replies. It is at this point during the interview that Freddy comes over to give the alternate agent his order. A burger and fries, presented in delicious fashion on a plate. Awesome, thanks Fred, the alternate agent says before turning to his food. Time to chow down. Then, the alternate agent's jaw proceeds to unhinge, revealing multiple rows of razor-sharp teeth hidden behind the front-facing human set. He lifts up the plate and begins to violently consume the burger and fries he ordered. Having devoured the meal in a matter of minutes, the alternate agent then eats the plate his food was set out on, crunching down chunks of ceramic. Returning to the Foundation, the first agent later requests to be administered with amnestics. His request is denied. Seeing that shadowy figure coming towards him makes the worker turn and run, he hasn't had the time nor the luxury of freezing on the spot, or waiting for it to get closer so he could get a clearer view. He just runs. With every pace, every hurried, horrified step, comes the mental image of the strange figure gaining on him. In his head, every movement he catches in the corner of his eye, every shuffling sound he detects, the thing was right behind him, inches away and ready to strike. So he just keeps on running. Only seconds ago, it was just standing under a streetlight, a ways ahead of the worker, barely moving. He calls out to it, assuming it's a person, somebody may be lost or in need of help. But then, it steps into the light, and it's not a person at all. The head of the suit isn't on properly, it droops at an angle like it hasn't been affixed or is barely hanging on. The crude, lazy-eyed face is haphazardly drooping. That too isn't on right, as the entire head sways unnervingly with each approaching step. Maybe underneath the suit, hiding beneath all that dirty orange fur, still coated in grime despite the rain, perhaps there's a person in there whose arm hefts an old baseball bat as they plod closer and closer to the worker. But all he sees is the monster. The filthy costume might be clumsily made, but the worker instantly recognizes the all-too-familiar resemblance of an orange cat from a popular comic strip. It's what starts him running. That and the blunt weapon the monster is holding as it menacingly makes its way closer. The downpour doesn't let up as the worker turns a corner, met with the sights of two bright, blinding white beams of light cutting through the rain. A car, speeding its way down the road. It catches the worker in its headlights, and he starts frantically waving his arms, encased in the sodden fabric of his jacket. Help! Oh, please! Please help me! He yells. Something's coming after me! I think it's trying to kill me! The driver doesn't stop, instead simply cruising past. The worker can just about see through the passenger side window, the vehicle's sole occupant giving him a strange look from inside the safety of his car. 
Almost as quickly as it appears, the car has driven off, its headlights already fading from view thanks to the rain. What the worker doesn't realize is that the driver's look of confusion wasn't directed at him, but at the thing following him. The creature gives a low, animalistic sound, which causes the worker to spin around. Now he sees it, right up close in all its foul, ginger glory. A tail dangles lazily from the lower portion of the suit, trailing in puddles laden with muck, the water making the fur even dirtier than it already is. It's so close that the awful, pungent stench of the thing hits the worker's nostrils, a sickening smell that somehow seems to fit with the grim, gross costume and its wearer. Seeing the wet, fur-coated suit so close, he realizes that it isn't covered in the soft, plush, synthetic coat that he expects a costume like that to be made of. It looks real, like actual cat hair on a huge humanoid shape with the legs and arms of a man, arms that were midway through swinging a baseball bat right at the worker's head. He ducks just in time, the dull wooden bat glancing off the bricks of a nearby building, narrowly missing the worker's head. As it bounces off the wall, the blunt weapon slips from the soggy gloves of the suit and clatters to the ground. The second he hears the wooden bat land on the ground, the worker turns his heel and runs again, taking advantage of those precious few seconds to get further distance between him and his attacker. It's only exactly as he turns his back that he wishes he'd reached for the bat himself to fight back. Rushing further down the rain-swept street, the worker can hear the heavy slumping footsteps of the suited attacker giving chase. He alternates between looking straight ahead, the raindrops streaming down his face and getting into his eyes, and daring to glance back over his shoulder. Every time he does, he's met again with the horrifying sight of the suit behind him. He wants nothing more than to escape, to get out of this nightmare wherein he is soaked head to toe in rainwater and fear, running for his life, from someone dressed as the comic strip cat he sees every day. But as strong as his will to escape is, he can't bear to let the fur-suited pursuer out of his sight for even a second. If he can't see it, then it might be anywhere. At least looking told him that he was still right behind him, bearing down on the worker with its bat now firmly back in hand. The shrill noise of chain links rattling sounds behind him, as the attacker in the suit starts striking a nearby fence, making the worker more and more aware that, with every strike, it's getting closer. Through the relentless downpour, the worker spots a shape standing on the sidewalk just a few feet ahead. Short, stationary, something he sees every day of his life but never pays any notice to. But tonight, it might just be the thing that saves his life. A trash can. It's full, and that means heavy, and any second now, he'll be close enough to reach it. A plan forms in seconds, erupting like a fire with gasoline thrown on it. If that gasoline was pure, terrified adrenaline of being chased by someone in an orange cat costume, Reaching out, as soon as his fingertips grip the wet metal rim of the can, the worker pulls as hard as possible, his instincts keeping him from stopping running. The trash can clatters behind him as he passes, followed by the heavy thud of the attacker falling to the ground as it trips over the obstacle and lands furry head first in the garbage now strewn over the sidewalk. The worker knows he's only got another short window, another blessing of a precious few seconds to get far enough away from his attacker. He turns, changing course to rush across the street. There's an old warehouse over there. If there are security guards working, they might be able to help. If not, and the place is unguarded, then at least it could be somewhere to hide. A sudden blaring noise pierces the worker's eardrums before he can make it all the way to the opposite sidewalk. It's a horn, coupled with a bright pair of lights appearing as if from nowhere. Then, before he can turn to see it coming, impact. First against the hood of the car, speeding through the rain towards him, unable to stop in enough time. Next, the pain of hitting the jagged blacktop of the road. The second impact, as the worker lands a few feet away, spots of rain still pattering against his face as everything goes from dark to pitch black for a few seconds. His head floods with scenes from earlier that day, as if his life was about to start flashing before his eyes, only in reverse. The news of the comic strip doing poorly arrives at the Paws Inc. office, and with it, the knowledge that, if there are going to be layoffs, then he'll be first. He's the new hire, after all. It didn't matter that the once-beloved comic of a cartoon cat is losing its popularity, going stale after so many years in print. It upset the investors, and the worker has been worrying all day if he'd be the one fired to appease them, until he suddenly remembers what's coming after him. Fighting back and clawing his way back to consciousness, he struggles back to his feet, screaming with pain. He's injured, that much he can certainly tell, even if he doesn't know how badly. Hey! Hey, mister! The driver calls, stopping his car and starting to climb out of the vehicle. It's a different driver and car this time, and unlike the first, he makes the effort to stop, a mistake that is about to cost him greatly. He sees the worker getting back up, ignoring his calls. He raises his voice to cut through the noise of the pouring rain. Hey, you okay? 
I'm so sorry, I didn't see you. My lights were on low, wipers are going, it wasn't until you rushed out across the street that... Anyway, look, let me at least get you to a hospital. We can exchange our insurance information once they get you all patched up. The worker wasn't listening. He hears the driver's words, but pays him no mind. He's still so intent on getting away that it takes him a second to realize. The car, it's a way out. And then, the worker makes the same mistake as the driver. He stops. And when he does, he sees what has clambered back to its fur-coated feet and is now shuffling towards the driver. Look out! The worker yells. The driver turns, just in time to see. What the hell? He exclaims. Wait a minute, why are you dressed in a Garfield costume? Whack! The sound of the bat being swung at the driver makes the worker feel sick. He turns his back and moves as quickly as he can towards the warehouse, despite the pain and the horrified screams coming from behind. Beneath the rain, there's something else. A twisted, vile squelching noise that quickly snuffs out the driver's dying cries. The worker doesn't dare to look back this time. He doesn't want to see what's happening. Lifting a heavy metal shutter and pulling it shut behind him, he finds himself in the warehouse. It's completely deserted. There isn't a single sign of life anywhere. The only sound is the pattering of rainwater against the hard concrete floor, dripping through a hole in the ceiling. Guided by the low, glowing light of the street lamps outside that bleeds through the warehouse windows, the worker starts fumbling around for a place to hide. Just as he crawls underneath a large pallet rack, he hears a metallic rattling as the fur-suited monstrosity lifts up the shutter. It's inside. With heavy, plodding steps in its suit, it paces up and down the aisles of discarded shelving. The worker clamps his soaked hands against his mouth, trying to mask his panicked breathing, only to let out a scream as he feels something grab his ankle and pull. With ease, the thing dressed as a disheveled Garfield pulls him out of his hiding place. Instinctively, the worker thrashes his legs, landing a solid kick to the creature. As his foot connects, he notices it doesn't feel like a person underneath the suit. There's no body, no familiar outline of a human being beneath all the soggy fur and stench. It's just a slimy mass. Nonetheless, the kick knocks the garish Garfield back, only a few paces, but better than nothing. He scrabbles to his feet, standing and running as fast as he can in the opposite direction, only to hit a wall at the far side of the warehouse. The shutter is the only way out, and right now it's wide open. But Garfield stands between the worker and freedom. He turns to dart down the next aisle, between the rows of shelves, keeping his eyes on the attacker as he passes underneath the hole in the ceiling. The rain is still coming down through it, leaving a puddle on the floor. The worker's focus is locked on the beast. He suddenly feels his foot slipping out from under him, that awful lurch of his heart as he falls. The puddle, he slipped on it and come crashing down to the ground. The force of the concrete striking his back knocks all the breath from his lungs. Everything is spinning in a nauseating mix of pain, disorientation, and terror. Above, through the unrepaired ceiling, drops of rain come pouring down on him. Then, a low, agonized meow from somewhere nearby. The monster, Garfield, brings its bat swinging down and sharply connecting with the worker lying on the ground. A new surge of pain racks his body, right at the hip where the baseball bat just landed in an unforgiving blow. The worker can do nothing but scream in pain and fear. A horrible sound, like something wet tearing, fills his ears over his own cries. He remembers the sickening feeling of a slimy mass being aggressively pushed into his face. It's disgusting, rancid, but even under all the horror and the repulsive taste, he can detect familiar hints. Pasta, beef, tomato sauce, cheese, all of it moldy and rotten, but still recognizable. The monstrous SCP-3166 forces further fistfuls of lasagna down the worker's throat until the screaming stops. He'd always hated Mondays. A body twists and turns into unimaginable shapes. Eyes glow in the dark. Shadowy entities appear around you, mimicking your every move. Would you like a stick of gum? In a small seaside town nestled just along the coast of New England, and at least an hour's drive away from any major city, there isn't much to do but brave the chilly ocean waters, crowd onto the rocky beach, or walk along the boardwalk. For most of the residents of this quaint little town, the choice is clear. Years ago, when the town was at the height of its success as a tourist destination, visitors would flock from all over the country, descending on the boardwalk like the seagulls that swarm around the food stands in search of an errant french fry. In its heyday, the boardwalk boasted a small amusement park with a roller coaster and a ferris wheel, an arcade with the latest in 1980s video game technology, several stands selling hot dogs and crispy french fries coated in grease and salt, and the pride and joy of many a local, a classic, old-fashioned candy store. 
today, the arcade is all but empty, with one or two players occasionally wandering in to try their hand at the now vintage attractions inside. The amusement park is still standing, but the rides have faded and chipped. The stands still sell their wares, but the lines are shorter than they once were. And at the center of it all, the beloved candy shop is struggling to hold on. The price of waterfront property has climbed, while tourism has dwindled. And with online shopping taking over the market, well, the candy shop's owner can scarcely scrape enough money together to keep the roof over his head. On this particular day, the shop owner is restocking his shelves, the door propped open to let in just enough of the crisp, salty ocean breeze to keep his head clear and his spirits up. It's getting harder and harder to maintain the cheerful demeanor he's known for, to step into his red and white striped suit every day and smile for the few tourists who poke their heads into the shop. But still, he keeps at it. He loves this little store, and he'll keep holding on to it until there's nothing left to hold. He fills glass containers with colorful little hard candies, slides boxes of saltwater taffy onto shelves, and places blocks of fudge in the glass case by the cash register. All the while, he takes a little sample of each product for himself. A candy here, a small square of fudge there, to keep his energy up. Besides, he would never sell a product he didn't taste test first, only the best for his customers, though they were few and far between these days. Especially this time of year, as the air grows colder and the days get shorter, sunshine becomes a limited commodity as the summer turns to autumn. So it comes as quite a surprise to the older man when he hears a knock at the shop door. He turns and sees a delivery man standing there with a stack of packages. This is especially odd, as he can't recall ordering anything. But the delivery man explains that these packages are product samples from an up-and-coming candy company, one specializing in novelty chewing gum. They are providing samples to a variety of small candy businesses, as well as larger retail outlets, in order to conduct market research. These particular flavors, the delivery man promises, cannot be found anywhere else. Well, the promise of a new, exclusive product to draw new customers in is more than a little bit exciting for the shopkeeper. Without a second thought, he signs for the packages and carries them inside. The shop has carried a few varieties of chewing gum over the years. Mint, cinnamon, fruit, and even prank gum that turns a person's tongue black when they chew it. What could possibly be so unique about this gum? He's determined to find out. As he cuts open the boxes, the shopkeeper is greeted with brightly colored packaging that looks, for the most part, like any other gum packaging out there. He does quickly notice one unusual difference, though. The flavor names. Each of them begins with the phrase, tastes like which is a clever enough branding choice, but the flavors themselves are… odd. He lifts the first packet and reads its label, brow furrowing in confusion. Tastes like youth. What could that possibly mean? For a novelty candy, this gum sure is especially novel. Well, he never stocks a product without trying it out for himself first, so he unwraps a piece of the bright pink gum and pops it into his mouth. The first thing that he notices is the taste an overwhelming sweetness tinged with nostalgia. It tastes like cotton candy, but not just any cotton candy. It tastes like the cotton candy he once enjoyed as a little boy on this very boardwalk, a flavor he hasn't experienced in 60 years. The next thing that he notices is that his eyes are aching all of a sudden. He takes off his glasses for a moment and is shocked by what he sees. Everything, clearly, without the aid of the lenses. His vision is like it was when he was a young man, before age had blurred the edges of everything in his line of sight. His joints have stopped aching, and he feels a sudden surge of energy, the sudden urge to run, to jump, to click his heels together. He rushes to the bathroom mirror, half expecting to see his younger face staring back at him. No, he still looks the same, but he feels decades younger. His mind reels, and he can't think of anything to do but laugh. This gum. It should be impossible, but this piece really does taste like youth. This might just be the product that saves the store. The invigorating effect lasts all in all for about a half hour, but during that half hour, the shopkeeper feels more optimistic than he has in many, many years, and the feeling lingers even after the gum's effects subside. But what other flavors did he receive? The delivery man brought three boxes, so what about the other two? He opens the second box and pulls out a pack. Tastes like mom used to make. Well, that's even more vague than the first one. But after the experience of the previous one, he's eager to discover exactly what that could mean. He unwraps a piece, studies its light brown color, and pops it into his mouth. As soon as he begins to chew, the flavor explodes on his tongue, taking him back once again to his childhood. 
ground butter, sugar, chocolate chips, a hint of vanilla. It can't be, but it is. It's his mother's chocolate chip cookie recipe. How could the manufacturers have possibly recreated it so perfectly? The flavor passes quickly, and eager to confirm his experience and make sure it was real, he grabs another piece. This one tastes entirely different. Blueberry pancakes, like his mother used to make on Sunday mornings, dripping with syrup and melted butter. This is the most unusual chewing gum indeed. In all his years of selling candy, of tasting every unusual innovation or novelty product, he never dreamed it could be like this. Now for the third package, he slices the box open and finds black packages inside, emblazoned with eerie red writing. The text read, tastes like your worst nightmare. The shopkeeper feels a chill run down his spine, his hands shaking with nerves as he unwraps a piece of the pitch black gum. But he can't stop himself. He has to satisfy his curiosity to discover what nightmares taste like. He pops the piece into his mouth and begins to chew. At first, he's almost disappointed. It doesn't taste like much of anything, vaguely sweet, almost creamy, like finishing a glass of warm milk before bed. But as he chews, the shop around him begins to blur and warp, lights dimming until he is standing in the dark. The hairs on his arms stand to attention, and he becomes overwhelmed with the sensation of eyes on his back. Something's here, and it's watching him. He spins around and finds nothing there. But wait, what's that? Out of the corner of his eye, a shadow darting just out of sight into the storage room in the back. Against his will, his feet begin to carry the man toward that room, following the shadow. But the door to the storeroom is shut. It wasn't shut before. Something closed it when it darted inside, and it's in there now, waiting for him. His stomach turns as his hand reaches for the doorknob, turning it inch by inch. His nerves are screaming at him to stop, to turn and run. But as if trapped in a nightmare, his body refuses to obey him. It pushes the door open with a pronounced creak, and there, in the darkness, two glowing red eyes gaze out at him. The shopkeeper's heart leaps into his throat, and in a moment of clarity, he spits out the gum. All at once, the glowing eyes are gone. The lights have come back on, and the nightmare is over. He resolves not to stock that particular flavor in the shop, and tucks the box away in the back of that same storage room. Before long, his two new nostalgic flavors of magic chewing gum draw the attention of the SCP Foundation, who, after paying the man enough money to keep the shop open for the foreseeable future, call it a finder's fee, take the gum samples into custody and give them the classification SCP-1200. The designation SCP-1200 applies to all instances of chewing gum distributed under the brand Tastes Like Chewing Gum. Packages of this gum have been spotted in various grocery and convenience stores around the United States, appearing seemingly at random. Each pack of gum features a logo, identifying the manufacturer as simply the factory. Whenever a human subject masticates or chews a piece of the gum, a certain anomalous effect will occur. This effect varies depending on the color and flavor of the given gum. There have currently been 83 flavors of SCP-1200 identified and cataloged. Swallowing this gum does not appear to produce any additional anomalous effects. Also, contrary to what certain popular misinformation might say, this gum, or any gum in fact, does not stay in the digestive tract for seven years. The 83 flavors on file can be found in SCP-1200-EKV, which was unfortunately impossible for me to obtain during my research into SCP-1200. The official file does, however, include a partial list of some of these flavors. Though I would have preferred to conduct a more comprehensive review, this at least provides a bit of valuable additional context for the anomalous product. So let's review some of the most memorable SCP-1200 flavors and their recorded effects on human test subjects. SCP-1200-12 is a lime green colored gum flavor, which is, funnily enough, called tastes like lemons. When a human subject chews this flavor, their gustatory perception is altered for the next 28 hours. No matter what they eat during that time frame, it will taste like lemons. A bit odd, but not harmful unless the subject just really, really hates the taste of lemon. After the 28-hour period is up, all food reverts to its original taste. SCP-1200-15 is a bright yellow flavor, 
tastes like sunshine. When a test subject eats this flavor, they will become luminescent, emitting over 40,000 lux of white light. This effect, while disconcerting to witness, does not do any harm to the subject exhibiting it. The subject's luminescence lasts for approximately 20 minutes at full intensity, and then the light begins to dim gradually until it disappears completely after four more minutes. You may have noticed that this flavor is a great deal more abstract than tastes like lemons. Well, they only get more unusual from here. The next flavor detailed in the file for SCP-1200 is SCP-1200-29, tastes like Rubik's Cube. Like the cube for which it's named, this flavor is multicolored, checkered in white, orange, green, red, yellow, and blue. When a subject eats this flavor, their body takes on a unique property for the next 216 minutes. During this window of time, the subject will be able to rearrange segments of their body, both internal and external, at will. This has no impact on the subject's health or comfort, even when rearranging bones, muscles, and vital organs. However, these alterations cause secondary changes within the body as it compensates for the movements. Unfortunately, this means that the first test subject to consume this flavor during SCP Foundation trials was unable to return her body to its original orientation before the 216 minutes were up. She failed to solve the puzzle, and now her left and right hands are permanently swapped. The next flavor included in the file is SCP-1200-30, a dark blue gum that is described as tastes like those forgotten. What could that possibly mean? Well, it means that once a test subject has chewed this flavor, six corporeal humanoid entities will manifest in their vicinity. These entities do not appear to be sentient, and their only behavior is mimicking the actions and speech of the subject and any other humans in the area, such as guards and researchers. These entities linger for six days before disappearing, leaving a homogeneous liquid behind. Analysis of the liquid determined that it consisted of a mixture of organic materials, iron particles, and acrylic paint. SCP-1200-58 is a particularly curious flavor. This white gum is tastes like afterlife. When the subject chews it, a polyhedral crystalline exoskeleton forms around them. Once it has formed, it will levitate 1.3 meters off of the ground. During the first trial, this object remained inert for a period of 62 days. When the 62 days were up, the exoskeleton broke apart, leaving the subject behind and completely unharmed. He was immediately interviewed about his experience inside the structure, and he described being transported to a green meadow where he met his younger brother. This was especially curious considering that the subject does not have any recorded siblings, living or dead. Another notable aspect of this flavor is its effects resemblance to SCP-1511, crystalline structures that transfer prisoners while showing them some manner of beautiful, false afterlife. The only other flavor included in the file is Tastes Like Moon's Shadow, a red gum that has been tested once on a female research subject. After she finished chewing the piece of gum, a series of incorporeal, translucent, leperine organisms began to emerge from the walls of the cell where the subject was being kept. During this entire process, the subject claimed to not see the entities, nor did she feel it when they approached her, reached her, and burrowed into her body. Video recordings of the incident were unable to capture these entities. Eleven days after the experiment was conducted, the subject was found dead. Despite the lack of visible injuries, her cause of death was determined to be exsanguination. This is the only recorded fatality resulting from a sample of SCP-1200. There appears to be a link between this gum flavor and SCP-1284, though I have not yet been able to determine the nature of this link. On February 20th, 2003, the SCP Foundation was conducting an investigation completely unrelated to SCP-1200. The exact nature of this original investigation has been redacted from the file, but whatever it was, it's irrelevant to the subject at hand. It isn't the investigation, but what they discovered by complete accident that matters. Foundation operatives stumbled upon a secretive facility that was entirely dedicated to the production of tastes like those forgotten. When the Foundation entered the facility, they discovered an assembly line, as well as 28 anomalous entities dwelling inside. It would appear that these entities, referred to as SCP-1200-A, are part of the company's workforce. Instances of SCP-1200-A are animate humanoid entities whose physiology is composed primarily of wrought iron. They are also coated in several layers of paint, usually in a shade of white, pale blue, or yellow. 
These layers of paint are worn, faded, and flaking, and the metal beneath is beginning to rust. Whenever they were made, it was some time ago, and they have fallen into a state of disrepair. Each instance has no facial features on its head, and the only feature present is one large, circular opening, which seems to operate a bit like a mouth. In addition to discovering the facility and its anomalous workers, this discovery gave the Foundation some new insight into the production process for this particular flavor of tastes like chewing gum. The image that it painted was, well, troubling. When instances of SCP-1200-A are not contained, they will attempt to collect recently deceased human cadavers and transport them to the production facility. If they are permitted to do so, they will collect these bodies from freshly dug graves or even poorly guarded morgues and carry them back to the facility. There, an SCP-1200-A instance will take one of its chosen corpses and begin to regurgitate paint, biological matter, and small slags of iron into the body's mouth. I apologize for the stomach-turning imagery, but there is simply no pleasant way to describe this process. The instance will repeat this process over a period of several weeks until the body begins to liquefy under the influence of whatever matter the entity has pumped into it. The process only ceases when the body begins to liquefy, eventually leaving behind nothing but a thick, homogeneous liquid which will suddenly disappear soon after. How it disappears and where it goes is unknown but I can make an unpleasant guess. Chemical analysis of some of this liquid has identified it as the substance that makes up 80% of the sample of tastes like those forgotten. It would appear that this particular flavor of chewing gum and Soylent Green have a key ingredient in common. People. No other facilities have been discovered at this point, so it is uncertain whether the key ingredients in other gum flavors are quite as macabre. Following the discovery of this facility, the Foundation cross-referenced its communication archives for any potential mentions of the facility or facilities like it. This investigation uncovered a surprisingly relevant phone call hidden in the archives. The call was made on June 2, 1999, from a payphone about two kilometers from the facility discovered in 2003. The recording contains one single unidentified male voice, and a transcription of the call's contents is included. Herrick, this is Davis. I'm all done with the psychopomps here. We redirected the output to the location you wanted. Weren't any problems there. The goo should start arriving to you shortly. About your other order, Morton spotted some nano hives in Budapest. I'm heading out there tomorrow. They should do nicely for your task after some tinkering. Make sure there won't be any issues with my payment this time. If your contacts at the factory are unwilling, I can always find someone else. Call you in two weeks. Any discovery and seizure of SCP-1200 instances must be performed by the FDA under CFR Title 21. Once the instances are in the possession of the FDA, these samples will be replaced with non-anomalous duplicates, and the originals are to be transferred to Foundation Site 197. SCP-1200-A instances do not require food or oxygen to survive, and therefore are to be kept contained in individual reinforced containers, which are stored in the I-TL1 wing of Site-197. Two days after the SCP-1200-A base facility was dismantled, the SCP Foundation received a series of packages. These packages were delivered to several facilities, and all contained the same thing, a new, previously undocumented flavor of gum. This gum was completely colorless, and the packaging read, tastes like normalcy. Test subjects who chewed the gum said that it had no noticeable flavor at all, and no anomalous effects occurred. It seems that the creators of tastes like chewing gum took notice of the Foundation's investigation and decided to create a custom flavor, or lack thereof, for the organization. The identity of the company's higher-ups, or the gum's creators, is still unknown. Unfortunately, the trail has gone cold for now. But don't lose hope. It's possible more facilities are out there, waiting to be discovered. Keep that dream alive, investigators, and don't let me burst your bubble. Get it? Like bubblegum? <clears throat> well, there's a reason I became a researcher and not a comedian. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today.